Hi, I'm Neil Druckmann, creative director. And I'm Troy Baker, I play Joel. And I'm Ashley Johnson, and I play Ellie. So, first cinematic here. Uh, you'll see as we get to the end, I mean, the, this opening image, we wanted to match what we did at the end with image of Ellie. Tommy, listen to me. He is the contract I think it's such an interesting thing to start off with, not only in the past, but also to start off, basically. Yeah, that's one of the things we were discussing um, as we're iterating on this opening sequence, because it used to be it was all seen through Joel's eyes. <clears throat> um, but then it became a lot more interesting to think of it as you're seeing it through Sarah's eyes, because Sarah is really kind of... The whole game is about this relationship between Joel and Ellie, but here Sarah kind of embodies what their relationship is going to eventually become. And that was probably one of the hardest roles to cast, too, with Sarah. Yeah. There, were, there were a lot of people that came in, and I love that this scene was, you know, that's, that was one of the audition scenes. And it was so amazing when Hannah came in that it just, I mean, what, what you're seeing right now, that's, I mean, that was the chemistry. And she was amazing. It's like, kind of like a young, younger Dakota Fanning. Just, there's a lot of, there's an old soul behind those eyes. Yeah, and she could turn it on and off between each take. Yeah, it was crazy. Yeah, she was crazy. She's amazing. What? It's always a little awkward, right? You have a 12-year-old someone on the set and you're doing this pretty dark well, stuff. <laughs> Especially with the way that we work, too. <laughs> All right, let's hold off on some of the jokes today, guys. <laughs> we started helping out with the mortgage then. Yeah, you wish. And this piece of music, actually, uh, we were struggling to find which piece to play here. Uh, and then Gustavo wrote this thing for the VGAs just to play before we show the trailer. And right away I heard it, I was like, that's got to go in the opening. This is the theme kind of like the relationship between Joel and his daughter that later becomes the theme between Joel and Ellie. Halican Drops. Halican Drops. The name of the band on her t-shirt. And where did you get that? <clears throat> my daughter came up with that. My two and a half year old daughter named one of her dolls that. And we're, we're searching for a name for a band. I'm like, I got a name for a band. <laughs> <laughs> So this is going to be the first time that I've ever seen this scene. This was one specifically that I really didn't want to once we did it. And when we first talked about doing this in the very, very beginning, I knew this scene was going to come. And it was, I told you, I was like, give me a heads up yeah. <laughs> when this day comes, because it's not going to be a good one. Well, the, the, the thing with this scene, it's a super difficult scene to shoot. The first time we shot it, we, we did like at least 15 takes or something crazy like that. And then we thought we had it in the can and... Well, uh, I thought. I, I... Well, no, we all thought. We thought we, 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 can, we came back to work and we started putting it in. And the, for me, there was just something that was... I felt like we could convey the same amount of emotion with less. Yeah. And it was a hard thing to tell Troy because everybody put so much into it. And it's like, we got to do it again. Well, I remember we that We got to come back to this. When you came back and you told me that we have to do this again, you'd obviously, you know, you'll, you'll see why what we're talking about. But this is the defining moment for Joel. It, this is where he draws that line in the sand where he has few moral lines left across. I'm so amazed with how well Hannah did. And... Yeah, I mean, it was, it was difficult to watch just, just on the mocap stage. We actually had people, after a few takes, leave the set. It was, they were like, I can't watch this anymore, and they just took off. But from a story standpoint, it's so important to show just what the violence does and how it, like, rips apart this this family. Well, then a lot, a lot, especially a lot of times in video games, you see blatant violence, but when you personify it and you put it on a face, especially that young face, and you see the, the devastation that just one, one life lost can do, and it's just, I mean, this was such a hard day. It was such a yeah. hard day for both of us. I mean, it was exhausting for her. It was exhausting for me. Um, so the op opening credits, uh, the thing with the opening, initially we didn't want to do opening credits, we didn't even have the idea for this, uh, but the jump felt too sudden to go from Sarah dying to then 20 years later. And making up. We found that when people watch it in succession, they're not paying attention when we start introducing Tess in the world because they're still recovering from Sarah dying. So we're like, okay, well, let's have this opening sequence that can kind of help bridge the gap and just had the idea of just seeing this time-lapse video of fungus growing, because uh, so much of the disease and the outbreak is based on this cordyceps fungus that spread through spores. Uh, so we contacted a group at Sony San Diego who did this whole opening sequence for us, and they actually got these fungus 
fungal kits where they grew fungus like in their bathrooms and filmed this over like days to produce this thing. So everything you're seeing is actually, it's, it's real, it's not CG, it's not, it's all, it's all organic. Yeah, it's all, except for the spores at the end, which are CG, everything is, is real. <laughs> this whole journey is like a dreamlike state and you constantly see people waking up and you see this multiple chime with Joel and it's as if he's like remembering the past, he's yeah. always having these bad dreams um, throughout the game. That was always something that we had to keep in mind when we did this scene, because we shot this before we shot Sarah dying scene. So it's kind of like we knew that those were going to be in, in, in one way or another kind of butted yeah. up against each other. But this is such a great thing. Again, this was in the audition thing that we did when we were trying to find Tess. And when Annie walked in, it was just like she, she walked in as Tess. We saw a lot yeah. of different people for yeah. that. How was your morning? And this was just such a great, because the relationship you see from going from Sarah and Joel to now Joel and Tess, mm -hmm. it's no. just... I don't know, you, you see everything, like the house that he was in before was nicer. He looked nicer, and it's not just the years have passed, but those years that have passed have This also kind. gets into something interesting for me as a writer, which is you have a certain notion of characters or how you want the structure to be, and then once it's interpreted through actors, like Troy, it changes. Uh, like, I've always imagined this as, as Joel doesn't really care for Tess. He has, like, he's completely shut down, and Troy treated it differently, which is, I think he really cares for Tess, and, uh, even though he might not show it. And we just kind of embrace that. And you kind of see that later when, when uh, Tess gets infected. Uh, that wasn't how the scene was originally envisioned, that Joel has such a, a reaction, but it became a lot more interesting to own that. Well, and also how much this relationship changed over, I mean, time and different writing iterations and just conversations that we had about this, even, you know, within just in the last month or so, we've had conversations about this. It's like, what is their relationship? Because we never define it. And I think anybody else would have put it on the nose, their lovers or, or whatever. There was one note that you gave. It's like, let's, for one specific take, and said, let's, let's just assume that there was a fight last night over what we don't know. This is that moment afterwards. So it was like this awkward tension between the two of us. But there's no like loving embrace. There's no kiss that Joel and Tess have. It's just such an interesting relationship. And the, the challenge was to try to, how much can we convey just through nonverbal interaction? Right. Our first torture scene. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's with the lovely Robin Atkin Downs, which well, I was just joking and saying that it's not, yeah. it's not a Naughty Dog game if Robin isn't getting the shit kicked out of him. <laughs> <laughs> He's been in every game since uh, Uncharted 1. Uh, and we <laughs> just put him through the ringer on this one. Poor guy. It, it was important to show just how far Joel has come, from the, the father you see in the, in the opening sequence to here is a man that is willing to torture someone, to just get but it's what so is essentially money in this world. Right, but it's interesting because he's not, he's, he's like that brutal enforcer. It's kind of like that scene in LA Confidential where he's, he's Russell Crowe. She's running the show. She's the, she's the dominating one, and I'm just she's, brought in to be the muscle. She's the brains of the operation. Yeah, <laughs> clearly. Stop, stop, stop! Ugh. What you're squirming. That's all Robin's expressions too. It's so great. They did such a great job with the facial. Yeah, it's 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 important to note also all the facial is hand animated. We don't use any facial mocap. Um, we find that we get better results with our animators. And it almost becomes one to one. Yeah. It's just genius. Here it is. Wait for it. Give me a week. You know, I might have done that if you hadn't tried to fucking kill me. Mode of hesitation. <laughs> it's gonna cost you. We re-edited that. We used to show the break, and actually it was less brutal than when we didn't show it. When, when you didn't we show did, it? Yeah, when it's left to your imagination, it's a lot worse. Yeah, but just you can see the way that his arm's positioned. But yeah, you're right. This, this is so revealing, not only about the relationship, but about, again, who Joel has become. To go from a father who just cares about you know, keeping his nose down and keeping the job and being playing by the rules, to, to being a guy who could just literally break some guy's arm over... Guns, it's just yeah. crazy. Come on, and fuck those fireflies. Let's go get them. She loved doing that scene too. And he loved that. She tried not to smile every time. And I love it's just business yeah. as usual. It's back to it. It's like, all right, so now what? And we're about to meet the very talented Merle Dendridge. Ah, uh, Merle. Now, here's something interesting about this. Again, going back to the audition, that process. We saw a bunch of different girls, even girls that we had originally seen for Tess, we brought back yeah. for to see. And they're all Marlene. really good. They're fantastic. Uh, and then, then Merle came in and just and there I was no question. And I wasn't there for that. And and Ashley can chime in. On this. Or Ashley, no. Ashley was part of the audition for for Merle. When she came in, it was it was hands down. Yeah. 
It's like, that's Marlene, come on. It's funny that all three of us knew, like, like right away that yeah, she needs to play Marlene. But you said, we ended up setting up a special thing just for her. Yeah. Because you're like, you've got to see her. I want, I want you to yeah, see we, her. Yeah, we had callbacks and she, she was busy, she couldn't make it. And we had a special day of callbacks just to bring her, her in because we felt really confident that she could do it. Because I felt like she was the only one who didn't play at all either super tough. Or street, yeah. Yeah, she kind of had Yeah, she really straddled that line. It was so great. But she, we did that first scene in the audition, literally first take, first scene. And her, she exits. It's at the very end of the game, and she turns around and she exits. And I turn around, look at Neil. I was like, I just mouthed, "Are you kidding me?" It's <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> like, and, and I, I, and I, mouth, I told you so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she did such a great job. This is another kind of thing that I think is interesting that's happening in video games, where we see two really strong women okay. characters, What's it gonna be? that female characters that aren't being over sexualized. They're just strong women. Here we go. Ellie's introduction. Yep. Uh, and, and this stuff is all <laughs> shot out of sequence. So it's, 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 I don't know, maybe you guys should talk about the process of how you get into that state. <laughs> I'm trying to remember that. I just really like the fact that the first time you see Ellie, you see her knife first. Right. I just yeah. think that's kind of You see that she's awesome. a fighter. Yeah. I actually, I forgot that that was the first time that you saw Ellie. That that was the first scene. Ellie. That just from the get go, she's fighting. Yeah, but it's it's not just it's, she's fighting because she really cares for Marlene. That was that's kind of yeah. the, the crux of this is that you see these two characters really care for one another. You're capable. And I, I love uh, in such a short time you see between Marlene and Ellie, there's this connection that's right. so important because that has to carry through to the end of the game when Marlene shows up again. Well, even like the, just the positioning of the two people. I mean, it's it's Joel versus Joel and Tess versus Ellie and Marlene. And just like. It's so interesting watching, right, Joel here has like, doesn't even make eye contact with her. He doesn't even acknowledge her existence. Right. She's not crossing to that part of town. I want Joel to watch over her. Whoa, whoa, I don't Bullshit, think that's the best Ellie. Him? Our first fight. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> Bullshit! <laughs> I was close with his brother, Tommy. He said if I was ever in a jam, I could rely on him. Was that before or after he left? Just reminding the player, like the, this guy you saw in the beginning, Joel's brother, he's changed too and he's been involved. Yeah. yeah. Just get hints of... There's a falling out between the yeah. two of them. And it's just as you go on, you're starting to fill in that 20 year gap. Just cargo, Joel. Marlene. No more talking. Which is pretty true to your writing too, because I'm like, so what happened here? It's always, what do you think? What do you think happened there? Because <laughs> I have no idea. I don't have the time to write it. <laughs> <laughs> Stay close. For Joel, right, that's, that's a hint. It's like, I don't want to be around this kid. Right. Because right? some subconscious part of him knows I could get hurt here. Is it? First moment alone. What does Joel do? <laughs> Time for bed. Takes a nap. <laughs> <laughs> I'm tired. <laughs> What are you doing? Killing time. I do really like this scene. Well, what am I supposed to do? I am sure you will figure that out. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great moment. It's, an, uh, it's another one of those moments, too, where it's like, it just feels like Joel is just always exhausted. Like, this world is just bearing down on him. But I, I, uh, I love that moment, too, where she points out the watch, where we get to establish that, that watch that... Yeah, and that's something we, we didn't have in the beginning. That's actually something we inserted after the fact. Not for this scene, but there's another scene where we have that. But I also love, like you said, the the kind of the juxtaposition between Joel and Ellie to where Joel's just, like you said, weary and exhausted, and you have this total opposite, almost antithetical thing of like this naivete and this childlike behavior that's wanting to explore. And, and shows she, up in this. she's talking about having bad dreams, like the idea that they are both carrying this baggage with them. And it's how they first connect. Can't be any worse out there. Hmm. Can it? What on earth do the fireflies want with you? Hey, sorry it took so long. Soldiers fucking everywhere. How's Marlene? What a great moment. He, he finally addresses her, finally connects on that level, and that moment's interrupted. Well, it's also the first time kind of Ellie, if you think about it, opens up to him. She's saying, I'm scared, right? That was 
subtext of that yeah, question. Yeah, that's true. Go get some guns. It's such an interesting thing that we're like at two hours into the game and we're still the enemy, if there is one, or just other humans, just other people. that are on other sides of the law, but there's no infected, there's no clickers, there's no anything. Look the other way. It'll make us worth our lives. Shut up. I love the attention to detail, the rain falling off their faces. And, you know, that she's the one that strikes out first. <laughs> then it's interesting how Joel instinctively, when a gun is pointed at Ellie, he acts. Yeah. Again, there's something subconscious that he feels like he has to protect this girl. He doesn't realize it yet. Mm. Here it is. Set us up. So this is starting to build up that conflict between Joel and Tess. Yeah. And this is something we struggled in the story for a long time. Is like, how do we motivate this guy that shouldn't really want to do this mission? How do we get him to take on this mission to carry Ellie across the country? And it was through Tess. <clears throat> so if we get Tess to really buy into this thing, and then we, you know, Tess gets infected, then she can convince Joel to take this on. At right. least initially, at least until we can spend long enough time with Ellie so they, they can connect. Yeah. And then it becomes about something else. I'll also say, Ashley, when we were doing this, the way that you conveyed fear, because that's a very scary situation that you're in, because you felt like your back was against the wall. Yeah, this is where we really, okay, this is where we can show you the, the difference between Joel and Tess. Yeah, because you're starting to see Tess really kind of buying this, and you see yeah. some hope. Well, the thing I like about your performance here is you really get the sense of the conversation she's had with Marlene and the struggles she's been going through the past three weeks. She said that they have their own little quarantine zone with doctors they're still trying to find a cure. That's where you see just deep inside how much Tess is desperate for any kind of redemption. Whatever happened to me is that... Remember, Ashley, we were talking about the scene and the idea that Ellie's not sure she believes in this thing. She, she feels this whole thing is insane and ridiculous. I remember that. I believe the direction I gave you was like, imagine you're giving yourself a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If you as a person in real life found out you were the cure for mankind. I'm kind of awesome. Yeah, <laughs> apparently, you would <laughs> so. <laughs> And I am the messiah. <laughs> in that three weeks, you wouldn't, um, it'd be hard to own that. All right. Now watch your step as you're going up, because it's going to be a little. <laughs> 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 little brat. I love the dynamics of this scene where it's like, Tess has this secret, right? She's bitten. She's not telling Joel or anybody yet. Uh, Joel here for the first, again, he's, he's connecting. He can't help it. It's the first time he's like saying something semi nice to Ellie. But there's still this layer of cynicism behind it. He gets taken away by that childlike wonder. And this is something we added after the fact the watch. The watch wasn't, we didn't have the watch at the time. Yeah. And Joel was just crossing his arms, and the, I asked the animators, they're like, oh, could you just, just flip his wrist and have him look at the watch? Yeah. This moment is reminding him of Sarah. I love that it's almost a warning from Tess to Joel, like kind of like last words. It's like this determination and you're not sure why, what's, what's yeah. different now, Tess. No, 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 no. Tess's desperation. What happens now? I love like, and it totally comes across without many words or anything, just through the expressions on Joel's face, which is, I've put up with this long enough, right. this is over. I've indulged you enough, Tess. What is this lab of theirs? Oh, she never said. She only mentioned that it was someplace out west. What are we doing here? This is not... Yeah, uh, that, that calm, pacifying, trying to talk some sense into you. I know that you are smarter than this. Really? 
Right. Guess what? We're shitty people, Joel. It's been that way for a long time. I love the fact that her character, she knows she's going to die any minute, but she's still holding on to so much hope. Yeah. That, well, she's different. Right. Look at her bite. She, the world could still change. And it's kind of this theme that, like, this idea of, I've done all this crappy things, but it's all okay if I could do this one thing right. Right. And that, that kind of moves over to Ellie. And we see that theme later when Ellie, like, talks about... It can't be for nothing. I got to point this out. Everybody else, because this was a part of the audition scene too, everyone else did that don't touch me. They screamed it out. And I love the way she did that, where it was like that first don't touch me. And it's yeah. just that realization. And I love the fact that Ellie's the one that figures it out, not Joel. Oh, Christ. And again, the, the back and forth Annie's doing between this freaking badass to such vulnerability and constantly jumping back and forth. And she this brought that every take. <laughs> We're all like, because like, every every take, she's like full on crying by the end of she's it. She's incredible. You're right. She's such a badass, but so she was so vulnerable at the same time. Which is such a shows hard two thing sides of the same strength too. God, I'm such an Annie fan. <laughs> you have to feel some sort of obligation to me, so you get her to Tommy's. I remember you coming out of, uh, of a take and, and Troy's like, look at me, he's like, you don't understand, you're not right there staring into her eyes. Yeah. <laughs> I can buy you some time, but you have to run. You want us to just leave you here? Yes. There is no way that... This moment where like, Joel's like in denial, is like, I, there's something I could do, They're not even understanding, like, she's gone, she's already gone, there's nothing he could do right now. And also she has, and she is just laser-eyed yeah. on Joel doing that, even though she's talking to Ellie. Don't just go! Tess has to snap him out of it. It's like, you know that you have to do it. Ellie. And I, I believe this is the first time this. Joel refers to Ellie by her name. I don't think anywhere else in the game he does that. Beforehand. And again, it was, it was important to stay. We stay with, with, with Tess, just showing... Here's her emotionally, emotions finally coming through once Joel, once Joel is gone. I like how just, I don't remember if we did, talked about this, but Ellie has just this, clearly a problem with authority where somebody's telling her what to do. Yeah, for sure. I think that also, I have a problem with authority. <laughs> <laughs> so, that came out a little bit in Ellie. Tess, I, I don't even know Here's how this thing's gonna play out. You don't bring up Tess. Uh, yeah, that's so, uh, Joel knows what he needs to do to survive, which is just let go. Needs to let go fast of these things or they will kill you. Don't tell anybody about your condition. That's great. I love that he refers to, to that as her condition. condition. <laughs> you can barely acknowledge. Just We're he's still trying hurt. to search for the term for it. Yeah. You being the whole cure for humanity thing. Good. <laughs> I love that he says note. good, but the subtext is clearly like, all right, good enough. <laughs> yeah. That's all I'm going to get out of this kid. <laughs> good chance he could get us a car. Okay. Let's get a move on. Hey, it's Bill. Lovely Earl Brown. Whoop, whoop. I remember you were, you were kind of geeking out when you auditioned with him. I was. We Again, we saw like a lot of people for Bill, and there was a lot of like stars that came in. I was really surprised. Like, But then when he walked in, I was like, holy crap, it's Dan Dougherty from Deadwood. <laughs> He's amazing to work with. I've worked with him before a while ago, and I just love working with him. You actually hit him in the scene in the face. That's right. <laughs> I did. Right there, and we kept it. <laughs> <laughs> and he kept going, what a trooper. That's one of my favorite things, is when he goes, am I, uh, yeah. am I dead? He was sick that day. Yeah. He was like getting over a cold. I did hit him, and I felt so bad because it was a complete accident. I think I just, I, I didn't realize my swing was going a lot faster than I thought it was. Of many people that you hit during the shoot. <laughs> on this yeah, getting it into happens. character. <laughs> well, I also love this business that he's doing here too. That, that was something that he completely made up. He's like, you know, working on the sword and 
love this. Is... I need you to shut up. I, yeah, I love this moment. This like, this paternal thing. Like, just shut up, kid. I need to handle this. He's always a dad. Actually, Bill, they are. Well, it don't matter because I don't have a car that works. But there is one in this town. Parts. There are parts in this town. Meaning that you could fix one up. All right. It gives in. And, and I love just this. taking that time. Take that so pause. Need. All right. It's on the other side of town. Now you help me go gather it. And maybe I can put something together that runs. But after this, I owe you nothing. That's fine. A couple of days from now, we'll probably be dead anyway. And it's like opening handcuffs, but again, I see that as this almost tender moment between Joe and Ellie. Stay right on my ass. Can't miss it. Another great Ellie line. <laughs> Smart ass. Remember the rehearsal for all these scenes? So we shot, we shot, we would shoot these things in chunks. So we'd bring like Earl in and Ashley and Troy and just shoot the here. We're gonna shoot the whole Bill sequence, and uh, talking to Bill and he's about to talk Europe. about a partner that he's had. Uh -uh. We've talked. Uh, there was a question I brought up. Is like, what kind of partner is this? Uh, and I, it's, and Earl asked, is like, is Bill gay? And I said, well, he could be. I mean, it's really up to you. Well, no, you gave this the standard response of. <laughs> What, what do you, you think? Because <laughs> uh, I really want him to own it. Uh, I, I thought he was when I when I wrote the, the part, but uh, I really wanted the actor to own it, and he did. I mean, he made that decision to make him a gay character. And, um, and again, it's not something we we ever explicitly say, except for the magazine that Ellie steals. Right. <laughs> but again, instead of making that a point in something, it's just some a, a cute little piece of exposition. Well, and from a, a, a narrative structural standpoint, what Bill is there to show is, here's what happens when you survive on your own in this world. It's like you're alone and miserable and a little bit crazy, and it's what could happen to Joel if he keeps going down this path of just doing whatever he takes to survive. And also, Bill is there to kind of give Joel the warning. It's like, you go down this world, you care for people, you will get hurt. I said to you we walk down the steps. And that's said, where Ellie has stolen a bunch of Bill stuff. <laughs> Ellie then flips oh, him off. <laughs> God damn it. You keep babysitting long enough and eventually... I love gone. that line of Bill, fixing right? the stupid pile. Because I feel like that's such so something a kid would say when you're trying to cover. When you're... <laughs> It's right. Nothing yeah. specific. I was just stealing was all your stuff. To fix your... The pencils over here. <laughs> <laughs> this is the one where we abuse Troy. And I was like, you have to fly, fly face first into the ground. And he's like, but I should roll. No, no, no. Fly face first into the ground. Yeah. It was like, well, if I roll this way, then actually, and they're like, it looks too ninja when you can't do it. So I literally just had to eat shit time after time again. It's like seeing stars. It was great. Please tell me you're done. Yeah, it's just, just, you guys are acting against nothing. There's nothing there. And something we always had to remember was bring the tension back. Let's do that. He closes a glass door like that's going to do much. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> so that worked out well. Okay. Oh, I think the thing I love here is that, oh, well, that, that Bill constantly brings up Tess, not knowing. The right. Tess is dead because Joel doesn't want to talk about it. Right. But here it gets to Joel. And this is something that you guys actually just improvised that wasn't in the script, this big fight that happens here. It was, it was much more low-key in the script. Yeah, once he brings up Tess, that was something we kind of keyed in on. Jesus. What, do you know this guy or something? Frank. Who the hell's Frank? He was my partner. They're both kind of lying to each other. If you think about the previous scene, right? He's, he's, he mentioned this partner, but almost like I didn't care about him. I let him go, and you realize that's not the truth at all. He right. really cared for this guy, and this guy probably left him. Right. Yeah. I love how clinical he is about this. Here. With that look on his face, says everything. Well, that turn too that Earl did with he realizes Joel is looking at him, and he's being vulnerable right now, and he puts the mask back on. Yeah. And I remember like seeing that moment from Earl's like. 
Yeah, we test the right guy. <laughs> well, fuck him. And then that turn right there. Which again is kind of <clears throat> why, why Bill, what purpose Bill serves in the story is to show that having those moments of emotion, there's nothing he feels, there's nothing but weakness. Get out. Get out. <laughs> I love it. So the relationship out. between the two of you is so it. good. That's yeah. what was great about the cast is constantly having to switch from these really serious, dramatic vulnerabilities to playing tough, right? Because that's what you kind of have to do in this world is, is let your humanity come out, but then learn when to shut that off to survive. And also, you're seeing it, it's very subtle here, but you're starting to see this change in Joel where he's given Ellie more and more responsibility. He's trusting her. Instead of just saying, stay out of my way, he's like, right. I need your help. This is a good point that, <clears throat> you know, in case people weren't aware of the process, I mean, everyone at this stage, we had such great sets, even though it's kind of rudimentary, but they actually running, built right? a truck for us, and we used that truck so many times. Girl, but um, I think this was the last scene that we shot with, with yeah. Earl. Yeah, and rehearsals, I would try to give you guys as much of concept art and videos that we had right. so you can imagine the space because you have nothing there to act off of except each other. That's right. You guys have each other. That's true. And I love this exchange between Bill and Joel too because, you know, it's, it's Joel trying to kind of apologize for an awkward situation and, and, and trying to show some sensitivity to him and Bill just completely glosses over it and... The thing with Joel that I kind of admire, he doesn't, he can't come up with the right words. He can never come up with the right words. I was like, it's like a half <laughs> sentence. He's like, so, uh, uh, I, uh, uh yeah. <laughs> and Bill kind of finishes that for him, but it's, it's which, his... which really helps my writing. <laughs> <laughs> this theme comes in here because to show Joel's now alone with Ellie, but the relationship has changed. This is, this is starting to become that theme we heard in the beginning with Sarah. Now we're getting into the first scene we ever shot, and this is your guys' edition right here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this was the first audition scene when I came in. Okay. When I read for you guys, along with another scene that I don't know if it's in the it's, game or it's not in the game. It's so it's like the scene with the Walkman. Yeah, the scene with the Walkman. There's a scene. Yeah. There was a the scene kind of like it, but it's it's pretty different. Uh, baggy bills. I mean, all this stuff was just lying there. What else did you get? Well, and I especially love this because, especially at this point, we had no idea Here. who That's Bill really was. That is actually before my we, how many times did we come back to the scene? Like, God, at least three times? Yeah, at least three times. I love, I love what she says. I was like, hey, you know who this is? <laughs> and oh, it, the different versions of songs that we ran through with this, too, is great. Oh. I'm sure your friend will be missing this tonight. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> That's like, uh, the guy on the cover is uh, John Sweeney, one of our concept artists. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Is the centerfold also his penis? <laughs> <laughs> we should have that unlockable. You can see what she's looking at. <laughs> yeah. Get your subscription to Bearskin Magazine today. And the awkwardness of that moment. <laughs> but it's also such a great moment of levity between the two of them. I don't know, that's kind of a way of her complimenting him or trying to bond with him. Yeah. And it's something I was very conscious of when, like, writing this stuff. It was like, I'm kind of, this is making me uncomfortable here on the page. I have to leave it as is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's your litmus test. Yeah. I'm tired. I love that. Not even tired. Cut to passed out. <laughs> <laughs> this is the first scene because it was part of that that reveal trailer it's the first scene that I ever saw put together fully and I was just absolutely blown away how good it looked it was the first time I actually seen you know real flesh and bone put on Joel and Ellie and the yawn we added after the fact I yeah because we were like oh, she doesn't have a yawn she should have a yawn when she wakes up and then you're yawning on the set and we're all yawning because it was, it was <laughs> contagious <laughs> I know, just watching that, I just yawned. I tried to be <laughs> quiet about it. <laughs> I love that this moment of, of silence and kind of peacefulness is broken up by this. So just, Joel knows this trick. Well, what about the guy? 
He knows it because he's done this before. Right. Poor John Bentley. <laughs> and I love again how that music is playing, not as the score, but coming from the car is just great. I believe that was Ruben that we hit and yeah, that was fly, Ruben. Uh, fly off the truck like that. <laughs> This was also the first really dramatic scene we shot, and it became kind of the touchstone for how the characters should look when they're really pushed. It's so interesting when she's, you know, again, it's this moment of vulnerability when she says, I feel sick, and Joel's, again, being very didactic and pushing her away. She stands up for herself. This is the first time she stood up for herself. And I love that line, you know, it's either him or me, like come back to that. He can't, he can't do it. He can't admit that she saved his life. So this is, in the story, the first time Joel really is trusting Ellie. And seeing her as pretty much an equal to him. He has to rely on her to survive in this world. This is one of the dream. first cinematics that we saw too, and we just, yeah. it's still one of our favorites. We keep coming back to and laughing because I love this exchange between the two of them. What about me? You stay here. This is so <laughs> stupid. We'd have more of a fucking chance if you let me help. I am. And you seem to know your way around a gun. You reckon you can handle that? Well, I sort of shot a rifle before. That's <laughs> He's like, shit, rats, that's it? Fuck. Baby. <laughs> I love that line. <laughs> oh, shit. Here's what we got to work with. <laughs> we usually avoid these kind of cameras that rotate around something that are trying to do too much, but it it felt like this moment kind of needed it. It's, yeah, I love it's it. a weird parent-kid <laughs> moment. Yeah. He's teaching her how to shoot to kill. Get another round in there quick. Listen to me. I get in trouble. There's a really nice... Um, when I watched like Ellie's performance, this balance between she's trying to be a hard ass, but you could see in her eyes she's kind of terrified of the situation. Yeah. But even in this, there's almost a little bit of excitement there too. Either whether it's about the reality of her killing isn't real, or if it's just I have an opportunity to make Joel proud. Opening up. Opening up. You're welcome. Such an interesting look on your face here. Because it's almost like I did good, but then you feel horrified by it. So interesting. It's like, even though Ellie's used to killing, used to seeing this stuff in this world, it was still important to show this is having an effect on her. Right. And you're going to see that kind of carry through throughout the game. Well, it also kind of carries over into this moment as well, too, because I realized what I just put her through. I love the way that, you know, Took that away from her. It's like almost gingerly. It's like, give me that. It's like he can't really compliment it because. Right. You did good. You yeah, there's no pat on the back. Yeah. But then I turn around and I give her this. And it's like, and you said there's a sadness to it. Yeah. It's sad that in this world, these are the things that you have to bond over. Like, here, here's your gun. And that's the reward. Yeah. But that nod of understanding is great. Brandon and Najee. There you go. Yep. Brandon, I think, had the hardest audition <laughs> of anyone. Yeah, no kidding. Because I literally almost took off his head. <laughs> not in this scene, not punching him. That fortunately was done by Ruben Langdon, who can punch way better than I can. Leave him alone. And Najee, too, when he came in red for Sam, that had that. It's all right. They're not the bad guy. Just this kid that's kind of terrified to live in this world. Yeah. Man, you hit hard. Man, well, I was trying to kill you. And these, yeah, these two characters are really showing, they're kind of a mirror of Joel and Ellie's relationship. You haven't noticed they don't keep kids. And it's, it's another warning for Joel, like this whole arc for, for uh, Henry and Sam. What's going to happen if you stick with this girl? You're going to go through what these two characters are Gonna eventually end up. I do like that Sam is a character that seems genuinely scared because a lot of the other characters can tend to be a little bit more badassy. Right. Mm -hmm. And he's just 
He's young and he's scared. I he also, love that. To me, he also comes across very sullen. Like there, yeah. there's like just a little glimmer of hope and joy, but it's almost like any time there is a moment of that, then, then Henry kind of takes that away from him. It, it also gives yeah. Ellie an opportunity to play a mentor of sorts for him. Mm. Yeah. Be safer if we chat there. All right, take us there. Welcome to my office. One thing that I think made Brandon such a great choice for this and the right choice for this is this scene about how much he owned it and the pride that he had in showing off this wonderful camp that they had made for themselves and kind of like trying to impress Joel and Joel just come, you know, very nonplussed about the whole thing. He's like, oh, good for you. Yeah, you've done this. And relax. We're safe. Well, the interesting thing, I mean, the way I read it is like Joel is impressed, but he's not, he's trying not to show it. He's trying to still test this, this kid. There's a lot of that he sees himself in Henry. Yeah. Very, very much so. And this is, I remember we going back and forth about this because. Oh, yeah, because layout changed. Because initially this was, they were going to go through the camp right. at night. And then we had to change the layout. So we had to go in and re record these lines. Well, and there's interesting, there's something on the reverse that it doesn't really matter, but. Oh, yeah. The, when we shot this, the entire time that he was laying out this plan, I was just looking at him. Because I was like, I really care about your plan, kid. I care more about you. It's kind of like poker. You don't play the cards, you play the man. <laughs> yeah, one of those fleeting moments where kids can be kids. She doesn't seem bothered by all this. Mm, such a powerful line. And Joel completely just dismisses it. You guys were actually doing that in the background while we were doing this scene. This was so great. It wasn't like shot separately. <laughs> I know, we were just fooling around. <laughs> <laughs> he was like, shut up! <laughs> it just seems like there's a lot of people putting their stock on the fireflies these days. Yeah, maybe there's a reason for that. So you don't know I love this standoff, even though it's a sit-off almost between the two of them, where Joel's just pushing him, pushing him for information just to see where where this kid's grounded. Easy. That nod. Yeah, the, the threat being so subtle, but it's there. Yeah. And that's the other thing, again, that Brandon did with this that everybody else didn't do. They kind of really got in Joel's face, and he didn't. He didn't posture himself that much. It was just like, I'll take care of mine, you take care of yours. And also that he doesn't correct him about your daughter. Mm -hmm. Joel doesn't correct him. He's not, you know, she's not my daughter. You your girl, you won't join us. It goes down tonight. I guess we best rest up then. And I guess that's the most Joel's going to give him. Yeah. That's all Henry needs. Joel sleeping again. These were my favorite scenes where I just got to sleep. <laughs> no, we're gonna be moving fast, okay? And the, the idea of these two pairs that are coming together. God, and they were just they so such great brothers. Brandon and Aji did such a great job together. Left. I remember it was funny because jumping off of this bridge, there's just a, t uh, <laughs> a, rope. A, a line of tape, and then you have to like jump off of it. Because so we were both funny. stepping over it at first. They're like, yeah. no, this is like 50 feet down. I know, oh, like, right. oh, so we got to do a whole thing. <laughs> it looks ridiculous what we're doing. It's like, oh, with our arms above <laughs> yeah, our head. I know. And that's part where we're in the water and we had you on a cart. That's right. And, and we like just pushed you across. across. Yeah. <laughs> Mo cap stays. <laughs> It was actually pretty violent being on that. It was. It's pretty scary. <laughs> this was part of the audition scene that Brandon did that really just kind of helped us realize Henry. we had the right Henry. He's awake. Hey, Mila. Back Relax. to the salesman's like, hey, buddy, yeah, everything's okay. <laughs> everything's I know. all right. I really like that about his character that he's kind of a salesman. You know, Sam's the one who spotted you. You guys are taking quite a bit of water. What the fuck's wrong with you? Henry! Get back, hey, son! Hey, 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 He's pissed, but he's not going to do anything. You sure about that? Stop! He's confident. He knows he can calm you down, but he needs Sam to stay out of the way. Right, just in case. Yeah. Chance of making it, and you did. But coming back for you meant putting him at risk. Stay back. I think there's already the change there. Joel knows it's true. Yeah. Joel wouldn't have come back for him. 
And even when we were shooting this too, I mean, that's you, you really get into that moment and every time that I felt that hand on my shoulder, it's, it's almost like that Hulk moment where you realize, oh, I, I felt bad for letting you see that part of me because so far I really haven't, in these moments, let that demon out. I've done what I've had to do, but this is just cold-blooded murder I'm about to do. The thing with Henry, which Brandon really brought to it, which is making light of everything for Sam. Everything is done for Sam. Right. I think he really is intimidated. He is scared in the situation, but he's making more light of it so Sam isn't as scared as he is. Because the second that Sam sees that he's scared, you yeah. know, Sam will be scared. Silver lining kid. This is the longest short scene in the game. <laughs> I had to fit that in there, quit this place from this, since we had it right. in the, the first trailer. <laughs> I can't quit you. <laughs> I remember when we first, the very, very beginning of this, when we like did the first table read through this and everything, and we talked about, I asked if there was going to be a moment of just a, a, a light shining through in, in, in this darkness, and you talked about the scene. and. At that point, it was just really kind of just real easy brushstrokes of, of what it was going to be. And it really came into fruition and became this, this. Well, all the characters here have their guard down. It's kind yeah. of unique because usually somebody's lying or somebody's hiding something. Right. And here's like, everybody has their guard down. And they're just talking about motorcycles. You two deserve a little privacy. And you were really giving too on this. We spent a lot of time on this. And there was this one scene where you just kind of let me ramble about mm -hmm. you know, we, to where we really feel like we're coming midway into a conversation. I don't remember what was said, but it was just this cool moment. You went more into the details of like with Tommy and where you went and the states and yeah. all that stuff. I think that really helped kind of make this, the, the following takes much more natural. Right, without all the rest of that yeah. stuff, the preamble being there. But I love the turn that he gives right here. It's like the kids have gone to bed now and we can, we can just talk like adults. Animation and lighting, right? If you don't capture these looks in the eyes, this scene doesn't work. Right. The thing that I love about this well, is that he's set up a little office for himself, kind of like what Henry did. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's this, I'm being official, trying to be a grown-up. He's still a kid, and we see it in this moment. I really enjoyed working with Brandon and Najee. Just having them on set was so much fun. Naji especially, dudes. like Naji's we, hilarious. We're doing this crazy scene, and we like cut, and then he's like just starting dancing or, or yeah. singing, the, singing whatever you know YouTube hot song at the moment. Yeah, <laughs> you know, song bombing us all day. They were so much fun. I just adore them too. Is everything all right? You you, you got an opportunity to put so much of you into Ellie. That's just because I can't write, so I just listen to Ashley talk, and I was like, oh, that's a good line. <laughs> Have a good night. That's giving me way too much credit. How is it that you're never scared? It's like putting up the defense, making like making joke of it, as, as Ellie does. Yeah. And then seeing when she needs to, because that's the only way she's going to cheer him up, she's going to open up to him. And also, she kind of throws out that bone, and like, yeah. you know, scorpions are pretty creepy. That's not what I want to talk about. Being by myself. Which again, all this stuff she's saying here plays into what happens later when she finds out Joel's trying to give her up, he's giving her away to Tommy. Yeah. Those things out there. What if the and it's kind of the same thing we're seeing with Tess, what if they're trapped to where she was, again, you'd, she knows what's going on, he knows what's going on, but it's looking externally for some kind of either comfort or hope or answer or something. And then they just always come up empty. I guess one thing I'm just thinking about now, which is all the stuff Sam is going through because he's bitten, is probably the stuff Ellie went through when she was first bitten because she thought she was going to turn. And it just happens that she was immune. But So she that's what she kind of... <laughs> All these realizations she's had. I go back and forth. I mean, I'd like to believe it. That's a powerful thing for a, essentially. A, it's kind a of sad because that's not what Sam wants to hear. He right. wants yeah. to hear that it's all going to be all right. right. But she doesn't realize that's what. No, he death is death is terrible. It's a horrible, painful process, and you're all alone. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Almost forgot. 
If he doesn't know about it, he can't take it away. All right. This did make me sad because... I'll see you tomorrow. You know, he spent that whole night alone. Mm -hmm. Like... Oh, yeah. Know, Henry didn't go back in there. I let him sleep in, just like... Yeah, let oh. him sleep in. Oh. And that was the last conversation he had. And that always made me so sad after I read that. Because I was like, ugh. Yeah, I didn't even think about that. And what would have happened if Henry had gone in there? I mean, Damn. the fact that he, good. that Henry wasn't there, I mean, plays into, you know, the, the culmination of this scene where he's just racked with guilt. I mean, one thing we were very conscious of when putting the story together is we would have these really kind of dramatic moments that change the characters significantly. And then we would cut to some more time in the future. Yeah. And you'll, so you don't get to see right afterwards what happened to him, and then you get hints of how, they, how this affected the relationship, which is what you get into the, the next gameplay sequence. And this whole thing is, um, it's a huge change in Joel here, because now he sees, this is what's gonna happen to me. The same thing that's happening to Henry right now is what would happen to me if I'm gonna keep going and let Ellie get hurt. Yeah. And it's like, he's gonna, after this moment, he makes a choice, like, I need to give her to Tommy. I have no idea what that would do to a person to actually see that, to have to do that. Yeah, I remember talking with Brandon about this when he's saying it's all your fault. He's not talking to Joel, he's talking to himself. Yeah. Yeah, the thing that's cool with this piece, Gustavo's music, is that you're carrying that weight. You're carrying the weight of that emotion of everything just happened onto the next scene, which even though they might not be thinking about Henry and Sam right this moment, but it's just that feeling is lingering going forward. I own that shirt. I still think we should sell off our mocap suits for charity. Unwashed. Jeffrey Pierce. Ashley Scott. Sorry, Ashley Hart. Oh, yes. Ashley Hart. She was married. We didn't know the place was occupied. We're just trying to make our way through. Through to where? They're all right. But you know these people? Know him. My goddamn the chemistry was so good between... The two of you them. and Jeffrey. It was amazing how well, and I mean, Jeffrey's just a few years older than me, but it was interesting being, playing the older brother yeah. to him. And yeah, we felt like brothers immediately. It was crazy. Oh, well, Jeffrey came, I mean, we almost cast Jeffrey yeah. as Joel. Uh, and then once, like, months later, we, we needed to cast Tommy. I was like, oh, well, what's, what's Jeffrey Pierce doing? That's, that's <laughs> not blowing my head off. Been embarrassing, considering you're my brother-in-law. And Ashley Scott, she came really close to being cast as Tess. And yeah. then when we needed Maria, I was like, "Oh, we Ashley Scott." The person. There was there were uh, no additions for yeah. for these roles. I love this awkward setup of of this is how he meets his sister-in-law. How he meets yeah. Jeffrey's, you know, or, or Tommy's wife. Story. Why don't we bring him inside? And you get to see here now how Ellie's starting to become more secretive. Stop. Well, also it's Unguarded. like. The way they're standing and everything, it's like Ellie's kind of alone now. Like now it's like Joel is with Tommy and... There's no one familiar with Ellie. It's quite the crew you got here. Yeah, they're good men. This place gives them a second chance. The theme of redemption. Ah. Uh, gives us all a second chance. So why'd you leave Boston? We went through this so many times. I've been on quite the adventure. And each one of them I thought was great in its own little version. It was just kind of like trying to pick the right one. But this is where you get to see... <sighs> well, Joel's putting up a front here. I mean, he's, he's trying to... He's pitching his little he, brother. Yeah. <laughs> and it's it's so interesting to see them slip, how, how they're two different men, but they instantly go back into those roles that they were before. And just by the behavior here, you get um, hints of what happened in those 20 years. Right. How dark things went. Like they're they're playing nice. Right, they were happy to see each other, but now it's like it's oh, right, right. The you haven't changed. <laughs> and that's I mean that's so true to life. Like especially with brothers, you go back to that. I push these buttons and you do this. This isn't for me, Tommy. This is for your damn cause. My cause is my family. I loved. I mean, what Jeffrey was doing posture-wise. Jesus, boy. 
putting Joel on the offensive. And, and now he's just like insulting everybody here, yeah. insulting his wife. Tell me, I need this. Again, just Joel just expects, I, I tell my little brother to do something, he needs to do it. Right. Which is totally based on my brother. <laughs> this is how you gonna repay me, huh? Repay you? For all those goddamn years I took care of us. Took care? That's what you call it? I got nothing but nightmares from those years. You survived because of me. It wasn't worth it. Tommy here, is, I mean, Tommy and Maria show that, that even in this world, this world is horrible, you could find peace in it. Right. You could, you could build a community. You don't have to resort to these things that Joel has. That line was a great thing that, that Jeffrey improv on. Put your hands on me again. It's a good Southern phrase. You okay? Yeah, 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 I'm fine. Oh, oh man, they were coming in from every direction. Then Maria was like, "We gotta run." That's where you see Tommy. Tommy realizes for the first time that Joel really cares for this girl. This isn't just a job. And that's where he has that change, and he's like, "Oh crap." I'm this is why he's asking me to do this. Absolutely not. You tell him to go find somebody else. And again, it's just such a real moment between a married couple. It's like what's that all about? Honor and and you know, <laughs> doing something for selfishness and everything else that doesn't play in this world anymore. Those are archaic ideals. Can I tell you where the lab is? I don't want you to go out there because you're going to get killed, and we don't owe him anything. Because I'm sure all she knows is the 20 year old Joel, 20 year old version of Joel. Why would you risk your life for that guy? You hate him, essentially. One fuck up and then I turn into one of those widows, okay? And for Ellie, it was, it was important to show that she could just read Joel. She has this bullshit detector that, just by the way he's answering her questions, she understands exactly what he asked Tommy to do. Maria. Here we go. Love this moment. Here we go. <laughs> if anything, anything at all happens to him, it's on you. The posture and everything. He knows he's in the wrong. He knows he can't ask Tommy to do this. Yeah. She's thankful, you know. Yeah, I know. I'll take that girl of yours to the Fireflies. You don't have to worry about it. Uh, -uh. he really cares for you. It's best this way. There's so much more behind it though than that, than, than just care. It's, it's Tommy showing that he's the bigger man, that he's the better man. He's allowing his brother to be shallow and well, selfish. He's a lot, I mean, I, I think he's, he knows what his brother's been through. He knows why he can't go through that again. Which way? Come on. This is probably my favorite scene. What a long day this was. Boys, movies, deciding which I honestly think this is one of the best scenes that you wrote, Neil. It's bizarre. Get up. Because it says so much about this world and especially Ellie, where she's at and realizing how different and how much of a chasm there is between this world and that. I agree. Goddamn stupid. Well, I guess we're both disappointed with each other then. What do you want? I, I, I think I really like about this scene is that they're both kind of, I guess, being selfish in a way. And yet it's be coming from a place because they really care about each other. Like they don't understand that they both have been through horrible things. And they each think what they've been through has been worse. I love that she calls him out on that. What are you so afraid of? How many close calls have we had? Well, we seem to be doing all right so far. And now you'll be doing even better with Tommy. Not her, you know. What? And it's like the stakes are high and it's like, okay, well, then I'm going to drop this bomb. Not her. It's like, how many years has it probably been for Joel since he even like Don't thought about it, me. mentioned it? You have no idea what loss is. I think Joel's thought of that name every day, but I don't think he's heard it said. That shove that you gave that was nowhere in the script. I, I think that came out of frustration, definitely, because when we had come back and we couldn't find it and I wasn't necessarily frustrated with you. I was frustrated with us in the scene. And I was like, oh, fuck. It's so cold of Joel to do this. And I've had people on the team ask me to remove this part, that he's being too cold. And I'm like, no, it's like, because she's being so vulnerable and he's having these feelings, he's trying to shut it down. That's why he's being so cold. It was so important for me to keep that in there. 
When he says, you're not my daughter, it's almost an insult. And it's kind of the opposite of what he's feeling. This scene was such a great opportunity to show even just like all these mini arcs with characters, you know? We don't have a lot of time and we're not gonna, we can, we can only tell Joel and Ellie's story. We can't go into such detail with Bill and Tommy and Tess and Marlene. But you get this great resolution between these brothers because you get the full arc of it in just a short, short amount of time. It's like the way I approached it is the seed has been planted. Like when she says, I'll just be more scared that Joel just needs time. And in time, he will change his mind because he doesn't want, he doesn't want any, deep down, he doesn't want anything that will hurt Ellie or. So over there, the idea is just this little horse riding montages. He's, that change is brewing. And Gustavo's music doesn't hurt. What's so great about how this plays out is there's really nothing happening but just this passage of time. That used to be a level that you played through. And just during production cuts, we had to, we changed it. So it actually worked out better. It just became this idyllic idea that you never fully reach. You just see it from the outside. Where is this lab of theirs? It's all the way out, University of Eastern Colorado. Pointing out the, you know, this this moment that there was probably a time when these two used to watch college football together, you know, mm -hmm. and calling out, and he's like, hey, go Big Horns, you know, for our college that we made. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want one of their T-shirts so bad, University of East Colorado, <laughs> because Colorado is such a big state. I don't want it coming after. Sorry for stealing your horse. Well, come back to town. Let's discuss it at least. You know me, my mind's all made up. University, Eastern Colorado. How do I find this lab? It's in the science building. Looks like a giant mirror, you, you can't miss it. Yeah, the, the idea of offering Joel a place, a place of refuge, a place of redemption. Well, and originally we had some, you know, I think there was a line that we had, that I threw in there or something. It was like, maybe someday or something. It was just two on the nose. And we ended up saying, we don't need that. Yeah. This needs to be a... The look is enough. Well, and the offer to me is enough. Mm -hmm. We're about to hear Steve Bloom. Lovely Steve. <laughs> Silk-throated Steve Bloom. <laughs> Looking for the fireflies, they've all left. Yeah, no shit. What a macabre scene, though. I love that Ellie's just kind of thumbing through things. She's pretty frustrated with not having found the fireflies, not knowing where to go. Man, I love Steve Bloom's voice. He makes me want to clear my throat. Trying to save the world. It's mean. Good luck with that. Do you know where that is? I know the city. Is it far? Again, this is where we really start kind of getting the sense of how Joel and Ellie are just chasing their tail. There's, you know, chasing a phantom. Get down. Oh. Uh, for me, is what, what I wanted from this is not to overplay it, not to like have Ellie cry or scream or. Shit. Joel. Oh. There's probably a lot of panic that happened between this moment and the next. Well, what a great, what a great line too. You got to tell me what to do. When almost the entire game, she said, "Don't tell me what to do." And here is where we've been lying to everybody when we've been saying you don't play as Ellie. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Asked point blank, do you play as Ellie? No. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Uh, in this moment, a, a lot of this project and the story has been constructed around this moment, which is where the roles flip. Where now it's Ellie that has to protect Joel and essentially bring him back to life. Bye bye, Bunny. It's a pretty cool reveal, too. The pan up. And and there's Ellie as the hunter. 
Oh, we want it here. It's also oh. it's like you don't know exactly what happened to Joel. What's the state? How much time has passed? Poor buddy. But the way that she's doing that, you can see that she's been doing this for a while. You'll just start. Remember how tired your arms got holding that bow stretched? That bow, it was so heavy. And I, re <laughs> I remember that I was shaking and I was like, hey guys, <laughs> <laughs> this is really heavy. <laughs> There's David. Nolan North. Nolan North, ladies and gentlemen. Ruben Langdon is James. Ruben Langdon, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> I remember, like, uh, I showed Dolan a part of the game early on, and he's like, oh, I want to, you got to get me a part somewhere in there. I'm like, okay, I got something for you. <laughs> <laughs> I got a role for you. But I will, I will say this, because, I mean, I was on set just for a, a brief part of this, but that's when I, I mean, I've always been a fan of Nolan's work, but that's when I was truly awed by him at how he crafted this character. He took what you had and just really brought it to life. Yeah. I told him the most important part is don't play a bad guy. Yeah. This guy's charismatic. We have to believe that people will follow this guy. Follow and that Ellie could trust him. Yeah. Buddy boy can go get it. He comes back with what I need. The deer is all yours. Anyone else shows up. You put one right between my eyes. That's right. It just shows what versatility Nolan really has. Yeah, that voice. I mean, it's so comforting. It is very comforting. But it's interesting now that I'm hearing it, knowing what we went through. I get, I get, it's a little unsettling now, hearing it, because <laughs> I'm like, Ugh. Back up. It's a weird gameplay thing, but we went through a version where like, okay, she can only carry one long gun at a time, so we have to put the bow on the, on the ground. And they're like, no, it's going to be two guns. Okay, well, let's put the bow back on her backpack. No, no, it's, it's, she can carry two. <laughs> <laughs> and we removed the scope. They used to have a scope on it. And we're like, oh, we don't have to have the scope. I remember being so relieved in this scene when we switched the gun out and I got to put the bow down. I was like, ah! <laughs> <laughs> I love how David complies too. How he just kind of like submits to a little girl. Well, the yeah. thing is, is like, he knows the stories. He knows what happened in the university really and he's trying to figure this kid out. He's, this whole sequence, he's sizing her up. How, how early or how late on in the script did you write David? I mean, it was written not that long before we shot it. Because remember, you it like, started mentioned, from like, a, a pretty small. King. Yeah, it was referred as the Cannibal King. We just knew that Ellie was going to run into the worst of mankind, and she would persevere and come out on the other side. Uh, but then, once like Nolan came in and started like putting David together, it was like it became a lot more interesting to make him this really charismatic guy that is just infatuated with Ellie. Things get real, you see who kind of glimpses of who he really is. Because there is that moment in that other scene where he makes it seem like, okay, you're in control, you're in control, but she never was. Yeah. Had some practice. Well, you handled yourself pretty nice back there. What's cool about, about David and the conversation I heard with Nolan about him is that he's trying to win Ellie over by being honest with her. And here's the part where he's like, I feel like she's ready, I'm gonna kind of reveal myself. And I think, like, I could still get her to come around. Now, you see, I believe that everything happens for a reason. Sure. The other interesting thing, uh, thematically, that's in, uh, everything happens for a reason is the same thing that Marlene really believes. That everything happens, like, it's something she repeats to Joel at the end. But you're kind of seeing how all these characters are just, how much they're willing to go for what they believe in. When you talked about like being surprised by your own writing, was that a moment like that, or was that something that you had intentionally done to where those characters were going to... No, I just... I think it's just something you think about, and there's a theme that just kind of sticks around in the project, and mm -hmm. then characters end up talking about that stuff, because you're thinking about it all the time. Traveling a little girl. You see? Everything happens for her. Again, another one of those moments where... You think Ellie's got control. Don't get upset. It's not your fault. 
Yeah, and then James there. I'm just a kid. I love that. James yeah. would have got it. <laughs> no way, David. I'm not gonna let her go. Like, it was such a small role, but I really like what Ruben added there. And that the dynamics between James and David, how there's, there's conflict between these two characters, but there's still respect, and he's still listening to David, even though he's questioning his leadership right there. Part of me, the, the, the way I read that was every time he looked, every time James looked at David, it was like, who the fuck are you right now? What are you yeah. doing? Yeah. Like, he was putting on a show and he saw it. Oh, thanks. To me, it's interesting how David almost treats Ellie like Quarry. Like, you know, you're a sport. Yeah. Again, Ellie having this kind of bullshit detector, you see her scared here because I, th I think she realizes there's something really wrong with these guys. I don't know what. I just need to get away. It's so interesting from watching this, though. I would completely believe David. I would totally I'd follow the guy. It's crazy. It's because you're a cannibal. <laughs> This little moment, this breath, before going to see what's downstairs. And again, for players, it's, it's, it would have been like a while now since they've seen Joel. Joel? Once again, Joel's asleep. <laughs> I only managed to get a little bit of food. I love how these roles have switched, too. Where now it's, you know, the protected taking care of the protector. I used to be open, and then we're like, oh, we should probably stitch that <laughs> it up. It was also on the other side. We had to come back and reshoot it. <laughs> oh, continuity. <laughs> Actually, this one, we, uh, I remember uh, we shot this one again because this is going Naughty Dog Method. Everybody can, like, say the two cents. Amy Puckett, one of our coordinators, said, where's Ellie's backpack? And we shot it without thinking about Ellie's backpack. And it was like, oh, we should bring it back in and use it as a pillow. It's, like, such a nice... A, a little touch. You're gonna make it. Yeah, those shivering things was pretty cool. Yeah. The towel thing, right? Let's see, that. you did that. Well, yeah. I mean, he still... obviously he animated it. But... Great moment of them falling asleep next to each other, too. Again, her watching over him. To me, you really get a sense of the oppressiveness of the world with all the introduction with all of these different kinds of enemies. It's like you, you feel like you're fighting this multi-front battle. It's not just these are the bad guys, and it's so clear. I'll come back for you. Yeah, and just how much Ellie's now willing to put herself on the line to just get them away from Joel. Wakey, wakey. It's interesting how much audio has made all of this way creepier. We were watching it without audio. It's like the foley of what he's cutting up and back and stuff. Yeah. Like. Ugh. <laughs> time to eat. <laughs> and that's the first time you actually see what it is, that you've heard yeah. them refer to it. No, actually, this is the first time you just see it, and it's... It's, again, I, I really wanted to downplay the whole cannibalism thing. It's just, just something they have to do. Super. <laughs> he comes to bring her a tray of food. It's, it's, just, it's. This was so cool to watch when you guys were, were doing the scene. It's just like this battle of the wills, where he's just trying to like get in her head, and she will not let him. She won't give in. Yeah, this is one of my favorite scenes to shoot because some human helping on the side. No. There was there's just so much there. I mean, the cannibalism and then him being all like rapey and molesty. <laughs> like, I don't know. I'm I'm a fan of the dark stuff, which you know. So when I read it, I was like, "Yes." Um, which makes me sound like an awful person, which I am. <laughs> so. I don't know what that says about me that I wrote this. <laughs> I know. 
Um, I remember I, you too. that night so that I went home, I was just in a so funky mood. We have to take care of our own by any means necessary. It was like it was a it was a cooler thing to read about it than after actually having to go in there. It, <laughs> yeah. it was really hard to do. Yeah. You're gonna chop me up into tiny pieces. But see again, I see David being this very gracious person. There's I mean, no... everything he's saying is is kind of true. It's like you kill to survive, we kill to survive. It's just what you do in this world. But again, Ellie just is feeling there's something else here. I still don't look at David as a bad guy at this point. Yeah. Oh, that's what too is like you, we, you were talking to me before we got this whole David thing, and it's like, do you want to work with Noel North? I want to do a scene with Noel North. I want to do this. <laughs> and it's like, and I'm like, oh, we cast Noel North. Like, great. I'm like, but you don't act with him at all. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah, I feel super lucky I got to work with him because he's 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 the king. He's so fun to work with. I mean, he really owned it. He threw himself into it, like yeah. darkness and all. And again, talking to him about it, he's like, I don't see him as dark. I just. Just, this is just what he wants. That's it. I think David believes his own line of bullshit. Or whether it's bullshit or not, I think David believes that he yeah. actually is doing the right thing. I mean, that's the other thing we discussed with Nolan is like there's a religious part to David, even though I never wanted that to come out in the script. But he really kind of believes that he's been sent here and he has this destiny mm -hmm. that nothing can really harm him. What am I supposed to tell the others now? And you really took that on on the chin that day too. Man, this whole sequence with David, I was so beat up and bruised. I say, I remember you week. came back the following day with bruises. <laughs> I was like, guys, look at me. <laughs> I had bruises we're like, everywhere. Oh, that's, that looks bad, but we're making we're a game now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I love that you made it the little girl that broke your fucking finger. Yeah, that was that was a good call. Neil. Well, he calls her stupid little girl, so she throws it back in his face. I also like that she gives him her name under her conditions, which is, I'm going to give it to you, but I'm going to insult you. I also like the fact that Ellie is still so strong that even though she's in that cage, she's still... She's still kind of in control. Yeah. But it's just, it's a much stronger, that, that's a different strength than you'd shown anywhere else in the game before. It's like that winter was a really, really hard winter for you. Here's another funny scene. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, and you're actually, you're, you're wrong. I did get to actually uh, act with Nolan in this. Nolan was a trooper and let me torture him. Although we did record over his lines with Liam O'Brien. That's right, the lovely lob. The lovely Liam O'Brien. This actually is my favorite scene in the game. Is it really? And, and it, after I saw you guys shoot it, and then when I saw the animation and everything, I was like, I just love this scene. What is it about it you love so much? I love that Joel is just quietly violent. Mm. And that you pop off the guy's This is his kneecap. job, right? This is what he's good at. Yeah. He's well, just like, and it's also for me, when we talked about this, it's like Joel going back to this, like, all right, you want, you want this guy? I'll be yeah. this guy. We've spent almost the entire game for him to, to stay away from being that guy. But in this scene, it's like, I still it's, know it's like how to It's like we're going back to the moment in the beginning we saw him with Robert and Tess. Yeah. This is what he does. This is what he's done in this world. Yeah, it's a no-brainer. He's good at it. Chokes him out and breaks his neck right there. All for the benefit of that guy. And it's like, if there's any like notion that someone has hurt Ellie, then I'm gonna make every single one of you guys pay. Yeah. That's all right. I believe it. No way. And actually, this is the scene where I think he got beat up the most. Yeah. Where you did? Yo, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I had bruises over my whole entire body. It was ridiculous. Yeah, this wasn't stunts. This was you. <laughs> You think that I, I love about this scene is how much Ellie's using her brains and her physicality, like everything to like get out of this situation. Right there. Roll on my sleeve. Look at it. I'll play along. <laughs> what 
Ruben helped so much during this part because choreographing sort of all of the little movements were so particular. And I think <laughs> everybody sort of knew at this point that I kept hurting people. <laughs> so Ruben so was like, you have to give her the foam knife because she will hit me. <laughs> You were beating the shit out of that foam pad. I don't know what you were channeling. <laughs> I have a lot of anger. Stop! Stop! Stop. Fucking touch me! It's me! It's me! We did very few takes of this. This was like maybe three takes. Yeah. I just felt like so intense with each one. It was like, yeah, that's we got it. That's that's enough. It's the first time that you know Ellie and, and Joel like. Embrace is that, that physical contact. Yeah. And it's such a great choice, I think, for you to... The dialogue wasn't important. Yeah, it was just a gesture. So it was like, just let the music take over. And it's, it's the same theme from when, you know, he's, his daughter dies. This was the scene where you got the most emotional. You almost cried in this scene. Oh, that's right. We don't have to do this. You know that, right? First time Joel questions the whole idea of this mission. But in a different way, though. Before yeah. it was, why am I wasting my time doing this? And now I'm saying, maybe that's not what we need. Maybe that's not maybe the answer. Maybe it's not worth it. Well, yeah, it's not worth it. But I love that this comes off of what is your, you said was one of your favorite moments, which was the, the, giraffe, was the sequence. giraffe sequence. That fleeting moment where Ellie gets to be a kid one last time yeah. after the whole David sequence. And how you even played that visually with you just kind of catch the very last end of the giraffes moving there. So here we go. Oh, Ellie's dead. I mean, it's such, I'm sure it was such an intentional thing to call back to the very beginning, to where Joel finds himself in this situation again. And after everything that we've been through, it's like, I won't, I won't go through this. And Hands in the air. Just the, again, that irrational, maddening, yeah. desperate calling for help. I need. From this point forward, it's like the beginning backwards, where if this is the point of Sarah dies, like now you're about to do the carry sequence. Yeah. Then you like play as Ellie walking, like viewing Joel from yeah. the outside, and then you end on the shot with Ellie. So it's like the beginning reversed. Sorry about that. They didn't know who Let you were. Let me see Marlene again. And Ellie. She's all right. They brought her back. Uh, the discussions I had with Merle about this scene is, again, her desperation to find someone that will understand, that will empathize with her decision to kill Ellie to save humanity, and she's hoping she could get that out of Joel because he's the only other person that has cared for Ellie the way she has. And she can't get it out of him. I just think it was such a great way to bookend to kind of start and begin with Marlene. And it's so great that they were able to capture just the strength that she has, even when she was sitting in that chair. And again, she's completely empathetic, even though she's supposed to be antagonistic. It's a very similar line to what David says. Let me do it. You don't have to worry about her anymore. We'll take care. I worry. Just let me see her, please. You can't. She's being pregnant. This is one I've always seen Joel in the most parental role. Surgery. The doctors tell me the cordyceps, the growth inside her, has somehow mutated. It's why she's immune. Once they remove it, they'll be able to reverse engineer a vaccine. Yeah, her performance here was just but it grows stellar. So flawless. It does. I remember talking with the, the music guys that uh, were putting a lot of Gustavo's music in. And the first few passes were, there was this dark music that was playing here once Marlene reveals that Ellie's going to die. And I was like, you can't, we can't play Marlene as bad because she's not bad. She's not. 
when she's trying to save everybody. And if anything, I told him, was like, you can go dark with Joel. Because again, when Ellie's life is on the line, Ellie's in danger, he lets himself slip back into the murderer, the killer, however you want to view it. So interesting. I wonder how many players, like, especially in this moment right here, how many sided with Marlene and how many think that Joel was actually the wrong ones. Like, dude, listen to what she's saying. But at the same time, this is the theme of the game for me right here is uh, as a father, you will kill everybody else to save your, 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 your kid. Uh, and that, that has always been kind of the, the through line for me is Joel's willing to go to the end of the line, meaning sacrifice humanity to save Ellie. Again, Robin, Robin Atkin Downs. Downs. Guess what's going to happen to him? <laughs> But this was so cool too because, I mean, we've seen all the way through both cinematic and gameplay, you know, Joel is able to take on everybody, but just this moment of resolve that I'm going to wait for my moment. And it almost looks like he's a beaten, defeated person. Give me an excuse. And that grimace right there. It's like, no, he's not. Which way? Yeah, again, the way you've interpreted Joel is like a man who lets his emotions get the better of him here has to keep them in check. You see how like he wants to destroy this man and everybody here for what they're doing to Ellie, but he has to wait. He has keep to walking. catch the right moment. I say keep walking. Bam. Where was the operating room? And again, just such a brutal scene. Where? There's no threat here. <laughs> it's just it's time. Time is the threat. Now I'll let you die. This scene used to originally be all in the operating room. And Joel wasn't carrying Ellie. He like uh, killed Merlene and the doctors in the operating room. And then Peter Field, designer, just kept bugging me. He's like, I feel like we have to play this part. It's, you know, you have to carry Ellie out yourself. Can't just be like hinted at. We ended up switching the whole structure of this thing. He was right. It was like it worked way better. That was, that was one another one of those moments where we we're like, we're done. We've got it. No, we don't. <laughs> as a, as a cinematic, it, it was it was. I thought it was perfect. But as part of as a bigger part of the game, uh, it was weaker than letting you play through some of it. She won't feel anything. Again, the only hesitation Joel has is that this is what Ellie wants. And it's such a great decision to show, just cut to this, give, you know, give the audience, the player, just one last moment of, well, what did he choose? Just to, just to sit in that decision. It was also important to show the lie against the reality because the lie has so much weight here at the end. The Throughout the game, Joel has never lied to Ellie. Drugs he might have disagreed or he might have dismissed her, but he's never outright lied to her. What happened? And for me, it was, this was the moment I decided to lie. We found the fireflies. Turns out there's a whole lot more like you, Ellie. People that to me, it, it hurt to say these things. Ain't done a damn bit of good neither. Because once she started believing, once Ellie started believing that I actually had something, that I was someone, you're basically telling Ellie, you're not special, you're not important and everything you've done was for nothing. I'm taking this home. Yeah, in the first few versions of the scenes, there's like Ellie had all these questions like, sorry, what happened? Why, who was there? Why would they let you take me out with the gown still on? And, and it just was better if she said nothing and she just turned her back to him. Again, just to show how far Joel's willing to go to remove any threat for Ellie. I mean, we had talked about this before where, you know, she obviously has that bullshit detector. Mm -hmm. Let me go. And I just felt like I knew you were lying. Please. You know, I feel like, sh I feel like you Ellie knows you're lying. Yo, the end. So... 
original ending for this, way back when we put the outline for the story together, is that Ellie believed the lie and they went off to Tommy's and it was kind of like this wide tracking shot as you see them kind of getting smaller and smaller walking off to Tommy's. But as we went through the story and the characters got more and more developed, it's like it didn't feel honest. It didn't feel like Ellie would buy into all of it. And she got bit too. We didn't know what to do. Remember, we went over and over and over this scene. And little things changed. But every time I, la I sat and watched you tell this story, I was just raptured by it. It was so easy to listen to you tell this story. I'm still waiting for my turn. Ellie. Her name was Riley, and she was the first to die. And then it was Tess. And then Sam. None of that is on you. You don't understand. I struggled for a long time with surviving. And you, no matter what, you keep finding something to fight for. Now, I know that's not what you want to hear right now. Swear to Interesting me. hearing arguments around the office uh, about how people interpret that last Swear line, that last that okay from Ellie. The Whether it's okay, I believe you, or okay, I could put this behind us. Or, okay, I don't trust you anymore and it's over. Okay. Hi, I'm Neil Druckmann and I was the director and co-writer. Hi, my name is Hallie Gross and I was the co-writer and narrative lead. I'm Ashley Johnson. And I play Ellie. Hi, I'm Troy Baker, and I play Joel. This whole theme came about because we were trying to figure out how do we recap the previous game just enough for people that haven't played it or might not have been so many years they don't even remember it. So we thought, oh, Joel could confess to Tommy. And this was, I don't know why, I, I dug my heels in, and I was like, I do not agree with this. And I had such a problem with it because I felt like this was a secret that Joel was going to take to his grave and he would just bear this sin. And it wasn't until we were on set and I'm sitting across from Jeffrey and I'm watching him just listen to Joel. And every take, we went deeper and got better and more truth came out. It's really small, but you're right, it's, it's really powerful and intimate of this exchange between these brothers of just how far they've come since he's rejoin Jackson. Yeah. It's become one of my favorite scenes. The meticulousness of this task of fixing up a guitar. And I remember you saying specifically, is like, you're really trying to get the grime out. And to me, how that mapped to what he's trying to do in this scene with this conversation is I'm just trying to get every last bit of dirt out. In the original game, we didn't cut to a close-up of, of Joel and seeing, like, what was his emotional state coming into that operating room. That look from Tommy. What do you do? I love this right here. I saved her. And we wanted some darkness around that, that statement of, like, the implication is I did whatever I needed to do to get her out of there. And the justification, you know, that comes from that. That is the central question, right? And I think that opening the game on that line is so important because Joel really does believe he saved her. And that's the question for Ellie throughout the game of, did he? I remember just so much work we did on this soundscape right here of just leaving you with that, that kind of uncomfortable feeling of um, it was a good thing, but there was definitely a lot of darkness around it. It's a great scene for Tommy as well. And now he's just now he has to carry the weight right. of this thing that his brother did. Goddamn. Right now he's he's not feeling great about it. That's so. <laughs> That's, That's a lot. That's a lot. He's also a family guy, so he on some level he gets it. Where's Ellie now? And he gets what obviously he knows what Joel has been through and why that decision was so important for him. I told him they just ran some tests. There's something to me that hits me every time when Ellie rolls over. Mm -hmm. I don't think I caught it as much. I think I was aware of it. Like, 
Neil, you being a parent, you're more familiar with some of those gestures than I was, or I am now. Traveler will do this, where he will, when I put him to bed or whatever, and he's ready to go to sleep, or he needs to be alone with his own thoughts, he'll, he'll do that turn. Yeah. And it never really hit me that that's what Ellie is doing, is, is just, okay, I'm, I'm done talking about this now, I just kind of want to be private in my own thoughts. Which is also an interesting juxtaposition that's happening here, is we're getting to see the moment he was lying to her while he's confessing the truth to his brother mm. and the differences in those two relationships now. And it's um, despite how much they've been through and how much Ellie has become an equal of sorts, he still sees her as his child. And if he has to lie to her to protect her, he will. It was important to get this final handoff of um, playing as Joel one last time as this beautiful sunset ride towards Jackson before we fully kind of hand off the baton to Ellie. We worked so hard on these transitions to go from cutscene to gameplay, and it was just a change in tech that we had from the first game to the second game, where the first game, all the cinematics were pre-rendered. Now that they were real time, there was a lot of effort put into just these seamless transitions in and out of gameplay. About what we were talking about earlier. This is a great moment. Can't say I'd have done different. <laughs> and you have to wonder, is like, is Tommy telling the truth? Or does he know it's too late to do anything about it? And that's the best truth to put out there. There's also something just as I'm just it, it's just occurring to me now, but I think confessing to Tommy really f speaks to sort of the themes of the game of how hard it is to be alone and to carry things alone. Mm. And even Joel can't do it at a certain point and needs to unload on Tommy. And so what it is for Ellie to isolate further and further and further and carry her secrets alone more and more and more. There's her little house. Hmm. I discovered some people don't realize that her house is the... The garage. Uh, the, yeah, exterior garage of Joel's house. Look, mm. she's drawing a deer. <laughs> Oh, and you're hearing Sean James', yeah. James song, okay. which was the yeah. song we did for the teaser trailer. Ellie. Shout out to the environment team that had to build several different versions of this room as Ellie has lived in it for longer and longer and got more and more of her items from the old world that she's obsessed with. Love a lamp. I love this moment of just like, uh, hey, how do you... <laughs> Jesus. Do you both it's remember when we uh, did this Sorry. scene live on stage yeah. just for an audience of <gasps> 100, 200 people? Yes. I forget exactly. Like Jeff Keighley set up this one night live. And um, I goal? wrote the scene just for that. But in the back of my mind, I knew already this would be the opening for the second game. Oh, yeah. And that was... Talking about how impressed they are. Some of that was streamed except for the scene. That right, was just that, that for one, the audience. That, yeah, we did not stream the scene. There was this... I remember... We got it, and then, as often happens, there's a team of people that kind of come up to you, and after you go, cut, you know, best that one. That's the, that's the take we can go with. And people just kind of clouded around you, and there was a conversation that was happening. We were trying to figure out what it was, and you were, I saw you do your, you know, everything's okay, it's okay, it's fine, it's fine. And then afterwards you tell me this story that in Uncharted 3, the ship capsizing was one of the most resource-draining, almost game-breaking things that you guys had, one of the most ambitious set pieces you'd ever done. And then in... The Left Behind DLC, the photo booth, was one of the most mm -hmm. resource-draining, almost game-breaking things. He goes, up until you decided to put your thumb <laughs> in your belt loop. <laughs> oh, that's <Yes>. right! <laughs> yeah, so actually, that, that's funny, because, yeah, because you did that, um, Joel initially didn't have his shirt tucked in. Um, but in order to honor, again, this little gesture that you did, redesigned his clothing and, and the way we did clothing on this game is we actually sourced the actual material and um scanned it so we had to like source the shirt the pants the belt scan it so we could do this one gesture that you did which was like looping your thumb around your belt <laughs> from a 
writing standpoint, this was a, a, a tricky scene because we have to establish, reestablish these characters and their relationship, but also show there's something hanging over them. That there is, uh, we had to honor the ending of the first game, that, that moment of okay, of lie, that again, Ellie, Ellie knows something is off, but she doesn't quite know how to deal with it or how to move past it. Right, so this scene has like, you see the beginning, she's trying to get rid of him, and then he wins her over by playing the song, and like she softens by the end of it. And it's interesting, they, they talk about of like, you promised you would teach me how to play the guitar, and they're talking about like promises and oaths and the idea of um, keeping your promises, and we know this lie is hanging over them. I love this opportunity this song gives Ellie to watch him. Yeah. Without confrontation. And again, there's so much beautiful acting that you're doing here, Ashley. I know at least compliments are make you uncomfortable, but um, <laughs> it's like, look how much she's processing. Yeah. You could see it. You could yeah. feel it. And again, the, uh, <laughs> talking about when characters make eye contact versus not, it's like only when he finishes does he finally allow himself to look up. Barely. <laughs> Barely right there. <laughs> it's a very intimate thing. Yeah. I don't think I've ever been more nervous than I was in that scene playing that song. Were you more or less nervous when you did it live? For some reason, playing music live to me feels a little bit more at home. Um, but also, I don't know if I fully understood what that song meant to you, Neil. Mm. And knowing what it was going to mean now to other people once they play the game. And, and now there was context to it. Now there was story. First lesson. Uh, they care about each other so much. <laughs> okay. Look at that lighting. Lighting is so gorgeous here. Uh, and this was the same pun we had when, we, when uh, you yeah. both did it live. Did... Do you remember the joke? And you could you could see that the shift in Joel, like th that song, has just shifted their relationship a little bit. It moved yeah. the needle. Mm -hmm. He's standing up a little taller. It's time consuming. <laughs> <laughs> I love how much he's just trying to reach out to her on her terms. Yeah. Yeah. He still got that Giving in him. Giving her space. Yeah. Still got that. Yeah. Can I get over? Uh. <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> uh, and this again, the, this writing is, is is the same. It's like how this ended was the same as the live version where you just play the the low E. Well, I guess with the capo it wouldn't be an E, but boom, and just let this ominous note linger. Interesting parallel. In Last of Us Part One, Joel wakes up after the multi-year jump. Was that, to, uh, to a knock at the door. Oh. Was that an accident? No, that was by design. Hey. Morning. Sorry, I totally overslept. Just give me a minute. And I'll yeah, initially we had the whole dance and the kiss in the beginning. Mm. And then once we moved it to the end, I, we had to kind of, through exposition and dialogue, hint at what happened. Me. It was just Dina being Dina. She it's just Dina being fight. Dina. I was talking about your fight with Seth. Wait, you kissed Dina? <laughs> I love that that scene kind of plays out like an awkward thing between them as if they had kissed last night, which is really funny. Yeah. You know, it has this like kind of morning after feel, but it's like not about them, mm -hmm. which is really charming. I would never. Yeah, that's true. This is so Ashley awkwardness right here. They love it. <laughs> VV awkward. Like don't, don't point, don't bring attention to something that I did, please. It's kind of fucked up you did that. <sighs> Jesse's the coolest guy. He Look is. at him. He's like, he kissed his girl, and he's like, ah, I'm, I'm fine. Yeah. Excuse me. Hello, oh, Seth. There you are. Come here. Oh, Seth. Yeah, remember, uh, this this scene was, um, I mean, so much of the story is about forgiveness and letting go of stuff and how Ellie specifically struggles with that, and this was a pretty minor example of that. come here. Turns out I really struggle with it because I still hate this scene. I'm like... <laughs> Fuck that guy. Hey, I know, trying. me too. Look at him. He's <laughs> Doesn't work. Steak sandwich. He's trying so hard. Look. Did how he wraps it with a bow. The way he starts with, like, Aww. look. I'm like, yo, look you. Yeah, don't, 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 don't looky hear me. 
Let's let's I'm just. To say I'm sorry. Oh, oh, now it's her fault. Great job. Yeah, this scene makes me so mad. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm trying to apologize, you little bitch. <laughs> what? <laughs> Made you some sandwiches. Okay. Your steak. Thank you, Seth. Didn't we discuss cutting bacon sandwich because people had such a hard time understanding it at first? Yeah. They kept hearing bacon sandwich. Bacon sandwich. Yeah. Bigot sandwich was a bigot sandwich. Yeah, I appreciate that. What you got there? Bigot sandwiches. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> got about that. Smells. Hallie, good. you wrote that, didn't you? Yes. I, I don't know. Sure? It just bigot sandwich it's, feels. It feels does feel very Hallie Hallie. to me. Okay. Oh, this is uh, Dina's big intro. Oh, ah! here she comes. I'm Shannon Woodward. I play Dina. Dina. I had a really hard time hiding behind nothing here. Well, that's the thing that's so hard about sometimes <laughs> acting in these things is that you ha like the kids weren't there, and then we yeah. like later capture kids and kind of constructed all the pieces. Hey, hey. This is a V me lean. I love to lean. I just want to say sorry for running off last night. I actually I'm really love this scene. I totally get it. I. <laughs> I just, I felt bad. I love the one-liners that you guys kind of riffed on when we were doing the combat stuff for the snowball fight. Oh, my God. I still die yeah. laughing when I hear you guys insulting children. <laughs> and I think that was really, a lot of that was just my instinct. Yes. 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 <laughs> yeah. Your parents don't love you. I guess. Yeah. And then I think, I think eat snow, you eat little, snow. No, yes. I think you, you little, little shits. shits. Yeah. <laughs> Because I think you were like, eat snow, and then I said, eat snow, you little shit. I think God. it's like... I love name-calling children. What the fuck? I'm not even playing! Interesting parallel is uh, Ellie doesn't want to do any of this until she gets hit with a snowball, and then it's like, let's make these motherfuckers pay, which, is, again, is a really lighthearted moment of what this whole story is about. You better run, you little shit! All of the horse acting was always very funny to me <laughs> because... How that works is you have somebody holding on to a rope and you're just kind of pulling it along, pulling them around. And it would always make me laugh. Fun fact the ha, guy ha, in the ha. stable there <laughs> is uh, Yuri, who plays Spider Man in the Spider Man Insomnia oh. game. <gasps> That's <laughs> Yuri? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this was another big scene. Anytime we have a big scene like this, we can only have so many actors in the volume. So this is captured in pieces. And I, I remember like Troy played. One of the, like the people kind yeah. of like, yeah. and they were improvising, talking crap in the background. Yeah, and it's not there anymore. There was a bit where he said something kind of yeah. goading to me, and it's not there anymore. But then every take we did, I'd call him a new name <laughs> that I thought yes. was like embarrassing. I'd be like, "Listen, Chad." You come back. Be smart about it. Wait, I actually didn't know you. There's only a certain amount of people you can have on the volume. Get going. Yeah, just because we like we start losing data after a while, so to track all the. The little balls and stuff. Like, like there's like this. It gets fuzzy. Like above eight, I think it just like gets more expensive, and you're more likely to be error prone. So it needs more cleanup. Yeah. Hi, I'm Laura Bailey, and I played Abby in The Last of Us Part Two. Ominous. And here we have the introduction of this crew, the Salt Lake City crew. There's Neil. <laughs> Self insert. <laughs> and here we have Laura Bailey waking up. This was a repeating motif from the first game of these characters that are haunted by some horrible trauma and can't sleep. The lighting is really nice here. It's really nice everywhere. We debated quite a bit of like, how much do we want to reveal for this character when you're about to play as her? Um, versus how much we want to hold off for like the second half of the game when you get to see more of her. I remember we <laughs> iterated a lot of how much snow he should have on him because he was just outside. Nice. This is one of the audition scenes, I think. What were you dreaming about? Oh yeah. 
Oh, that's right. Are they talking? What are you doing here? It's important to know that we did not want to cast you in this role. <laughs> I've heard tell that you did not. Uh, just because think? you're in so many things and you're so iconic. But uh, <laughs> you are the best. Uh, and once we saw your audition, there was no turning back. What are you going to do, you know? Trust me. <laughs> You painted us into a corner, Laura Bailey. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> so the first real big choice this character makes, Abby, of do we turn back or is it? does she choose justice? We made it. She's going to end up choosing justice, just like Ellie does later many times. Choosing obsession. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's a fucking city. Yeah. It's also important to note that, um, you know, when you're acting in this, there's nothing there. You're in this blank, vo yes. white volume, and we're like, I mean, okay, it's snowing. Free. You got to act like you're freezing. There's a town in the distance. So it's, you know, so weird, now. though. Like, I never, when I, like, try to remember a scene or remember performing that moment, I never think of it in terms of, like, oh, right, we were in this gray volume. Mm. It's I always had, like, this visual of every set that was actually supposed to be there. <laughs> and I think of it in those terms. But I think that's a unique okay. skill that uh, only some actors have. Really? And other actors without the set, without the costume, they just, they can't get into it. They can't lose themselves the way like you and Troy and Ashley do. When I did this audition, Troy was reading opposite me because he was doing all of the yeah. Abby mm. auditions. Sure, they'll be happy. And that's right. he forgot all of the lines in this sense. particular <laughs> scene. <laughs> And we were just, just like making stuff up. I remember yeah, thinking like, waiting. that went really well. <laughs> These scenes can be very tricky to write, it's but they're also a lot of fun where you're just given hints of this relationship. And obviously there's this some kind of triangle here between Abby, Owen, and Mel. And Abby does a very poor job of hiding her feelings. <laughs> okay. It's not just that though. Should I say congrats? And everyone else sees this, they're going to want to turn back. But it's it's just interesting that, um, we can convince you know, Owen, right. we're setting up here, he plays this moral conscience for this group. And even here, he's trying to give Abby an, a way out. Happy. I want what you want. But not at any cost. But not at any cost. So it's like that's, there's a line here for justice that he's not willing to cross. And she hasn't found her line yet. Well, it's also like selflessness versus selfishness, right? He now has, e even with nothing else, he now has a baby he has to think about, right? Which is the same for Dina, which is the same for Jesse, which is the same for Joel. But she is only thinking about herself. Well, one could argue she's also thinking about her father, that this is all coming out of love, the love she had for her dad and the injustice that they all experienced and his brutal murder by Joel's hands. Oh, there we go. You think it's still good? Does weed go bad? Hmm, let's find out. The infamous weed scene. Are we gonna talk about how we did this twice? You have oh, yeah. Oh, we, yeah, oh, we had a whole God, other yes. version of the scene that was a little too earnest. Yeah. And we rewrote it and recaptured it. It's How funny do you, you mean describe by that? it as earnest? Because I felt that it was it was it was literally a fight until yeah. she's like, "Okay, I love you." It also felt that fight was trumping some stuff that happens later in the theater mm. once we're in Seattle. Mm. So this was like a moment to give them pure innocence before we go on this violent know. journey. I remember Neil when you pitched the idea that like she throws the glass, and I was, I was still to this day I'm like, "But what if you smoke glass?" I'm yeah. really concerned. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we're gonna be stuck here a while, right? Uh, kissing scenes yeah. in performance capture is really hard. I feel like the, the, the hardest part about it was when we would have to do the ones where we would have to be standing apart. Oh, yeah. Oh, and yeah. Then, that was really embarrassing. Can we I would just have to be like, mm, yeah, with ourselves. Because we, we had one where it was just you standing there uh, with your face turned to the side Ugh, and I just kind of kissing the air so we get the pure facial reference that isn't obscured by and Shannon's like, big head. And then why do you need the front of the face? The front of the face 
is intended. being used. Well, because they animate it from like all angles, like, even though you only see the, yeah. like one side. How would you? I feel like if I had to do this with anybody else, it would have been even more uncomfortable. But because Shannon and I got so close, it was helpful to sort of when we had to do those awkward sort of kissing mistake. moments and we weren't actually being able to connect with each other physically and feeling awkward and weird, we would still be holding on to each other. So it still felt... We were like minorly cuddling. Minorly cuddling. <laughs> so you're like, well, at least there's like a little bit of something Like here. intimacy. There was yeah. still some form of intimacy that it was like, all right, I still feel safe. I don't feel like I'm like flapping in the wind. And, and you're in a brightly lit room. Very brightly lit room. With a bunch of technical engineers like standing all around you. Yeah. But we found ways we found ways around it to sort of still be able to, oh, like you know, connect okay. with each other and not People feel around. so yeah. weird. Oh. What? I mean, now I really want to I mean, what you're it. doing is I think pretty hard of you're trying to convey years of relationship with this other per- your best friend and it yeah. all has to come across like there's just so much history and yet there's this still awkward thing that hasn't been realized until this moment. Have you met you? You make me want to go back outside into that blizzard. She's got to flick that joint really aggressively in a second. Flicky. Ellie's so cool here. Look at how cool she is. This better be better than a sex. The flicking always made me it's uncomfortable. I was like, what if it, catches, what if it catches on fire? It's a very dry space. <laughs> the one guy that saves her life is the one guy she wants to kill. And I think it speaks to the nuance of atonement, right? It's like she ultimately will save two other kids in trouble. But is that enough? Does that make up for anything? <laughs> So we wanted to create a scenario for them where, again, and Tommy trying to do the right thing and create some trust between him and Abby, he inadvertently reveals who they are. And you could see right now, right there, like Abby has this reaction that only makes sense for players in hindsight, knowing who she is. But now her goals become different, not only to escape the horde, but to get these two back to her people. This is where we see Joel doing something that for us who have spent so much time with him before is preternatural to him. It's to trust someone is really, really hard, but he's choosing to do it. And the problem with choosing to trust people is you always, every time, open yourself to getting hurt. That's just such a Laura uh, look. Yeah. Oh, I love it. <laughs> it's like, boy, this is, this is a bit of a pickle. <laughs> This is the this Lethal Weapon 4 comparing scars. It's, I love it. When I was 12. Look at those arms. Really jacked. Uh-oh. Dina's hot. Uh-huh. I tried to get on that. So is Ellie. They're hot. Yeah, we're hot. Yeah, we're hot. Yeah, we're hot. <laughs> I remember <laughs> armpit hair being a large discussion. Armpit hair with uh, Ashley office. Swadowski, who was our character art oh. director. Yeah, and how much body hair should the girls have? Mm. And what are we okay with? And... Like, let them be natural ladies. I love it. Um, a chemical burn. Uh, I died myself. Why? It's on, it's, it's on the tip of her tongue right there. Uh, that's a hard thing to say to somebody. Like, oh, I'm the only person that doesn't really get affected by this thing that's completely ruined the world. <laughs> Now I'm trying to remember, does it make it in that I'm like, I told you something true? It does. Yeah. It does. That's, this still yeah. happens here. Yeah. I, this her. scene, because we did it twice, some, sometimes I'm like, I don't remember which. <laughs> because we, sh- both times we did like, it was like five hours. So yeah, there were big yeah. days. Line of fucked up teeth marks and cysts and. Ow! Fuck you. Uh, hey. <laughs> I told you a real fucking story. I did tell you a real fucking story. Oh, you want a bite, Mark? Oh, God. Oh, here comes Steven. I remember how, uh, Shannon, how angry you were at Steven. I wasn't angry at Steven. <laughs> I couldn't tell why I was mad. And then I, we, this was the only real thing I actually fought for was 
was this, was to make him turn around. I was with you, You're and I was like, he needs to turn around, and you were like, why? And I was like, and I, it took me a while to explain it to you, and then when he did it, then you were like, I get it. Because I was like, no, because I have to protect her. I'm pretty sure that was in the script. No, it wasn't. It was the only argument we had. <laughs> it's been three years. I don't remember. You're probably it was right. Actually, I remember this. It was the only thing I argued with you about, and it was because I felt so protective of Ashley that I knew it was right, that I was like, because we were so close, that I was like, turn around, she's naked, like... Yes, you know, because and, you guys knew each other intimately, but yeah, Ellie and exactly, and because I had to, like, I wanted to prove to you that I was loyal to you and not embarrassed because he was there. Exactly, but I love it. I feel like it shows so much about how strong Dina is and how loyal, and sort of just, uh, I don't know. I love that. I feel like that little moment says so much about Dina. wanted to show or build trust between Joel and Tommy and this group to show that without their help, they might have died, meaning Tommy and Joel would have died without this group. There's another one where I think I'm like, Screaming out to all like the actors, okay, now they're burning. Now, like, there's a lot of fire. <laughs> and you gotta speak up over the storm. Again, none of those elements are there. Let's get inside! And right now, only Abby knows what's about to go down. Everybody else thinks, like, oh, we just found friendly people that helped us along. We captured this all as one go from yeah. here all the way to the golf club hit. And um, initially we had versions of it where it was edited to be multiple cuts. And then it felt like it could just be way more tense if the whole thing was one shot. Um, required a lot of stitching of different performances and different elements and some tweaking of stuff in animation, but... Um, yeah, I find that this scene has so much tension that the way it now moves. We rehearsed it so many times before we shot it to make all the moving parts work. From a directing side, this can be hard as well because you're trying to pay attention to so many actors and making sure it's all feeling honest and authentic. Y'all should come back with us, restock before you head out. Appreciate it. Again, there's, there's no ambush here. They're all being authentic until this moment. And now everything has changed. We knew this was going to be the most controversial scene in the whole game. And that, and yeah. the intention is that it is brutal and it is hard to watch, which obviously as a player is really difficult to go through, but it puts you in alignment with Ellie. You're watching this devastation to this man that you've come to love as a character. And now you're watching him be brutally murdered and it should be upsetting, it should hurt. A lot of people are still really upset about it, but what a faster way, it, like I can't think of a faster way to help you understand why Ellie is gonna go as far as she's gonna go because we're there seeing how this thing was stolen from her. Yeah, this interplay of like, you want him to suffer and he's not giving you the satisfaction of like, I don't care who you are, do your worst. Mm -hmm. And you try, yeah. you try to do your worst. Joel's not a man who begs. That is a conversation I had with Troy about how prepared he was. He, like, he, like he's lived for 20 years, 25 years at this point of like, just always accepting that this day might come. Something like this will happen because it always happens in this world. Yeah, it's irrelevant to him who they are or why they're doing this, because there are so many people who could want to do this to him, given the life he's led. I just remember shooting it and being like, this moment you've worked towards for so long and wanting it to feel right and wanting it to feel good, and it happens and you just feel fucking empty. Mm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
I think we've talked about it, Neil. Like, you had talked to me about this role, and you told me about this character, Abby, and you told me what you were planning for her. And she had, like, a different story, I think, at the time, Mm -hmm. um, how they met and everything. But I was excited and terrified because, like, as a player, that's traumatizing. And I didn't know how people were going to react to it. You don't get to rush this. Uh, yeah, we had versions of the sequence where Ellie came in after the fact, and it just felt we needed her to see it to really set up this journey. Yeah, this was rough. This was a rough day on set because I knew we were losing a character that we all love very deeply. You know, even the imaginary circumstances of that are just hard. It's also our, you know, all of our friendship, my friendship with Troy. So just seeing that and... (sighs) What I remember more than anything is, um, you know, we're going through the mechanics of it. We're stupid suits on a soundstage. And there's all of these machinations and, and things that are keeping it goofy. But the one thing that cuts through the din of all that is when when I look over at Ashley. Um, because being the great actor that you are, um, all of those things go away and all you see is the moment that we're trying to create and the reality of what this scene is for you personally. And everything that I'm feeling, everything that I'm thinking is gone because I'm just watching. And I don't know if I'll ever be able to watch that scene without it bringing me to that place, ever. Um, But the thing that I, has been proven to me is because of the way that I feel, because it's so hard, it is absolutely the most honest, perfect version of this story. There's no other version of this story. There just isn't. And for, for this version of the scene, it was important that we were in Ellie's head, that you don't get to hear this conversation that's happening around her, that this was just about the ringing of the ears, the pure hatred and anger that she's experiencing right now. And just this, this final look right here where she sees him and I can't fix this. Well, she's going to try to find a way to fix it. Yeah, she's going to try to find a way to fix it in the best way she knows how. I love this scene with you and Jeffrey. Brings you Tupperware with food. Oh, yes. I this was one of this was one of my favorite scenes to shoot. I love working with Jeffrey. You're so brilliant how it goes from this really sad, mournful place to just slowly rage over time as you're not getting what you want. Also, this emptiness you have for just from that look out, out the window there to like this, that like bereft, it, it's just really, it's just really right on point. It's just so good. Hey. Hey. Jeffrey here is, is quite brilliant. It's like yeah. he uh. has to, he wants to go after the people at hurt Joel. So there's like the emotional part of his mind and the the rational part, and they're kind of in conflict here, and, like, he's trying to do what's best for Ellie, which is to say it's not worth it. I also really love how the blocking of this scene worked out because I love that neither of them can look at each other. They're not facing each other. Maria wants to make sure you're eating. Oh, and Jeffrey's voice. It's so... She can't stop us. Scrumptious. <laughs> to have the guys that we would need to do this smart. We'd be leaving Jackson vulnerable. I love it. It's like the the one time you look at him is to make him feel shame. Like, are you really saying this to me? The only time that there's confidence there with her is when there's anger present. What if we get hit by hunters again? Is this you talking or is this her? It's a valid point. If it were you or me, Joel would be halfway to Seattle already. Which is true. 
Well, we had actually lines here where he counters that, and he <laughs> says, Joel never went after the people that killed his daughter. Like, because we, we, we really wanted to flesh out the point that, like, Joel is more pragmatic with his violence, where Ellie is, comes from a much more emotional place with it. Why didn't you guys keep that in? It just felt like we we're just too, on the too, nose? Much, too much exposition about the previous mm-hmm. game. We wanted more to stay in this moment. Like, there's other ways of, to talk about I'm what Joel did in other spots and really wanted to focus about and if you want to come with me, great. this, the logistics of going after the people, going after Abby. You have no idea what you're walking into. You don't know how large that group is. I don't is. care. Armed. I don't care. You can't talk me out of this. I can't, again, this, this moment of decision where he's like, in order to protect her, I'm going to have to go by myself. And he's like, now he's lying again. Not dissimilar to Joel lying to Ellie to protect her. Give me a day. Right, that oh. give me a day is bullshit. Okay. There's got to be some folks you can spare. Why the choice of the hair piece coming down, the little hair string for, for Tommy? There's a little bit of design, like Abby has something similar as well. So it's like there's um, what animators call secondary movement. So as when he's moving around, he does like physics on the hair. And just you know, one more way to bring the CG character to life. Yeah, it's also such a flex because it really so doesn't hard. look good in other games. <laughs> like it's yeah. just like it looks amazing, and it's like it's it feels it's just like such a subtle flex. Like look what we can do. <laughs> yeah. I love this this hug that then it's just too painful for the two of them. They can't stay in that moment. Uh-uh. That's uh, too uncomfortable to be vulnerable. Got too much shit to do. There's, there's something about, you know, when, when um, it doesn't feel real until you're at his grave. Like, there's a part of you, maybe because you play a bunch, like, you play video games, you watch a lot of popular movies, you keep thinking he's going to come back somehow. And then it's like, no, there's his name on that gravestone. And then the famous Gustavo All Gone, another version of that theme. It was hard. It was hard. Joel is a character that I love. And I, I wasn't ready to let him go. So seeing that, even experiencing that of seeing, you know, oh, we're doing a scene where we're at the gravestone is very final. I love it. I love that Dina was there the whole time and we didn't know that yet. Not looking on, just sort of giving Ellie her moment. I remember when we were doing that, I really did feel like I was like really trying not to listen to you. I felt that too. You did? For, yeah. Just it's like, I'm right me. here if you need me, but it's I'm like, not but listening. But I'm not listening, you know, you, you have your privacy, but if you need me, I'm here. This is uh, Ashley Scott as Maria realizing what Tommy has done. Maria, I'm headed to Seattle. I wish I could let it go, but I can't. I have to bring these people to justice. Ellie's gonna try to come after me, but stop her. Take her guns, lock up the horses, maybe lock her up. Buy me some time so I can end this. Love you always, Tommy. He's gonna get himself killed. He should have taken me with him. I like that she hasn't thought at all you about what she, she's just going. Go she doesn't even know what she's no, doing, what she's no, gathering. Zero plan. And, and sure Maria knows this, right? Maria knows her, yeah, like a parent of sorts, and to say, stay okay, stay well, if you're going to do this, you here's some stuff. You going with her? Yes. Damn right she is. <laughs> Ride or die. Sneak out of here. I love that those little moments with Dina where you see the snarky mm-hmm. bits. And it's funny because, like, this whole section here, I constantly felt like any time we were dealing with Joel or anything about Jackson there I was like oh this is none of my business Mm. you know like it felt like I shouldn't be there like and even in that scene there too it was like well I mean yeah I'm going with her and I'm here to be with her but all of this stuff predates me 
so all I could do were kind of these little things that were almost like for your benefit to like kind of support you or be like, I saw that. That was a lot. Are you You're okay? Like, oh, you know? <laughs> She's a lot. Yeah. Do me a favor. And- it's a weird feeling of um, letting someone that's grieving have their space, but offering yourself to help them in any way you can. Of course. All right. Get going. You're, you're losing light. I really remember the end of this scene and this look that I give you. Like, well, that was a lot. <laughs> I think, yeah, here it is, right here. Yeah, <laughs> there it is. <laughs> I was like, well, like, like, oof, this is like a lot. Today also, is a that, lot. That could have gone way worse. <laughs> yeah, and, and, yeah, and here it's still there. I'm like, all right. This this shot right go. here with the light coming through Ellie's ear is just so gorgeous. Hey, Hallie, do you want to talk about how we managed to get oh, the right sure. to this beautiful song? Sure. We were looking for a song, and my my bestie is a spectacular woman named Lauren Savoy, whose husband is uh, Paul Wachtar Savoy, who is um, a member of the band AHA. And so I yeah. reached out and, and said, would it be possible to get this dope-ass song? in the game and they were like, yeah, let's do it. That's amazing. That's great. So it just like, it was just a lucky happenstance that we were able to to pull it off. And it's great. Cause now every time now, like two of my favorite things are combined forever. It's also cool how these things are such collaborations where that's, that's obviously Ashley singing, but that's Ashley's friend, Chris playing guitar and we mo his hands and then transpose that onto Ellie's body. I loved this game mechanic. So fun. This is my favorite missable moment in the whole game. The fact that this is optional, well, I think. Remember is... how much we talked about the, yeah. the fact because like so yeah. many people love this, and we're like, oh. and then there were people on the team that argue that you, that you should not be able to miss this, but it makes it more special knowing that you might have missed it. You got to earn yeah. me staring at you <laughs> <laughs> for several minutes. <laughs> such a good cover too I mean I wouldn't say it to Ashley's face don't look over here but like (laughs) it's pretty solid when I see uh, Dina's looks over here my interpretation is that she's remember all the times that she was falling in love for Ellie in the past when she was with Jesse Um, because right they're talking about this has happened before and she played this song and the other character moment that's interesting here is like the the song she originally played here when she picks up the guitar is Future Days is what Joel teaches her and as soon as Dina walks through the door she stops playing that song because she doesn't want to talk about that this is actually I think canonically the first time you will have seen Ellie successfully play guitar since the opening scene where Joel says he's going to teach her yeah so this is the first moment that we realize like that he really did teach her so it also represents not just, like, her relationship with Dina, but... Oh, so you're right. It's every time she's picking up a guitar, there's a connection yeah. to Joel. Every yeah. single time. And we were, like, when we were making this, we kept talking about what are different ways we could remind you of Joel, because he's not there. Make him a ghost. But he's present. There were versions where we talked we about having, ghost like, Joel. We ghost, ghost Joel, Joel like, early like, on. talk to Ellie, and it just felt a little too campy for this story. I wanted to. Me too. Oh. The oh. Tommy torture scene. Mm. So we got to see Joel do this scene in the first game of interrogating two people. And now we get to see like the aftermath of having this interrogation done by Tommy. Here. Just shows you what he's capable of. Tommy did this. And then later we get to see Ellie this? try to do this. No way. Right, and at this point for Dina... She doesn't really know about Tommy's past. She doesn't know that he... She doesn't have the privileged information that Tommy used to be as bad as Joel. And she's just really sort of seeing that for the first time. Because she knows, like, the reform Tommy that lives in Jackson, that helps everybody. Right. There's another one over here. Hmm. Yeah, I remember we iterated a lot on the lighting of this room and trying to give it the right vibe, that it wasn't too bright or too dark. I don't recognize him. 
that's that's really important. I don't recognize him. That shows Tommy so killed someone that wasn't involved in Joel's mm. death. That there's already starting to be oh. this cost of um, whether this person is mm. innocent or not. Is who knows? No, he wasn't. Is this a question? <laughs> you don't make him say it. You make him write it down. And then you ask this, this guy. This is the worst board game ever. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that really, like, rocks me about some of these scenes is also just how comfortable they are around death all the time. Yeah. It implies her understanding this kind of anger and grief as well, that, like, Ellie really is not okay and she's losing because other people are going through this all the time. And so, like, it's those little things like that that really, like, moved me when I was actually playing the game. I was like, God, this is fucked up. Like... And, and right around this area is where we have Dina mention her sister mm-hmm. and how she was never able to avenge whatever happened to her sister. Mm-hmm. So she has this unfulfilled thing and she knows how traumatic that can be and she doesn't want that for Ellie. So this is the first contact with the people that killed Joel. He's great. Yeah, Didn't Chase is Chase Austin is great. And fun fact, Chase played uh, young Sam Drake in Uncharted Four. How'd you find us? So ballsy. Big <laughs> scar across his face. Yeah, it's funny. How many came with you? Hmm? Just you two? I think that's what Ellie really Chase believes that no matter what, they're gonna get what's due. Like there's like some Lord. cosmic karma thing going on um i feel like she has to or she's just bullshitting him to make him believe that there's more people coming yeah this girl was there so uh that guy is being played by reuben langdon who played james in uh part one his face though is uh the scan of mike hatfield our um lead foreground artist Kill all trespassers. Oh, oh, hold up, hold up, hold up. That doesn't make any sense. Direct order, man. No, let's talk to her. Let's figure out what she knows. I don't give a fuck what she knows. You saw what she did to the others? You have no idea. Deep in the background, Dina. I don't care how many people she's with. We will find them. We will kill them. Can you just think for yourself for a quick Jordan, second right now? Get out of my way. time Dina realizes that she's like really not okay. She's like, what the fuck? Yeah. Yeah, which I love because it's the hint of the obsession. Yeah. Of like she's losing herself okay. to the this chase instead of what's actually happening right now. And really, really to their detriment. And it was important when we were writing this scene to have the death be relatively quick. And then there's you can't even linger and think about it. Um, and again, this this just kind of push forward of like maybe the next one will be more satisfying. Or maybe the one after that will be more satisfying. I don't fucking know. Come on. Fuck Ellie. Go around. The first kind of like uh, draft we have of all Seattle is Sucker Punch Games made Infamous Second yes. Son, yeah. which takes place in Seattle. So they gave us a 3D model of all of Seattle wow. as a starting point. And then we just spend a lot of time just like mapping out the entire story and where like Ellie and Abby go. So we have this very intricate map of all the location. And based off of that, we said, okay, now we need a map that they could point to in the cinematic to get us to the, to the TV station its next location. I remember one of my first meetings, or one of my early meetings at Naughty Dog was with M, and she was, who's a, a lead designer at Naughty Dog, and she had 
spent a lot of time figuring out how Seattle would be flooded in the future. So a lot of the actual flooding you see is is semi-accurate to how it would happen if there was that much water happening. M was the one that pitched Seattle initially. Oh, really? Because she, she felt that it had the most kind of unique locations that we could move through and had a lot of verticality within the city. Let's go get Leah. Hey, look. This is the Tommy's. foreshadowing um, pregnant scene. This is my least favorite part of my performance. <laughs> I'm not kidding, nauseous perform. It's very, it's, it really, every time I see it, I'm just like, mm, it's not good. Is that your Achilles heel? Is... Oh, there's a lot, hiding behind walls and, um, yeah, that, no. You can hear no. the puke splashing on the ground. I did hear that, they helped me there. And, and that, again, it's another one of those things where like the audio department, ha- let, let me listen to like several versions of puke hitting the ground and, and picking one. Ew. I always feel like whenever I have to act, yeah. Like I'm throwing up, I always start dry heaving. Because mm. once you get that, then you're like... Like a cat with a furball? Yeah. Here's my big moment. <laughs> this is your big performance. <laughs> Here she is. <laughs> Do you say that because that body's much taller yeah. than Hallie? <laughs> <laughs> Everything is. Those people listening, um, Hallie's a tiny, a tiny, day. tiny little person. I'm Such really portable. Tinies. Yeah, these scenes, the these scenes are really hard, really hard to write, which, because, again, we're trying to make it a character moment, but give you enough information to go forward in the clue chain towards finding who you need. And giving you, yeah, new information so it doesn't feel repetitive, right? We're opening right. up the world progressively with each sort of expository beat as well. There's this really nice beat at the end here where, like, Dina calms Ellie down and takes the pictures from her. Hmm. That's all of them. You could just, you could, it's really, it's really nuanced here what you're doing, Ashley, but there's just mm-hmm. this, like, anger that's starting to bubble up as Jackson. you look at this stuff and, like, look at their fucking smiles. Smiles. Yes. Just looking so happy. There she is. That's her. Laura Bailey. That's the one who killed him. And that's the... The Last of Us 2 theme, which is like a reverse version of the Last of Us 1 theme that Gustavo created for this. Hey, hey there, Tiger. <laughs> yeah. Okay, you can Tiger. see it. How you, uh, it's, yeah. Support unit India en route to the TV station. Repeat, support Shit. unit India en route. Yeah, we should Over. get going. Is that you, Hallie? That voice? I was just wondering that myself. Because like, it is you later. Sounds, I think that might have been you. Like, yeah. Oh, Here. this is yeah, the, this the is mask the break. I remember just fighting. I was like, I just have to make sure her hands never touch the mask. I remember talking to you about this, Neil. Like, you were like, it's like she's, it's like she's committing suicide in front of you. Is like what it is. Oh like, yeah. You as know, far as you know, she is. Yeah, and so that's where that reaction came from. Was he was like, she's killing herself in front of you. Is what it looks like to you. There it is. The, I'm immune. I'm pregnant. Scene. Got it. Yeah, it's just, uh, this is where the, the obsession, I think this is the first time it's really getting in between them, that there's now personal conflict starting to form. Yeah, there's a real standoff towards the end of this scene too. Hallie, do you remember this was your first week at Naughty Dog and we had an outline. Mm. Some of the major beats were there. And you had the idea of like, what if we made Dina pregnant? Yeah, because we were, the, the, I think it was on my first day, and the problem we were trying to solve was we want these two girls to go to Seattle together. Oh, we want to have too. Ellie to have this conduit to talk about her feelings and maybe this thing to pull her back, but how do we keep... How, how can we narratively hold Dina back so that Ellie can do a bunch of these missions alone because so much of this is about the singularity of the obsession and the loneliness of that and how hard it is to be alone in this world. Um, okay. And I just threw it out there. Let's, let's knock her up. It's interesting, too, with, um, if you think about the first game, over the course of the journey with Joel and Ellie, 
is they slowly open up more to each other and reveal more of their secrets. Uh, and these characters are kind of doing the same thing. They're both holding back on secrets. So even though it's a very angry scene, they're revealing everything to each other. You were telling the truth. Maria and Tommy. Yeah, bitch. And Joel are the only ones who know. I'll just speak the subtext for all these scenes. <laughs> Please do. No. I found this scene really hard because it was one of the, I mean, we literally, I mean, you have two very, like, big <laughs> reveals or reactions that were, that could have been, like, really soapy if I did it wrong, you know? It's like the, I'm pregnant, and also, like, the chemical burn. You know, like, that. that's really well, tough. Well, it's and, like, because like, I remember we talked a lot about that, which is... Um, you just you just thought your friend was going to die in front of you. You thought yeah, yeah. you might have to shoot them yeah, in front really of you. Yeah, it really opens with so her So you being have this like, moment of, like, yeah. sadness, relief, and also, by the way, I'm pregnant. A lot yeah. of the times when Ellie's in severe conflict, she, like, what I, one of the things that I find very relatable is, like, suddenly she loses eye contact. Like, it, it just goes inward. Everything just goes into this inward rage I'm pregnant. that is... So nuanced, and I don't know how you could really pull this off in a in a game, a decade ago maybe, because there's so much beautiful facial that uh, that you do that they're able to capture. Yeah, I I th I, I feel like I talk about this all the time. Like this game, I, I don't think would have had the impact or or any of that with. I mean, there's so many people that make up the performance that you end up seeing and playing, and. I feel like you can give it your all, but if you don't have the right people that are sitting there for, I don't know how, I mean, years well, it's, and years. It's, it's, um, it's sculptors. Yeah. It's animators. Mm -hmm. It's lighting artists. Even if you, if you don't get the right lighting, the performance doesn't come through. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, and it, all that stuff just takes a lot of effort and iteration, like so much iteration to get it right and to just... To, to try to, that moment we felt on the stage to draw it out in a CG character is a lot of work. Hmm. So much work to really nail the anxious, avoidant attachment style. It's <laughs> <laughs> gorgeous. It's like we all understand, you know? The way she handled it, it's like, like almost like a religious artifact or something. Hmm. That there's like, it's, it's, it's like a medium, it's, it's a, like a connection to Joel. Yeah. Well, it is, right? Because we tie it to every flashback. Yeah. yeah, I love that the attachment to Joel is through music. It's funny, over the course of shooting this, how long did, how long did it take to shoot? Just- Like three years. Yeah, <laughs> three years. Well, actually we shot the trailer where you play guitar before we even made Uncharted 4. Because we had started working on this game, and then um, the game went on pause for two years before we picked it back up. Hey, look, Ellie's learning. Hey. One of the things I really appreciate about your performance, Ashley, is how you're able to so seamlessly jump between these different ages and different levels of innocence that this mm -hmm. character has. Mm. Thanks. Just need to build up your calluses. <laughs> I also now watch this, I'm like, that guitar is so expensive, why, why are you just leaving it? <laughs> just leaving it out there? <laughs> yeah. Oh shit. I wanted to show how, like, uh, how did Ellie learn how to swim? Because that was such a big what plot point in the first game. You should see yep. your face right now. <laughs> It's just, it's just nice to see things were okay for a while between these two. I remember feeling, oh, this is a good, this is a good thing to be back into. Like, it's, we're jumping into summer. We're jumping into, like you said, when, when things were good. This is a, a culmination of so many things, right? So for this moment of... Just Ellie's love of space, of Joel wanting to make this like moment just beautiful for her, for Walkman. And this idea that Ellie sometimes can has such a strong imagination and can go into her own head. Wow. She 
actually started with the comic book, the American Dreams comic book. So when she looked at the Raja's arcade, she was able to picture it with like children running around. It's like the idea that she can, she's so in love with the old world that um, she does whatever she can to kind of live in it. Happy birthday, kiddo. And that's where we got the idea to really go in her head and make you feel as if she's traveling to space. Thank you. There is such a unique nervousness, anticipation, and joy um, that comes with a parent giving their kid, trying to give their kid the perfect gift. Right. And if they like it, it's the best feeling in the world. And if they don't, <laughs> it's terrible. It'll, it'll be worth it. Close your eyes. And um, for people familiar with the first game, uh, the the DLC of Left Behind, there's a, a big parallel here for when Riley tells Ellie, close your eyes. Mm-hmm. And she makes her picture this arcade game. And it's like as if these two people just know Ellie so well of what would make the perfect gift for her. Again, our, our lighting team did such an awesome because there's so much that needs to be conveyed here with just lighting, and so they're animating these lights um, and then changing the reflection on the glass. There's a lot of tech here, a lot of careful crafting to get this moment. I also love that we're just with Ellie in this moment, you know. It's like you just need Gustavo to do this little riff. Mm-hmm. That's it, <laughs> and it takes it over the top. Oh, I yes. just, the scene is, is so beautiful, but so sad to me. Just because it's, because I, I know what's coming. And just seeing Joel trying so hard to reconnect and regrow this relationship with Ellie again. Um, you can see his guilt. You can feel at least shame. It's like, uh, but... Yeah, I watch it and I think it's such a beautiful scene, but there's that level underneath it that's heartbreaking to me. <laughs> it was really important for us to have um, these happy memories um, that are obviously mixed with like some negative feelings she has about Joel and the choices that he's made. But ultimately, I, I believe she, the, the, the positive, the happy memories overwhelm the negative. Well, I think Ellie is is so driven by her own shame and guilt, and you need to know why. And it's because there was something worth saving. There was something. There was a true loss here, and and part of that is her own decision to emotionally protect herself by distancing herself from Joel. But it had a cost. And no matter how happy a sequence we have, it's just this lie and this choice that Joel made is hanging over these characters. As a reminder for Ellie, is like, you can't fully let this thing go. Awkward. Let's get a move on. I really don't want to talk about this right now. (laughs) It's always so exciting to see because obviously when we're shooting this we're on a sound stage and i picture us being there but it's always so much better when i finally see it in the game it's always such a better version of it than i had in my mind More puking. This is, you could really hear the puke splashing. Yeah, this, this, in the... One I, I, this one I feel more comfortable with. Hey. How hot do I look right now? 
be yeah. me to be um, fixing some kind of computer and, I mean, and then puking in the middle. Really proves how much uh, <laughs> Ellie loves Dina because going up to someone who just puked and getting close to them, that's a lot. I mean, to be fair, yeah. she did stay up all night school. tracking the radio I stuff. Know. But she she also puked. Like, listen, if I had to date one, I think Owen. I think Dina. Oh, for sure. For sure. I would I would steer clear of the of Ellie. Maybe Tommy got to him. Maybe. What about her? There's this moment again. We we don't. Ellie doesn't. Just where, there's a moment where she looks to Dina and then she realizes like how much Dina's been doing. The numbers. You could see the appreciation in her face. The TV station. I remember this because I felt so bad. Because the way you were just playing it, you were just so sick, but you were like, I feel like I need to pull my weight since I had called you a burden and I felt like such a piece of shit. This move right here of like scooting in and this back rub thing is such an Ashley move. Well, it's also because we couldn't get too close because when we'd stick together, otherwise she would have held me. Yeah. Look. Last night was stupid. All available units report. Over. This is site 13, unit Lena nearby. How many scars you got? Over. Negative on scars. Lone male trespasser. Arm. Lone male trespasser. And then this was, again, we wanted to leave Dina behind because we wanted this Ellie by herself, just these really lonely pursuits. Uh, and it was, I felt like it was really, it was really hard to justify how we're going to pull it off. But I, I felt like this scene does a good job of, it shows... Dina tries. <laughs> like, even if she feels like shit, she wants to be there to help Ellie. Okay. In The Last of Us, there's a lot of um, totems yeah. that come to represent certain people, whether it's Joel's watch, Ellie's switchblade, yeah. the guitar that's sh shared between Ellie and Joel. And, uh, now it becomes this bracelet that Dina gives Ellie as a good luck charm. It's like this, this chamsa, which is a very Middle Eastern thing that uh, was very much in my family. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, I love that. I love that she gives it to her for. Her. Wait. It will keep her safe. It's a chamsa and an evil eye within it. It's for good luck. I don't believe in luck. Did we ever establish how Dina got that, whether that was from her sister? I think it was from her sister, but... Yeah, that, that's what's in my mind, but I don't know if we ever explicitly say that. There's a lot of, like, foreshadowing here, too, of, like, the yeah. splitting up, mm -hmm. and then later the splitting up at the farm. <clears throat> Oh, this is the scene that everybody hates us for. The great mislead. <laughs> the great mislead. Mm. Yep. I guess maybe we should talk about that. Um, when we released that first trailer for the game, a lot of people guessed that Joel was dead. And we were worried that after that point, it just, it'll be too obvious. So how can we throw them off the scent? And that's when we came up with the idea of um, swapping Joel and Jesse here, which um, I have mixed feelings about in hindsight. It got people excited about something that wasn't there. And, um, you know, our motivation was in the right place of trying to protect the story, but didn't maybe think it through of how it might upset some people. I remember when that trailer came out, then everybody I knew assumed that then it meant I was going to die. Right. And Which I, then we just leaned into with other yeah, trailers. Yeah, yeah, And everybody was, like, okay. texting me being like, oh, it's, oh my God, you die. Like, and they were like, it's so embarrassing for you. I was like, what? <laughs> Wait, oh, I, I can't say anything. And I couldn't, I was just like, lol. You didn't come along. <laughs> LOL. Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha. <laughs> Meanwhile, I think when the trailer came out, we were in the studio that day. We were mm. doing VO, and so we were, like, watching all the... And I was like, oh, yeah. uh oh. Uh, I also like that we get to establish, you know, we, Jesse's in charge, but we never get to see why. Mm -hmm. Why is this guy so good at what he does? And now we get to see it and get to experience it in gameplay. Okay. Yeah, and then The Last of Us, unlike Uncharted, we don't rely as much on set pieces, especially big stuff like this, but this was such a climactic level um, that we called Rescue Jesse. 
Yeah, we wanted this climactic driving sequence where they crash in the water. Okay? And then um, there was a lot of debate of like design-wise, do we want to walk all the way back to the theater? So we decided against it. So this was just to set the tone that Ellie and Jesse got away. They are not being actively chased. And this is just a little trick that we do is pull the camera away from them. And then that will allow us to cut to where we need to place them. Also an interesting dynamic that we talked a lot about, this like this triangle between uh, Ellie, Jesse, and Dina. And the thing we really didn't want to do is any sort of jealousy about are Dina and Jesse going to get back together? Like it wasn't, it was never about that. Oh my God. But it was just more just Ellie feels isolated. Okay. And in some ways, I'm I'm curious to hear what you think, Ashley, but I I think she kind of wants to be. She doesn't want to be part of this reunion and okay, she, wants oh, to, yeah. she just wants to dwell on what's next. Yeah, I mean, that's how I feel like I was trying to play it because I can relate to that when you're like going through something and you're like, I don't want to go through this with anybody else because it's going to be dark. So I'm just going to do it myself. I heard you sick. That sequence takes us to one of the flashbacks. There's a whole history with Joel and how Ellie feels about Joel and what Joel did in the hospital. And she doesn't let Dina into any of that. This is just their own personal thing that she's carrying, and she's still wrestling with that after his death. Ellie is is very not great at talking about her feelings, which I think is why she's on this mission, because she's not using her words. That's uh, very much a parallel to the first game, where um, after the David sequence, and Ellie's lost in thought, and then it's like Joel saying, Ellie, Ellie! I think, uh, like, Ellie has, like, this some OCD thing where she gets fixated on things and just shuts the world out. I love how, how funny Jeffrey is in this scene. Mm-hmm. He's such a yenta. Yeah. Y'all sitting up there, right? Oh, just some stragglers. Ellie got to try out my scope. This was a fun scene. How'd you like it? Yeah, feels good. Oh. The two adults don't really understand what's going on, which is Ellie is like this resentment or this curiosity, whatever it is about what Joel did is is growing. And this thing that she thought she could let go, she can't. And they just attribute it to like, oh, teenager. She's being a teenager. Well, there's that music store down there. I bet they got guitar stuff. Maybe you should just take him out for an ice cream. Maybe you guys should just hang out. <laughs> I love how he did that lane, and I love the tapping of his foot under yeah. the table. Yeah, sure, Joel, whatever. <laughs> He's so excited. And that's our cue. He's like, I did my job. <laughs> Yeah, the the engineering of this scene, it was important to show that the constant cost yeah. of having not made a cure. Okay. And here we have these two runaways from Jackson that hmm. have succumbed to the infection. And one more reminder for Ellie that Ellie. things could have been different. Thanks. But she wouldn't be here. We're also ignoring one of my favorite exchanges in the whole game, which is realizing that Joel does not know that Ellie is gay at this point, (laughs) which comes right before this. Oh, my God, that's right. Where he just assumes there's something going on between her and Jesse, and she's like, I just, she's like, sure, for sure, totally. Yeah. It's like he sees her, but there's like a little bit of a, he he can't quite fully see the full her. Jackson is a wonderful place, but we got tired of hearing the stories of people suffering everywhere else. We These are some of the hardest scenes to do, where there's just a lot of exposition and making it seem natural, like as if she's right reading this note for the first time and reacting to it. And again, you two did just such a fantastic job of just, I always feel like I'm just watching these characters. Hmm. Adam and Sydney. I love the lighting here. Just the way it's framed and silhouetted. It's so simple. Planks. So (laughs) pretty. (laughs) That look. It's like 
She's trying to egg you on to start this conversation. Let's go get Tommy and we can get these bodies back to Jackson. No, no. Let's talk about this right now. <laughs> After you took me out of the Firefly Hospital, you said there were dozens of people like me. This is the moment he's been dreading, right? Being confronted head on again with this lie. Yeah, that's what they told me. I've never met another immune person before. Have you? Small details, like we had to do different versions of the tattoo. You could see she, she's got it outlined. It's not filled in yet at this stage. Do you believe that? There's something about a, a child confronting their parent, the standing in their power, and how trepidatious, even though like, she has the conviction of her argument, right? But just how it still is a thing to stand up to your parent. And see me as an adult. Why did you pull me out of there while I was still? Uh, what he's doing here is is kind of fucked up though, because he gaslights her. He's like he's so saying fully. is like, you're bringing this up now next to these bodies, and he's making her feel shame for having just brought up this topic. Right. Maybe if he, you just would have given them more time, they could have figured Daddy. something out. There was no cure. That is what I've been telling myself. There's nothing that could help these people or anybody like else. Like, how many times have I told myself this? Like, if she ever asks, this is what, what I would I tell her. What would I say? Yeah. I know you wish things were different. I wish things were different. But they ain't. And he just shuts it down. Mm-hmm. Again, it's such great performance with very little dialogue, but you can see how it's just breaking her heart because she doesn't believe any of this. No. Is there something else you'd like to rehash? No, because you'll just lie about it. Yeah, that to me is the greatest sin. And the way you're delivering that no, it's like there's a challenge to him. Like, okay, if that's what you want to say, then that's, we'll go with that. Yeah, because it's just like, no, I don't want to rehash anything else because you're just not going to tell the fucking truth again. I gave you a chance. Yeah. Yeah. Ending images. Hmm. <laughs> Oh, I, I like the, um, your action here, Shannon, which is <laughs> use your teeth to cut the, the thread. Yes, same. Did I do that? You did. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That adds up. There's so much survivalist intimacy in this game. Yeah. He's a good guy. Mm-hmm. Why didn't you tell him? There's so like much that. you could read out of those faces. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There you go. What about this? Anything worthwhile? And there's that fucking map yeah, this again. Is, uh, the, 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 this is where the conflict starts to bubble back up between these two. It makes it so much more sad because it's like, Nora. just stick with Dina. <laughs> Look how you have love and care. It's so interesting because it's what The Last of Us is about. It's like yeah. it, within this room right now, you have like two kinds of love. There's this very positive one with yeah. Dina and this kind of negative one of like, I got to get the people that hurt the person I love, Joel. What, you're going to go now? Yeah. <laughs> and where now the negative one is trumping the positive one. Just wait for Jesse to rest up. She could be gone by then. She's got to make the lamb stop screaming, you know? We know her location. And she's using Tommy as an excuse in a very minor way now and a much more significant way later. And it's, it's funny, it's like all these people, like Maria, Tommy, and now Dina realize, I, I can't convince her otherwise. She's mm -hmm. just going to go do it. So all I could do is support her. Well, it's a dick narrative, yeah. right? It's like you, 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 you have to wait until and they bottom out. And it's the foreshadowing that eventually Dina says, I can't do it anymore. Oh, Hotline Miami. Or is uh, sh this this lady is so famously known yeah. as Vita Girl? Oh yeah, cause she's got a PS Vita. And the, yeah, this scene was already kind of like laying out hints that even if Ellie's trying to avoid violence, it's going to find her, 
All right, so she doesn't mean to kill this person. Fuck. You gotta respect her efficiency, though. I mean... One shot. One shot wonder. Mm-hmm. No looking back, either. Straight to gameplay. Oh, yeah, this... Don't scream. I mean, Nora, Nora is... Put that shit down. Pretty smart in this scene. Yeah. Is that she knows she needs to get under Ellie's skin to just rattle her so she could get away. You remember me? But she still doesn't know who Ellie is until the next scene. You remember me. What do you want? Abby was here earlier. Where'd she go? <laughs> I love all these scenes where, like, Ellie's trying to be like Joel. She's trying to interrogate yeah. people the way Joel would, and there's always something a little off about it. Yeah. I mean, it's, and it's also... think about letting you go. Sometimes I feel like Could have we can forget that she's only 19. Right. Yeah. And she, like, she doesn't want to hurt anybody unnecessary. Fuck out of Jameson. Yeah. But just going on this There's journey is like you can't, you're not going to be able to help it. Yeah, I feel like each time you still hear scream? she kills somebody, it's not what? as easy as it was kind of for Joel. Because each I death feels it. like it's a leave something with her. Yeah. Yeah, that little bitch got what he deserved. You fucking... <laughs> These little opportunities where we wanted Ellie to use her superpower, which is her immunity, to get out of these, like, precarious situations. I remember the establishing of the geography was tricky here. And, like, how do we separate these two characters? Yeah. How do you spot the goal? Right. And there's this um, progression that with each one of these, like, revenge kills, we wanted Ellie to lose more and more of her humanity in a way that she We're doesn't even understand what, what is happening to her. Mm. So you could see a lot of this, and I, I love how you play this, which is you're amping yourself up. You kind of know what you're going to have to do here. And having the willpower, again, to hurt someone to such a degree. Yeah, there's a bit of a trying to stall a little bit. Like, maybe there's some other way out of this. There are no fireflies anymore. Where's Abby? Yeah, now we're at a point where she thinks all she needs is Abby feel better about the whole thing. And that's where it feels like she, you, you, you can feel that she's still a kid because she's looking for this thing to try to fix it and that's not it. It's interesting to think about the scene from Nora's perspective, which is like how much she's willing to sacrifice to try to help her friend. Mm. She's bracing herself because she, she knows what's she coming. Knows. Like, Nora's a pretty commendable character yeah. from the yeah. other side. And it was important to just to add this little bit of interactivity to make the player complicit in this. There's a parallel of an image there when Ellie goes to enter Joel's house, her hand shakes, and then she grabs the handle, and now her hand is shaking from the violence she's committed against Nora. And it just shows that as much as she wants to be like Joel, she's not Joel. I think Joel could disassociate more, just yeah. remove himself from the impact that his violence has in a way that Ellie cannot. Ellie doesn't have as much practice with it. She also has, I think, more empathy. I think so. I also think yeah. she needs it more than he did. I think for mm. Joel, killing is practical, and yeah. for Ellie, it's emotional. Right. We see Joel in the first game tortures a couple of guys, and he just moves on. And then Ellie just did it, and okay. it will forever change her. Yeah, that's not something you can take back. The torturing we've seen of Joel's has always been toward a productive purpose, right? It's to help or to save or to learn in a way to, to be a protector. And Ellie is just a destroyer.
love this performance. This is a very expensive part of the game, by the way. Um, one of the things in live action is you get for free is putting a shirt on or taking it mm. off. In a CG world or in video games, it's extremely expensive and wow. hard. And we had to ride in this whole physics simulation on this shot, this right here. Mm. This is so tricky to, to pull off. We're seeing it at the same time that Dina is seeing it. Like, look how beat up she is. Look how, how much she's already gone through. Often when you play video games, your character or any of the characters in the game are impervious, right? They live or they die. It's pretty binary. And this allowing us to show the wear and tear on her body and allowing the violence to have an impact, not just emotionally, but also visibly, um, again, humanizes all of the characters in this game. There's so much happening there with almost no dialogue. That scene is tough. Like, taking her shirt off and exposing her and her grief there, mm -hmm. because it's not just about what she did, you know? Like, there's so much grief, mm. and she hasn't expressed anything yet, right? Like, it's the first time you really see it, and so there's this urge to, like, care for that. Mm. But then also that that anxiety of, like, I'm losing this person. Right, right. It's really painful to even watch and, like, talk about. Like, it's really heavy. It's just such such a universal theme there. talked a lot about how could Ellie draw the truth out of him. And even when confronted with facts, he might not say the truth. It's, it's what makes him ultimately do it is the threat of like, I will disappear and you'll never know my fate. And that's the worst that's thing the she worst could threaten thing. him with. A lot of iteration on this horse animation right here. Uh, I'm trying to make it as believable as possible. This hug. The, just the unrequited hug. I've definitely had those moments with my kids where it's like they're mad at me over something. You talk to me. Mm. I feel like it's such a, a I mean, as thinking of like when I was a kid, it's, it's so hard to reciprocate a physical hug like that when you're so angry. Mm -hmm. You're like, I, I, you can't touch me right now because I don't know what, the, what I'm going to do. It's like, I don't even, I don't even know if Ellie knows what she's expecting here. She just wants a more, I think she just wants a more plausible story. And then, but there's a part of it that maybe is still in denial of what he's going to say. Yeah. I also remember you being so patient, Neil, with this. It was, you will never see me again. it was so important to just let each line land where it needed to land and the response to come when it had to come um i'll go back to jack because we did this a lot of times that it was yeah, this was we, a, we we all were very patient with this one i love watching the, your performance right here trev like uh, joel doing the math of like do i say it do i not say it and then he, right here he's resigned mm. he's going to say it and she just needs to push him over the edge but look at him he's so torn it's so great The first word is the hardest. And he does need to spell the whole thing out for her because she knows. Yeah, she knows, she what, knows what this meant. Would have killed you. Ashley, there's something that you did that is just so powerful. It's that not even saying it, just the, the clutching, like I can't breathe, like it's, it's literally taking the air out of me. And it's... It's so much information to find out, yeah. but something that she's always known, but to actually hear it. And also knowing that, oh wow, you have been lying to my face every okay. time that I've asked you about this. And also the purpose that she had is kind of now gone. Yeah. Well, the sacrifices that all the other people made, right? Which is like Riley and Tess oh, and yeah. Henry and Sam and everybody along that journey. Yeah, yeah, going that whole journey and it 
what was it? It can't be for nothing. It can't be for nothing. Yeah, I feel like the killing of Nora was a really big turning point. I feel like emotionally for Ellie because, oh man, I love that part just to see how much she's been through physically. Yeah, yeah for me, this is that was one of my favorite sort of moments is so much in video games, the characters feel infallible or even if they take hits, they're still great, you know, and to show that this this isn't just an external cost, this is a, she's destroying herself. Oh. Oh. The, the Ellie and Jesse relationship is really kind of fascinating of the respect these characters have for one another and the shared love they have for Dina. And this was a cool shot of just showing what's at stake. We just keep pursuing this thing endlessly. I aspire to be Jesse when I grow up. Me too. Yeah. Such a good dude. She had a rough yeah. night. Also the idea of um, secrets, right? The characters holding on to these secrets, right? The idea that she's pregnant is a secret. Uh, that Jesse figures out. Is she pregnant? And then, yeah. like, right, it's again, knowing how much Ellie wrestles with characters not telling her the truth. Yeah. And I think so much of the wrestling with that was like, I, I shouldn't be the one to tell this information. It's not my now. place to, but yeah, I don't want to. Don't want to lie. I don't want to lie. This is starting to lay track of the, the choice that's coming later of, um, I can't, I can't just leave Tommy as rationalization. Now that she's like, she had some time away from the torture, the obsession, the call of the hunt is coming back up. Maybe you could take the it. justification, which again, has learned from Joel. Yeah, whittling these scenes down to just the bare essentials, just to make them as tight as possible, to get back to gameplay. That was quite a bit of iteration. Which I feel like speaks so much to what you all do at Naughty Dog is like the scenes don't have a ton of dialogue and so much of it is just through looks or movements. Yeah, well, we're in a privileged position in that we have the budget and the an animators and like the talent that could like translate what you're doing on stage pretty much one-to-one -to, -one to what comes out on screen. Um, but it does take a, a lot of effort. Let's go tell her we're leaving then. No. <laughs> like, yeah, he's he's got a lot to process, right? It's just... Yeah, he just found out he's a dad. He just found out he's a dad. And this is like this goodbye because any one of these excursions, you might not come back. And Ellie's surrounded by all these people that want to support her. Maybe. And they don't quite understand the darkness of the obsession. How do you leave that little punum behind? I know. Look at her. <laughs> it took forever to build this, uh, what we call the wide, which is like the deep background where you could see the Ferris wheel, you could see just all these obstacles in front of them. How the hell are we crossing this? We could use that road. You could see WLF vehicles on that highway. And again, you, when you're acting in this, you, you don't see anything. So then you're just kind of doing gestures and then based on what, you're, what your head is looking at, we build the environment around that. Come on. That's right. Yeah, and this is where the obsession completely takes over, where it's like we can go for Tommy or we can go for Abby, but we can't do both. And Ellie rationalizes that going after Abby would be the better choice. The marina through here. No, we're taking a boat. You heard them, right? They're talking about Tommy. We don't know that. 
Who else is it gonna be? If it is him, he'll be gone by the time and you it's, get it's so fascinating to think about someone that just has put so much weight of, like, people being honest to each other. And here she's lying to Jesse and herself. lying to herself. Yeah, I you know. think so much of it is her own avoidance. You do this, I'm not saying And now Jesse just sees how how dangerous she's become in this obsession and she's losing even him. And it's so hard to lose Jesse. Yeah, and a lot of the construction of this game was these long stretches where Ellie would just be by herself. So to put these scenarios where we separate her from the people that love her and wanting the player to feel as alone as she does. People don't come back from that island. The roughest scene in the game? In one of them. I'm not fucking going there. Then don't. Ashley Birch, Patrick Fugit. Seeing these glimpses of this other crew and not quite understanding what this fight is about or what the conflict is. Hands up. Um, and only later just getting the other, the, the rest of the context. And this is uh, Ellie trying to be Joel. Ellie trying to do the, the Joel technique of... And this is another one of the situations where Ellie doesn't want to kill them. She just wants to Abby. But the situation gets away from her. I love that she's just on razor's edge of just her emotions completely you. taken over. Yeah, she definitely doesn't quite, because she's inexperienced in this type of behavior, she doesn't quite have the calm, cool, and collected way of doing it like Joel did. What are you doing? Yeah, well, we wanted in this exploration of, um, you know, the pursuit of justice at any cost, um, that to show that there's always a cost. And, um, you know, in the cycle of violence, there's often unintended consequences. Uh, and the idea that Ellie inadvertently kills a pregnant woman just felt like a great metaphor for that. But it definitely horrified some of the people at the studio that um, heard this pitch. Yeah. It's an interesting question of, at this point in Ellie's obsession, what could she see that would make her pause, that would make her seriously question after torturing Nora, after leaving Dina behind? Well, you need something big yeah. Yeah. to wake her up. And I love um, how you play this panic attack right here. And just the audio design for it as well. And we, we mm. do this trick when Tommy comes in. Um, we actually recorded a line with Troy. So she hears Joel for like a split second. So you show like all these things are just interconnected in her mind now. All these like traumatic events. Uh, yeah, she's not built for this. <laughs> and just show what a good guy Jesse is. It's like he went and got Tommy and said, we well, got to hurry and get, get to Ellie at the aquarium. Mm -hmm. And this was another, like, clue chain thing we needed to do to set up for later with Abby is the idea that Ellie has this map, and in the chaos of this whole moment, she dropped it and didn't even realize it. <sighs> it's not going to work. It's completely covered in snow. Nah, by the time we get there, this whole area will be thawed. Yeah, this is a bunch of obsessed characters, except for Jesse. Jesse is the most moral character in the story. Um, what are you guys doing? that all have to accept that it's time to go home. Come take a look at that it, it has to be okay if God is the head home via some of them get away with it. We can fall city by tomorrow. We're doing good. It's like these two, they, they have to convince each other. Hey. They got what they deserved. Uh, yeah. But she gets to live. So much, <laughs> so much pent up energy under that line. He's still not on board. He's like, well. There is something interesting about how, like, Ellie doesn't see okay? living as the punishment it is. Like, living with loss is the punishment it is, even though it's destroying her. In a weird way for Ellie, like, it, it would almost be... Mm. 
she's suffering so much and there's no peace, but she doesn't see that enough to say, I'm okay with Abby living with that level of suffering. Oh, yeah. And losing oh, yeah. everyone she loves. Like, I've taken, I've, now I've made her life miserable. And that would be the triumph. Yeah, in her mind, it's like, she doesn't know what life she's living. She doesn't know what burden she's carrying. She's like, any kind of life, she hasn't paid the price for what she did. It's funny, and yet Ellie is incapable of living herself, right? She's incapable of, I know what yeah. it's interesting. And this is Tommy just trying to make light of the whole thing. Can we say it's from all of us? Ha. You find your own damn bribes. I really like this, um, the relationship between Ellie and Jesse and just how much respect they have for each other. I really like th this moment right here. How you doing? Jesse's just kind of the best. He's the most mature, level, reasonable guy. Ellie. And Stephen... Is such a cool dude. Yeah. Such a cool he dude. Is. He's just super like a, chill like, and like, he's kind of like a cowboy. Like, yeah, he's and he's like, like so a, positive too. He's yeah. A, even when he'd be like, I'm real tired, real tired. Because yeah. <laughs> over the course of the game, he went from like newly married to having several triplets. Children. Yeah, I think like several <gasps> children. My friends can't get out of their own damn way. <laughs> it's like my friends' problems are my problems. Like, and it just he puts everybody else over him. He would have been a great baby daddy. And no good deed goes unpunished. Ugh. Hands in the air, I, shoot this I love how down. abrupt it is. Me too. Get out of here. Stand up now. Don't you fucking dare. Shut the fuck up. This is one of the few scenes that Ellie and Abby are together. And when we're making the game, it felt like we we're making two very separate games with yeah. two different casts of characters. And then when they combine, it was such a strange feeling. Toss your weapon! No, no. I know why you killed Joel. He did what he did to save me. There is no cure because of me. I am the one that you want. And she doesn't get it. Just let him go. She doesn't know what this is about. You killed my friends. We let you both live. And you wasted it. Cut to black. Baby Abby. You can tell because her braid is so much shorter. <laughs> it's, it's interesting uh, in hindsight now watching Dad. how when players do this, they think, oh, I'm just going to get a little bit of a glimpse into who she is. They don't know yet. You're only at the halfway point. Abs? And we're about to introduce Jerry, the surgeon, played by Derek Phillips, who voiced um, the surgeon in the, in the first game. Another fun fact is we originally cast him as Henry before we decided to drastically change those characters and then gave him the role of the surgeon. Believe it or not, they actually care about your safety. These woods are but that's before you knew that the second game was happening at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right on the other side of those trees. And? She's due any day now. We'll just check on her, and then, and then we'll head back. I promise. <laughs> I like this role reversal where she's more the adult in this, in this relationship. See? You're probably thinking about this surgeon that doesn't have much to do until... Of course, the zebra has comes because, again, this is part of the Salt Lake City Zoo where the giraffes escaped that we saw in the first game. Zebra, played by the wonderful Chris Robbins, who uh, doubled for a lot, of, a lot of stunt work as well for many characters on this game and the first game. I bet nobody ever asked him to be a zebra before. <laughs> no, but, man, he... He, he did a good it. job of being a zebra tied up in barbed wire. <laughs> and he's like this big former football player, and he's just knocking everybody around here. What? I love Pat just coming in like, what's going on? I'm like, yeah, what the fuck is this? <laughs> Come on. Uh, hey, hey, you got a tie? Right, and then this was originally a mini game where you had to cut the wires off of the zebra. We worked on it for quite a while. And just we eventually... did. That was a long, a long time. Yeah. Okay, now hold still. Yeah. 
right there, that little slip in the mud. Again, that's hand animated. Um, <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> and then it's like, again, it's like the, the dad is acting like a child. Come on. And this was a stitch point because, again, the volume can only take you so far. And those stitches can be really tricky. But it was important in this project to always go outside the volume and just not make you feel. A lot of games, uh, the, the performers could feel really constrained, like in the box. I wanted it to feel freer than that. The one Marlene keeps talking about. They found her in the tunnels. She has an old bite mark on her arm. No signs of infection. <laughs> that can't be. They're already running tests on her, but you got to get down there. Now there's like this glimmer of hope with Ellie and revealing that we're in that same giraffe location. That was all this beauty and wonderment happened in the first game. It's we always um, no stick to the POV of the character you're playing as. So this was like why we're coming into this conversation late is because you're hearing it when Abby hears it. She's a child, not some Petri dish. You think uh, I don't Merle Dandridge. Come this back. is my first day meeting Merle. The situation. And you're OK with killing her. No, I'm OK. Like Merle and I had so many conversations about how conflicted she was about what that has to happen. And then years later to visit the moment when she was arguing with Jerry. Are you telling me this is how it's gonna be? I always like that we get more insight into these characters. To buy in. And what if this was I like seeing Marlene advocate for Ellie behind the scenes because yeah. she's so resolved in the first game and the show and, and to see that actually privately she was advocating. All of that is justified with this one act. And this was your daughter. And uh, the parallel here with Jerry from the first game is he's, he's repeating everything that Ellie says right outside on the giraffe sequence in the first game, which is like, all the sacrifices we've made, it can't be for nothing. Abby. He's making the same exact Thank argument you. Ellie does. Thank you, and then Abby walks in to give her dad an out. Look, Marlene. And Do Marlene it. is done arguing, especially in front of his daughter. Thank you. I'm gonna go tell Joel. Why? The ethical thing Marlene does here is like, I have to tell Joel, which is ultimately her fatal oh. mistake. Yeah. I guess Jerry's fatal mistake too, but he allowed it to happen. You're doing the right thing. <laughs> she yeah. sees how conflicted her dad is, and she tries to tell him it would be okay. I would want you to do it to me. And he can never admit that he wouldn't. You don't think so? Well, I think he would. I, that's what I love about this. It's like, but he never says it. Yeah, he just kind of has that look of... Maybe he's just glad that it's not her. Yeah. Is he still in the fucking building? Oof. We can't spare any of our characters from seeing the trauma firsthand. Yeah. Joel with Sarah, Ellie with Joel, Abby with Jerry. And it's just this, this shared trauma between these characters and now events are set in motion. And now we get to see the other side of what happened after Abby kills Joel. Please stop! Please don't! I forget again, this is such a collaborative process, I don't even remember where some ideas come from, if it was editorial. Or... I think it was editorial. Yeah, but to see the scene again from Abby's perspective and now get the fuller context, which is the whole concept of this game of like, you have one notion of how things go down, and then we give you more context and make you question your initial feelings about it. Whoa, whoa, what are you doing? Benny, clean enough. No, no, no. You remember how hard that pushed? Um, Alejandro. Alejandro. He's right. We can't have loose ends. We killed them. We're no it's also good, but Pat specifically would just kind of lose himself in these moments. Fuck your face. You should have been guarding the upstairs like I told you to. Move! Back up. Calm down. Or what? Back the fuck up! Calm down! Jordan! Shoot me? Stop! 
We're done. Uh, there's your fatal mistake. We're done. Not cleaning up your mess. And now, back to day one. Abby. And this is where I think the penny drops for Casey. most players that, oh my god, I'm gonna have to replay this entire sequence from the other side. This was fun. Um, City of Thieves was highly inspirational for the first game, written by uh, Game of Thrones co-showrunner David Benioff. And I wanted to put it in the game, and I had just started working with Craig Mazin on a TV show, and he's friends with them. I'm like, can you ask them? He's like, oh, of course. And within five minutes, I had like a text message, like, yeah, no problem, put it in the game. <laughs> yes. I'm on us. Okay. I love that Abby and Manny are roommates, that mm -hmm. they're just bros. <laughs> Gender means nothing. It's crazy because we were filming it. I always thought of Manny as this like really fun loving. He is. He's this really fun guy, right? I hadn't even like registered the fact that he had in that scene, like he had spit on Joel. Mm. Mm. And so when I played it and he had done that, I was so angry <laughs> at the character that it took so long to remember that he was a cool guy, <laughs> a cool guy. Why would it be up to Owen? The irony that Ashley Birch, who plays Mel, uh, has to play pregnant while you, Laura Bailey, were pregnant. <laughs> we're almost there. From a writing standpoint, this is this is hard, you know, because we're introducing a brand new cast of characters that you're, we're asking you to care about, and we're building a mission that no. a quest uh, about no. Owen that's not really related to the revenge quest you've just this played half the game with. Okay. Um, but there's just a lot of track we have to lay to then get the interesting payoffs. Just showing how close these people that came from the Fireflies are. That despite okay. that they're in a group that's very tribalistic, they have their own tribe within them. And they can be very upset with each other, but there's a protectiveness of their own group. This was hard on the deaf side of, um, you know, we, we captured a scene and we're like, okay, here you see a tower, and now you're gonna pass the gate. And then we had to build all this real estate of this drive uh, that's based on how much performance we have from you all. Oh God, I didn't even think about that. Yeah. And we iterated a lot on just this layout and this turn and like, okay, once you the truck stop, and then they have to add all the secondary motion to you all, like, because we're not an actual truck when we shoot this. But we all just kind of did this little shimmy shake as we were in that. So <laughs> we did shoot this with Roach, the dog. Roach the dog we did. Remember when Roach would come on set? In his mocap and, suit? And in, uh, in his mocap suit, playing Alice. And the whole... Set would just right fall in love just with take Roach. Pictures, just take selfies with Roach. It, that's seriously like Roach days were just they were the best days. They were the best. I don't trust him. Thanks again, guys. I know it'll happen. So Neil, do you remember we um there was originally a storyline where Mel was actually closer with Jerry because they worked. Oh. so closely together and there was like some level of contention historical contention between Mel and Abby for his affection right and we scrapped that because we just, Mel needed to be so likable because she's <laughs> such a uh, hindrance to Abby's happiness I'll just be here relaxing Nora have you had a chance to relax Ugh. I'm shipping out to the Westside Hospital in a few Poor Danny. <laughs> this is where uh, Abby gets such a relief that it's not Owen, because this whole time there's this dread building that she thinks she's about to see Owen's body. Where's Owen? I don't know. A few days back, there were some scar sightings out by the marina. Character model has incredible arms. I Yes, I was arms. just looking at her arms. I mean, everybody talks about Abby's arms, but yeah, but Nora's damn. arms. Nora's the sleeper. With a bullet in his stomach. In this scene, we finally establish 
what's about to become Abby's next goal, which is so rescue Owen. Tell, no units going um, and we come back to the theme of this, so <laughs> this uh, series, which is love. Tried. But he gave me that, that fucking look, and then he told me to keep quiet about it. Which this is one more example of the tribe within the tribe of she's telling them stuff they should not know because she trusts them, she cares for them more than she cares for the wolves, the WLF. Where is Isaac? Now we gotta go see the big man. Last I heard he was um, in the apartments. It's kind of cool to again, build this guy up and then give you a glimpse of uh, the person that runs the WLF. You know what you guys find out? Yeah. Hey, Abby. We need to go up. Isaac's in there. Oh. This was another one of those sequences where we didn't want to be confined to the volume. If I remember correctly, we um, we mapped out uh, with tape on the floor, of, like this floor, then you go into the, <laughs> just a marked area that's going to be the elevator, and then you come out and the whole place is marked differently when you're in Isaac's suite. Sir, Abby and Manny are here. And here we have the fantastic and very scary Jeffrey Wright. Don't let him fall asleep. There's a dehumanization that happens um, when you're in conflict with a, another group for so long and there's so many like retributions that they get to a place where you can't torture them because they're so dehumanized. And we get to see how easy it is for Isaac now that he just sees them as, as pure enemies. We met Jeffrey Wright because his son was such a big fan of the first game. And talking to him, I offered him uh, this role and he was very excited to take it on. So it, was, it was fun to work with him, even if a little intimidating at times, just because his gravelly voice is so, so creepy. What's going on, boss? These small skirmishes. Going like this. Then what? This was another obstacle we're throwing in Abby's way, which is um, in the past, Isaac has given her a lot of rope because of how capable she is to pursue Joel. Um, but here, he can't afford to have anybody leave because they're going to go all out to kill every last scar, as he would call it. Sir, we try attacking their island. Not I remember like in like early iterations of the script, having a bunch of scenes, not a bunch, but having scenes with a big storm, a Isaac, big I'm use it to where he was approach. very much a mentor for her mm -hmm. and almost like a surrogate father figure yep. as she was growing up. Those were early versions of the story or yeah. just in trying to shrink this behemoth down, we um, end up cutting. But uh, the other thing you could see here is... Uh, Jeffrey Wright has a limp. Uh, and the reason for that is if you look at the concept art, he has an amputated leg. Uh, and there's no opportunity to really see it, but um, the limp is still there. Uh, and then uh, we did so many takes, and Jeffrey insisted on eating an apple on every take just to make it authentic. So he ate a bunch of apples. To Laura's point, we we wrote scenes. I remember drafting scenes where he's coming in as trying to be sort of a Tommy, like a father figure uh, after she's lost her dad. And you come to realize how intimate their relationship is, um, but it's something that she can... She will very quickly give up in the face of Owen being in trouble. And... As soon as she connects with Lev again, she's willing to give that up. But couldn't do it for time. You get little hints of it because I feel like our relationship in this scene, you can see that they've, he's given her things in the past. She's yeah. used to being able to get her way. And uh -huh. the one line, the way he delivers it, like stop gossiping about it. Like the idea of that you guys need to stop like being this like Salt Lake City crew. You're part of a bigger group now. Yeah. There are things mm -hmm. more important. Get to the bottom of it. And even here, he's like saying, when the time comes, we'll do what's right. Yeah. Yeah, at this point, you, you find him to be, I think, 
torturing aside, like he's a very fair leader with her. Mm -hmm. He's given her a lot and then now he expects her to step up for ultimately what a three day assault. The way he behaves again, this is like a one <laughs> a broken record, which is uh he loves his people. Mm -hmm. He's gonna go commit atrocities because of how much he loves the people that look up to him. He's gonna burn a village filled with children. Right? No way a wink killed Danny over some scar, right? What? No. Abby, don't. I'll be back by morning. You just gotta cover me till then. I said we'll kick your ass. Not before the assault. You heard him. Abby doesn't care about this assault. In the same way that Joel didn't care about finding a cure. It's just about the people that are close to us. And now we head into her head for flashback. The most fun scenes to shoot. <laughs> this was fun watching you two be so playful. They were like a little respite from all of the... <laughs> the horror. The horror that we were shooting. But again, establishing Abby has vulnerabilities, right? Not just uh, emotionally, but she has a deep, deep, deep fear of heights, which then gives Lev an opportunity to help her. Just interesting, um, these characters that here with Owen and then the other time with Joel, when he takes Ellie to the museum of these gifts that they give the people that they love. Um, and here it's like he brought her to show her this beautiful aquarium as a show of his love. Well, he's trying to write in the same way as as Joel after David. He is trying to get back to the Abbey that was. He's trying to get back to the dynamic that they had. Really? And he's putting all of his heart into bringing her joy in the hopes that he can get confirmation that that person is not dead. It's getting late. Yeah. We had had these long talks about how Abby, yeah. like, is so serious and doesn't want to, no. <laughs> doesn't want to joke around. She's not a jokester. Do and I think try. Pat just, like, took that and ran because every single time we would shoot, he would try to make me laugh as we were shooting as, like, a challenge. I'm serious. I will break up with you. Owen. I always love you. Don't! Owen! <laughs> It is like, at this point, Abby also, I think, is trying to be the person everybody wants her to be. She's trying to be the old version of Abby. She's trying to be the loyal soldier to Isaac, who has given them a home and a purpose. She's still figuring out who this new version of her is. And reinforcing her fear of height. When we shot that, though, do you remember how pregnant I was? Remember how terrified I was because you're jumping off this, like, two-foot platform. It had to be. It was higher than two feet, right? Three Tell feet. Tell me it was higher than three two feet. Three feet. Uh, but then every time you landed hard on the ground, I'm like, oh, my God, a baby's going to fall out of her. <laughs> this was, like, a nice, short and sweet little cinematic. Also a fun thing to shoot when you're, like, coming up from underwater. <laughs> And then I remember you have to do this prep as if you're diving and transition in and out of gameplay. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> I like this, these, I, this, these kind of air pockets that would still have remained here. <gasps> <laughs> as you held your breath a lot while yes. shooting some of these scenes. I love this scene. Yeah, this, this whole sequence is for this scene. Nick, but poor Owen loves Abby so much, and she's just so stuck with this. Well, grief, I guess, that she can't let go. The, the injustice that she can't let go. You could argue that what she Owen is going through is a smaller version of what Abby is going through, right? Like, he's in love with this girl. He's fixated on her. He's ready to go on this journey with her and risk things for her, and all he wants in return is a little bit of love. 
and she just can't. She can't. This is just, she's not the person she was anymore. It's this, this notion that somehow if she's happy, she's disrespecting the loss of her father. Yeah. You want me to slow down? No. It... She can't allow herself to be too happy. Is it this? <laughs> and he's still trying to make light of it. Look at, look at him. He's so cute. We're disgusted by it. <laughs> Patrick Fugit is a very charming man. Very. I'm sorry. Don't be sorry. Talk to me. Just let him in. I know all the leads have dried up, but... But Joel's still out there, you know? I know. And we get the sense that this is not the first time they're having this conversation. No, this is the end of their intimate relationship, right? He's yeah. gonna try and move on this is... with Mel. It's not gonna work out. This is the breakup scene. Not how he envisioned okay. this moment going, I have no. a feeling. Well, I, I, I kind of this idea, like, like, look what I brought you. I brought you underwater. What else can I do? There are you. seals swimming around. <laughs> it's just not enough. So sad. I mean, it's, it's very much a parallel to what we see, a much worse version of this in Ellie on the farm with Dina. Yeah. I'm sorry. I told you already. Don't be sorry. Flashback number two for Abby. Yeah. So this scene also, the sequence had to do a lot of work because we're once again resetting. You have to learn where she and Owen are in their relationship. Uh, feel that tension, feel the family dynamics. Owen! He's so surprised to see her. Hey. Hey. Is everything all right? Yeah. I love the set, this man. The set took so many forever, iterations to forever. get right, but it was, it was really important that it felt gorgeous justify why this guy has holed up in here for so long. What is all this? Festive. You gotta get the full effect. This is our, this is our Christmas episode. Take in that view. A thing you might not appreciate until you sort of really play this is this aquarium had to meet so many different needs because it's in so many different levels. Right. And so to make sure that all of those could work together was um, painstaking, especially for the layout designers. Now, try that. Well? The view is nice. Oh, whatever. Philistine. You want me to lie? Yes, obviously. She's into this Christmas thing. Again, look at this effort he puts in. Yeah, there's this a beautiful tension between these characters that still so. clearly very much love each other. But he did this for Mel, right? Yeah, this is this for is... Mel. Right, but look how excited he is that Abby's here. No, I know. He's trying to move I doubt, on. I doubt he's this excited when Mel's here. <laughs> you don't deserve Poor Mel. <laughs> but I think Poor he Mel. wants to be, right? I think he yeah. wants to move on with Mel. He wants. He knows she's inaccessible. Well, yeah, Abby's a dead end. Why are you in such a good mood? Am I? <laughs> I love that he misreads this, like he thinks this is somehow about him and now he's gonna convince her to stay, but she's in a good mood because... I found Joel's brother. They found Joel's brother. He's at a settlement out in Wyoming. How do you know that? The fireflies who served with him got picked up at the wall. I thought he quit like a decade ago. Yeah. So, have these guys heard from him since? It's a lead. I gotta see it through. Okay, but you know that even if he is there, and you do find him, 
you might not know where Joel is, right? Right, because at this point, we're already... S Canonically, he's already starting to have issues killing Scars. Everyone's on board. And we're not really talking no, about it, but there's some track getting laid. He's losing his taste for violence. I like that he was the last person that she went to go I talk to about this. Many people go off base. He already did. Bullshit. Who's more about justice than Isaac? He knows what Joel's done. Hey. We're doing this together, right? I love that, that look, it's like, you promised me. If we get, like, any clue, you promised me. He doesn't want to be the, the last holdout. But he's like Jesse. He's never not going to go if his people are going. Oh. <laughs> the Paris sequence. This scene. Oh, yes. Was this, was this one of the first things yes, we shot? Yeah, because it was for Paris Games yeah. Week. Paris Games Week, yeah. Mm -hmm. We shot this way in advance. I think it was like a day or two before we shot this that I'm like, we could do this all as one shot. And like I had sketched out like these kind of storyboards real quick and then uh, came up with this hazy plan with uh, Matt Neapolitan, our cinematographer for this game. Like take after take of getting dragged by your arms. <laughs> uh, this was another one where... Um, we actually strung Laura up with, we had like two ropes, one that was around your neck to just give you a little bit of tension that you could mm -hmm. lean into as much as you wanted, and then another one that held your body up in the air. Yeah. Oh, but man, this was so much work, and like we scrutinized the tiniest details in the scene. <gasps> when this came out originally, people thought that she was... Uh, Anna. Anna. Yeah. That she was Ellie's mom. They were watching the narrative of how Ellie came to be. These uh, seraphites that at times you might feel sorry for them and you see them getting tortured. And then... And then see that, you know... Oh, wait a minute. Uh, here, the lead seraphites in the scene is played by Emily Swallow in Small World. She's of Mandalorian fame, acting along uh, Pedro Pascal. <laughs> and uh, later we find out this is a bastardization of, of this thing of like freedom so they may know my love wasn't meant as like disembowel them. Freedom that they may know my The intro of Victoria Grace plays Yara. Yeah, this scene has a lot of heavy lifting. It's introducing like two major characters of Yara and Lev. Yara. Again, this 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 idea that keeps repeating in this story of like the tribe within a tribe that even though these are all Abby's enemies, Seraphites, somehow they have it in for these two kids. And again, this is one of those weird opportunities, and that sounds dark, but like in seeing the violence against these kids it's much easier to immediately understand why Abby makes the choices she makes. They may be their enemy, but these are kids getting hurt. Lighting a scene is really hard. Uh, lighting a scene that's one take, where the camera's constantly moving around in 360 degrees and making sure all those angles still look good, is close to impossible. So kudos to our lighting team. The face change, is she, ugh. The face change, the flow of blood, the water. There's, there's so many things that, um, done improperly, would take you out of the scene. Uh, and then we spent a lot of time, even to the hands right there. I remember we spent so much time making sure you see the tension in the hands as she's suffocating. The shirt, and make sure the shirt felt wet and it's sticking to her skin, and it's a little bit translucent because it's wet. That's the kind of detail that Naughty Dog is crazy about. Demons are coming. So this is the introduction of Ian Alexander. And a fun thing to watch She's as you watch his head. face throughout the game is, I think it was um, lead character Ashley Swadowski came up with it. But if you look at his scars, 
one of them is a little crooked uh, and wobbly, and the idea that like you see there's physical representation of his hesitation in this religion, even on the scars on his face. And yet, I think the beautiful thing with him is that he remains a believer yeah. all the way through. Yeah, his faith partly saved him, right? Because he saw the beauty in the mm. intention. Watch your backs. Lock it. Another scene that just, I, I say this over and over, but it's um, such beautiful, soft lighting. Right, and so at this point, they've worked together for as long as they need to, but they're off to go on their separate missions. They don't need to be friends. Come help me with this. That taking off of the shirt is so hard. I can't tell people how hard it is. <laughs> the raindrops again, this window, were difficult. Um, my high school friend has become a renowned plastic surgeon, uh, Jacob Steiger. Uh, and he gave me some advice here on this injury and what you would need to do to treat it. Right, and this is also a reminder that while Abby took a different path, she comes from doctors, from care. She understands the body, even if she never particularly prioritized it. Victoria and Ian were great in this. Just how Ian has to play both being scared for his sister and just angry at this wolf that he has to work with. What's your name? This is a recurring um, theme throughout both games, that the idea of giving someone's name is a way to show you trust them. Thanks for cutting me down. I love this theme again. I like the conflict of leaving them, knowing you're dooming them. Oh, this is, she thinks, I'll give them the warning and I'll be enough. Sarah gets a lot of traffic. Whatever shape she's in, we need to get out of here by tomorrow. I don't need your fucking help. Look at the lighting on the hair. This game is still very impressive. Owen? Ah, uh, this okay. scene turned out to be uh, a bit more controversial than we anticipated. <laughs> <clears throat> the irony here is, as much as this is the counterpoint sex scene Fucking to Ellie's sex cool. scene, <laughs> we don't, oh, I guess we do show a little more. I we show a little bit more. Yeah. Um, he didn't. Well, we'll get to that in a second, but... Uh, I love, I love this interplay between yeah, you two. Part. I'm gonna fix her back and, up. um... I see. Yeah, we really wanted to give Pat That's something like, meaty. Yes. And this this monologue, which he just, like, for my money, knocked it out of the park. Danny's dead. Of, like, visualizing this moment where he just, he just can't do this violent thing anymore. It's not him. You want to tell me what happened? I like that she's been strung up and beaten and almost killed. And we were that none of that's important right now. Camp. It's just a couple scars and. Uh, mm, I just got to come in and sit down and watch him work. <laughs> and he goes down, and his weapon's right and this there. This idea of the tribe within the tribe and. Um, he doesn't go for it. There's no secrets between these two. Instead, he turns to me, and he's old. The idea that he, right, he's just been sitting here Sorry. drinking, conflicted, and I mean, he's about to leave his baby mama. That's how much he can't stay in this place. Right. He feels like he's losing his soul. And this, this look right here, it's like there's a part of Abby that, that knows what he's saying is true. Cool. 
but that that sense of duty to this group that has taken care of them is still there, but starting to erode. I couldn't do it. Of course, Danny gets in my fucking face. About well, we're watching her maturity in real time. Especially having come off of seeing two seraphites up close and saving them too. So I grab it and then. I like that there's so much like unspoken between them that's about to come to the surface of like, Abby thinks he's so naive and he thinks what she did was so awful, but clearly they've never talked about it until now. And then there's the underlying love they have for each other and obviously attraction. It's just, it's all like, it's so messy. I, I, I like the messiness of this relationship. And it would have been like, I know our goal here is to create empathy for Abby, um, to show you the other side of this journey. And, and this, this definitely was a risk to say, okay, she's going <laughs> to have a sort of affair with this guy that got this other girl pregnant, her friend. But um, this primal thing that's going on between them just overpowers logic. It's a lead. And to me, that was more important to create empathy is to show how human they are than to just make them righteous or right the whole time. No, they're trying to, they're trying to define good in a gray world. What about now? And that means they have to make messes. This little pause, it's, it's, it's a nice bit of acting. Should be safe here. Okay, we'll talk in the morning when you're sober. Don't do that. Do what? Treat me like I'm fucking insane. You feel the same. He knows her more than she knows herself. If the fireflies are in Santa Barbara, I go the opposite fucking direction. And the resentment that she has for the fireflies, because in her mind, that's part of the reason her dad died, is... What? They failed her. Yeah. They, they failed in every way. Yeah. Sorry I grew up. You should try it. It's just uh, the insulting and just... Oh, yeah, how do I do that, Hesse? And this, 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 this notion okay. that's like your, your best friends can hurt you the most. Cut into them? Them until they're crying now. And the, the flash of violence here of anger is like Abby never talks about it, but clearly she is haunted by what she did to Joel. Yeah. And he's finally seeing that. Yeah. And then once they touch, it's over. I think they're both incredibly lonely characters. Yeah. Yeah, he's in this other relationship, but clearly he's lonely and he's been longing for her. And I know people ask this question, why why show this? Why You could end the scene right here. Um, I disagree, though. But I disagree as well, because I think it's important to show the, the, the vulnerability, how vulnerable these characters can be with each other. But mm. there's also, again, it's, it's messy and dirty and loving and a little violence at the same time. My philosophy on sex scenes is you should take them to the point where you've gotten all the information needed or the emotional evolutions needed. And in this case... I think you needed to see her conflicted and give in. Yeah, surrender to the moment. <sighs> this was a concept we came in quite late of showing a nightmare. It's showing that now that this nightmare that she's having about her dad is now switched. And uh, this like burn that Owen has on the, on his back, this was uh, another Ashley Swadowski idea that um, like we do environmental storytelling, we could do stuff on the body or through scars or disfiguration that tells you a story. I love that at her core, Abby is a protector. Mm -hmm. She's Joel. She's Joel. Yeah. Right, so now the dread, she's too late. Don't come any closer. It's me. I like the the change that Lev goes through here. It's like he's relieved to see her, and he's ashamed that he hasn't been able to protect his sister. I really like her trigger etiquette. She took her finger off that trigger as soon as she heard his voice. Classy. Good job, Laura. Good Thank job, you. Laura. 
There's this little bit of storytelling of the jacket on top of her that now she's feverish. <laughs> um, sometimes we get these uh, unintentional parallels. Like this, this one comes to mind of um, Ellie and Winter needing medicine for Joel. Mm-hmm. And now this becomes, this is about to become a, a goal for Abby and Lev. I think that one of the things about this game that I like is just keeps reminding you in how many ways we are fragile. Owen! This is one of the things I did for uh, Owen! training when I started working out for, for Abby. My husband, Travis, got me a 100-pound sandbag. I'm here. <laughs> to carry. And I had to carry it. Oh, damn. And then I got pregnant. Put the phone down. It's okay. This is a neat moment. Right? These dogs have been trained to like tear scars apart, and now they're here. Lev, lower the bow. It's okay. Abby, who are these kids? They saved my life. I mean, this is probably the first time they've ever come this close to seraphites without fighting them. I wonder if Owen right now is thinking, like, I mean, I said not kill them. We don't have to, like, I can go this far. It wasn't me. It wasn't me. And I was like, yeah, right. I don't know. It doesn't look that bad. <laughs> it's just a little pink. It's just it's a, a little smooshy. <laughs> Yara. No. I was going to clean it and try resetting. The bone's shattered. Well, like, uh, there's a moment here that I always find funny where, like, Owen tries to suggest, like, just cutting it and burning it. What does that mean? And I th- Laura, he's making him feel like an idiot. <laughs> She's a soldier. You, you can't take her arm. We leave it, it'll turn gangrene. What I love in this scene is even though Mel has very little dialogue outside of tending to... Yara, you can see in her performance, in Ashley Birch's wonderful performance, in her body language, that she is very much soured to Abby since last we saw her. And hopefully it's very subtly asking the question of how much does Mel know? She would die from infection. You fucking moron. Make me a list. I'll go to the hospital. (laughs) I don't mind. It's not about you, Abby. She doesn't have a couple of days. What if I can get you there in two hours? Abby is like such a singularly minded person. Like when she gets fixated on something, nothing will get in her way. I don't know anyone else like that. It's <laughs> how we get around the flooding and you people. Can't you handle two hours? Probably, yeah. This idea of the sky bridges and that um, uh, wolves never look up. It's actually show, it's an idea we got from our focus test is that um, we, we build these elaborate levels and then we find players look left and right and almost never turn the camera upwards. Um, so there's this idea that they're patrolling these streets and they never look up to see these secret paths that the seraphites are using. Abby. <laughs> like oh, yeah, you calling Abby right now? Look at the way Mel's looking at him. <laughs> Hey, there's also uh, um, there's, uh, again, it's kind of a messy theme, but the idea of that we've so, done certain things and it feels like we can never get past them. And for Owen, it's like, oh, I got this girl pregnant. Does that mean why are you doing this? This relationship is doomed, and it could never happen. That's the way Abby sees it. But for his mind, it's like nothing is ever final. There's always a chance for like a new beginning. Well, I do. Yeah, it's a nice, sweet little moment. And Lev's just like, I'm like, not oh, here. Well, I'm I am not know. here. <laughs> yeah, there's so much unsaid that, again, we, we have the privilege of Naughty Dog being able to capture the, the such small nuances of your performance that we don't have to rely on dialogue as much.
her worst <laughs> fear realized. <laughs> yeah. Can you imagine how bad that would oh. smell? I like that Abby is like, let me recover from near death. And Lev's like, I'm good, let's go. And he's just staring he just at bounced. her awkwardly. Yes. It was so great on the stage. <laughs> Looking up and just seeing him. Can I get a minute? Please. Okay, but I'm gonna keep staring at you awkwardly. <laughs> yeah, I'm not gonna. <laughs> just back up one step. The sequence between Abby and Lev used to be short, significantly shorter, and Lev used to be the one that died and Yara survived, and it's because we saw the dynamic between you two. Oh, that really? It, it caused us to have this ripple effect that changed the story and eventually led to us changing the ending and having Abby survive. What? Really? Yeah. Spores. Masks on. So this is my favorite level in the whole game. And narratively, this level had to do a lot of work, not just because, hey, now we're going to learn more about Seraphite culture and what this is and who Lev is, but this level has to earn, ultimately earn, Abby's um, willingness to walk away from the wolves. If you die, I'll be stuck here. Better start praying and make it. <laughs> she has to, like, she like has the, to build the, love. The, the banter that's forming between these two characters. As they get more comfortable with each other, they're okay insulting each other in this funny <laughs> way. <sighs> Got you a present. taking too long. Can't move any faster. I won't do your sister any good if we're both dead. There. We got this. has no idea what backgammon is. What's backgammon? It's it's an interesting dynamic because he's he's been so um, secluded from the world. He knows even less than Ellie did in the first game, which makes you think about like you know if we were to come back years later, people that would be born years and years later, like just the world we know seems more and more distant. Hey, meet a girl. Abby. No. Now from the other side. We got you out here too. Yeah. What a haul. I need some medical supplies. Can you put me where I'm supposed to Abby, just checked in with Isaac. He wants you back at the farm. Let me talk to Isaac. Talk to him in person. You're going back with the next shipment. You're fucked. Yeah. What are you doing? She's been AWOL. Trying to look confident, though, you guys. <laughs> Tell by my body posture. <laughs> Give me your hands. She's not yet willing to... Fight them. Mm -mm. She's surrendering to them. They're not her enemy yet. Just staring daggers into his face, though. Like, are you really going to do that? <laughs> hey! Hey! Let me the fuck out! <laughs> You're going to dislocate your shoulder. <sighs> Chelsea Tavares. Um, I never thought I'd see you on Isaac's bad side. Did a really fantastic job as Nora. It was important that all of you had really good chemistry. That's just, you have to sell years of friendship in very short scenes. I need some medical supplies. Why? What, what happened to him? And again, this just myopic focus. Compartment syndrome. Bashed forearm. You're not treating him, are you? Mel. But she's not, right? Interesting that even here, that th these people love each other, Jesus. that there's <laughs> tribes within a tribe within a tribe. She's, yeah, lying to Nora. We haven't cleared out the lower floors yet. Would they have what I need? The build up for the scariest fight. <laughs> We're about to get into our uh, 
Resident Evil homage. <laughs> I'll be fine. She's so cool. You get caught. Nora? Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, this one will bite you in the ass. All right, come on. But, all right. <laughs> I like that she's ready to pummel whoever it is that grabbed her. Uh, and this is something we'll see with uh, Yara later as well, which, like, these kids are told to stay put. And they're starting to care so much for Abby, they, they don't stay put. They're all looking for you. What did you do? Nothing. I told you to stay put. I couldn't. Your friends are all over the place. I really like this, the glue that happens between this scene and the next and showing this river rapids ride. And it has very much this apocalypse now feeling that you know you're you're cruising through a war torn area. <laughs> this was a uh, this this little sequence. I, I think this was suggested by um, Joe, our editor on this game. I love I love these murals. Yeah. Sometimes some of these like kind of connecting shots I find really beautiful. Just giving you a little bit of a gap in time. Now this shifted relationship with Lev and Alice. Hey. Oh yeah, and Lev's and just like, been taught to fear those dogs. Right. They just rip them apart. Okay. And another example of just the beauty of animals in this world and oh, how they represent innocence. Look at this baby. <laughs> I just I'm staring at the animation on the fingers and how well done it is. Yeah. Well done. You can go see her now if you want. Is she gonna be okay? Yeah, actually. All this time after what they did to Joel, after all the Sarah fights they've killed, finally meeting these two kids. Just kids. Just starts to put it all in perspective for Abby. I know. Her body figures it out before her head does. What happened to us? What happened to us, right? That's the most she's gonna talk about all these things that she's done. Maybe we stop looking for the light. Maybe. The idea that, you know, even when we fail, we still have to push forward for something better. That's what Owen represents. I'm gonna go check on the girl. so beautiful and sad here when we reveal the missing arm and this exchange of a smile between these two characters. Another time I'm going to sound like a broken record, but it's just, I, I love showing off your performances with no dialogue. It just makes our job easier as writers. <laughs> just leave out the writing. That's the secret to good writing. Leave out the writing. And finally she has... One good night of sleep. Yeah, but consciousness is about to slap her in the face. that Mel doesn't even, you're not even worth my time to talk about it. Changing your advantages. But 
Then she snaps. She's so powerless in this situation. What are they fighting about? Fuck you, Yara. I wish we knew behind. Oh, and this was a fun B because he did just learn how to say fuck you. <laughs> Owen invited them to come to Santa Barbara. That is very Owen. She's trying to be jokey and connect with Mel. Talked him out of going by now. Hoping that she doesn't know. Right. Actually, I'm going with them. But not if you come. Oof. What? He may fall for your little act with these kids, but I don't. There's nothing to fall for. Isaac's top scar killer suddenly had a change of heart. It's such an insult, right? But it's like, um, she probably deserves it. But the idea that she's only being nice to these kids to earn favor with Owen. You're yeah. a piece of shit, Abby. You won't it's so sad that she doesn't fight back because she probably agrees with her. Oh, fully. Fully. Well, I think Mel is also calling into question, like, can, can characters change? Can people change? We see it with Joel, but it happens so rarely, right? And so many of our characters are myopically focused and can't change no matter what. So I understand why she feels like this must be bullshit. Fuck. No, but she finally feels like, oh, God, I'm, I'm doing the right thing. I'm finally doing the right thing. Maybe I can be better. And then, like, this right. instant back to reality. I like that... Um... Showing emotion in this world is somehow a weakness. Nice shirt. <laughs> we had to read a lot on what was on that shirt. We had, yes. I just, I just I remember just we had all, the these, all these different designs that were okay. just too distracting, and finally we ended up with something pretty subtle. How's your arm? Because she'd need an aquarium shirt. Why does that otter look so sad? <laughs> the otter lost its arm, too. <laughs> Love coming around? He will. Uh, I remember a conversation I had with Victoria here about Do you mind helping me look uh, Yara's motivation, how she's um, she feels like she needs to repay Abby in some way, and she's complimenting her, and she's pulling her in to, like, find Lev. He ran off this way. But more for Abby's sake than for actually finding Lev. <sighs> oh, this was, uh, this was a tough one to write. Oh, yeah. How was he doing this? Hey, do you think maybe he could convince your mom? If she saw him like this, she'd strangle him with her bare hands. The conflict between Which love and do? duty of, like, the love a mom should have for her kids and the duty she has for her religion. I heard some of your people calling him Lily. I like here that Yara is the practical one. She sees the world as it is, and she sees the consequences as they are. And in some way, in another universe, she and Abby would be wonderful enemies <laughs> because they are both strong, myopic soldiers, right? But for Yara, the risk to Lev's life is worth giving everything up. I told him he had to keep it to himself. And the guilt, right? This guilt here. I was hoping he'd snap. Well, it's that, that it's also Yara has Why? greater love for Lev than their mom had for Lev. That this moment that she's describing here is what made her lose faith. One of them that it was suicide. And we don't talk about it, but I, I think the difference that I see between Yara and Lev is that Yara has lost her faith. And Lev has just refocused it, um, went back to the origins, the writings, and sees how it was um, corrupted. It was so stupid. Uh, this is another one of those scenes. I, I thought um, Victoria here just knocked it out of the park. Yeah. Yeah. Let me find something to cheer him up. I, li I like these uh, in these action games. Sometimes having a goal of like, oh, let's find a toy to cheer up a kid. <laughs> And that becomes your gameplay objective. What about this? It's perfect. 
Mouse Another wrong. brilliant thing Ashley Swadowski sort of conceived of is you watch the kids visually change and, and move away from scars over the course of this game. So here we see Yara is now dressed like uh, a civilian, but she still wears the braids. I'm sorry, I didn't realize you owned everything in the aquarium. And she's not fully yeah, well, letting go. My aquarium, my stuff. I was kidding. Take whatever you want. You can't. Have you seen Lev? Uh, yeah. He was down uh, yeah, we're about to get into this conversation of, um, I mean, they're talking about their relationship, but uh, uh, thematically there's greater stuff here, which is, when are things too late? When have you gone so far that there's no coming back from it? She didn't tell I was joking. They are very literal. <laughs> <laughs> they are literal people. I suck with kids. <laughs> yeah. It's funny he says he yeah, sucks I with kids, but I think Owen would be a great dad. Oh, I think he'd be an incredible dad. Another world. Coming to Santa Barbara, right? I can't. Why? You know why. such an optimist, right? He's about to talk about that. We'll figure it out. I don't know how, but we'll no, figure it out. Really. I know. I know it's a fucking mess. I know. But we can choose to be happy. Happy. Again, going back to All something right. you said earlier, Neil, but it's like this idea that suffering is the way that we honor the dead. I don't think Abby has fully admitted, like, no, I, I don't have a right to be happy. There's no... <laughs> yeah. Lev! Get back here! Lev! What's he doing? He's going after her. After who? His mom. She's gonna kill him, Abby. Is the boat ready? Not yet. How much time do you need? Uh, a few hours. Fuck. This is, uh... This is their last conversation together. She just had surgery. I'm fine. How else am I gonna find him? I'll go with you. Owen! They're heading to the fucking island. Exactly. I'm not gonna let her go by herself. I think there's a part of Abby that knows she's about to head into a suicide mission. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And this is her forcing Owen to stay here. She's really trying. She's trying. The irony mm. is in staying here. She dooms what, them. She abandons them, yeah. dooms him. I don't know when it is in gameplay that you realize, like, oh, God, I, I killed them all as Ellie. <laughs> you know what I mean? What did I do? Is that a sniper rifle? Uh-oh. It's down the dock. I'll go get a boat and pick you up here. No, I can help. Not with this. <laughs> Girl, you have one arm. She is so tough. She's badass. But, uh, yeah, Abby doesn't want any more blood on her hands. So just like with Owen, she's, she wants Yara to stay behind. Get down! <laughs> Abby, what the fuck? Manny? You by yourself? Yeah. I like the dynamic between Abby and Manny. Just a couple of bros. What are you doing out here? A couple of bros. We were supposed to get the island tonight. Then this pendejo showed up. <laughs> Tommy's so cool. I sent the guy to call for help. It's Back so interesting how right. very few players uh, guessed that this was Tommy right oh, here. Oh, really? Yeah. I need one of those boats now. Just because it's Why? been so long and you, you, forget you forget about yeah. there's a whole other cast of characters that are on this island, and now um, these two stories are starting to merge. Right, at first it feels coincidental, like, oh, she just happens on Manny. It's like, no, Manny was targeted. <laughs> the revelation, it's Tommy. What? No oh wonder he was so good. I'm like, oh, right, this whole other game that's happening finally collides. <laughs> if you don't see a character die on screen, you should always question their death. That music is so ominous. Yeah. I like how she's just burying the death of her friend. Yeah. Just stay, fo again, she has this very narrow, focused mind. And the realization that it's all going to come crashing down. And the guilt, I would imagine, right? Like, the thing I would be burying in that moment is, oh, that's that guy? 
oh, I'm complicit in the death of my friend. There's another one of those that's, if you were to see the making of it, it'd be so funny, because they're like, <laughs> okay, and wave. And, <laughs> and wave. wave. And you'll have to <laughs> act the physics of the boat. <laughs> and then later, the animators, like, touch it up. In the earlier days of this game, there were five days that the girls were sort of doing their thing in Seattle. And now we're on their territory. There was a whole day where Ellie would go to Scar Island to give you this, this opportunity to see them in the same nurturing way that we would see the stadium, where you get to see them take care of their children and their seniors, and you get to see them farming, and you get to see them be human people. But we cut it because ultimately it didn't shift Ellie's journey. Um, oh, this scene. This, this is a heavy scene. Mm. Unlike the rest of the game, which is just... A comedy. <laughs> shift right there for Yara is really nice of going from grieving to protecting. Concerned. Consoling, yeah, that's right. Those cuts. She knew it was going to happen. She knew that's what the outcome was going to be. She started chasing me. Lev's an optimist. Jerry picked her stuff. It's just pushing her off of me. She hit the table. <laughs> With everything that baby Lev has been through in this past week, this is truly the death of his innocence. Mm -hmm. Now these three have become the us, and the WLF is about to become the them. There's this, um, this little connective tissue right here of, um, or this moment of connection between Abby and Lev that I love, that she hands him the bow. There's just the exchange, again, this, this exchange between them. My baby, baby. <laughs> oh, sweet baby. All she can do is arm him. This way. Got one! <laughs> oh, this is, uh... This is the... Yep. So right originally you would come into to this island and this is where we would have killed Lev and... Yeah. And we had these these concepts of um, stone mound graves and that you would find Lev being buried in one. But instead, we flippity flopped it. It's funny, it's like Abby stopping Lev from doing the things she couldn't even do, is grief for yeah. the person she loves. And there's our second Isaac scene. Well, not a good this, look. This was really fun watching you guys play. Yeah. And this back and forth. It's like every other time you've been able to reason with Isaac, but he's at the end of his rope. He's not one of them, please. Abby, move. God damn it, he's just a kid. Isaac doesn't see a kid, you know? You have three seconds to get away from that scar. One. You're really gonna shoot me? I'm not fucking moving. That, that facial expression was great. No! What the fuck? And uh, Jeffy Wright gave us a lot of deaths, a lot of falling in all these different ways. I remember that. Uh, this was another one of those where we wanted to make the volume feel bigger and run with the characters. And then we had a hard time, I don't know how much you remember, Laura, of like getting what this beat to land right here, this exchange between the two characters until we Come on. somehow, I don't remember the exact order of events, but we came up with this this line right here. You're my people. Yeah, we were on the stage and it just wasn't quite working. And you came to me and you said, let's come up with some, let's brainstorm some other lines. And I said, you're my people. And you're like, okay, that's it. And you just walk back on set. And it really, it, it, it's become, it's become my favorite line in the game because it is, to me, it is the unifying idea. This uh, one here is actually one of my favorite scenes in this game. I agree, this one's really great. It's just the visuals, the, the, the exchange, how far we've come. 
Um, just the idea that he's cold. The weather. Um, she's again, so uh, dull here. She's just such a dad here. This is, again, yeah. this is one of those things that's very easy to write on the page. She takes her jacket off. She wraps it around Lev. Very hard to execute and oh, make gosh. it look good. Look how she's looking at him. Well, it's like now she's looking at a small version of herself, right? Yeah. She knows what it is to see your parent dead, to see your world burn, and now she's just got to helplessly watch another person do it. This is, again, where the... the two stories are barreling into, <laughs> into each other. Um, and we have a series of losses. I mean, there's a, this nice dramatic irony. The player already knows what's waiting for Abby inside, and they're like, oh my God, oh my God, yeah. oh my God. And they're waiting to see how this If they remember, out. a lot of people forget. No, really? But as, as soon as they see Alice. Oh yeah, Alice is the, Alice that, is that's the trigger. That's the giveaway. What can you say to someone that just had, just lost his mom and his sister at the same moment? Alice is the only dog that actually has to die in the game, which was a fun thing during um, press when people would be like, why do you want us to kill dogs? And it's like, you don't actually have to in any of the setups, they're all voluntary kills, but Alice is the only requisite one. I'm pretty sure we're always careful to say you don't have to kill dogs, but we didn't say you don't have to kill a dog. dog. The cutest dog that you play fetch with. This is, um, Laura, you make this look very easy, but this is a very hard scene, I, I think, watching from the outside to, to act, which is you have to go from grief to pure rage. Uh, I think I have... Hallie, this was your throwing up that you wrote into this scene? Yes, yeah. probably. It's such a great visual of how much grief somebody can take before your body just rebels against yeah. you. Yeah. <laughs> I like this, this little, the way he says Abby here. Abby. Almost afraid to show her this might lead to the people that did this. And of course, this was Ellie's mistake of dropping the map here in her panic attack. And, uh, <laughs> and the music is doing a good job of just taking you internally into Abby's head. Now she's regressing. Back to the vengeful spirit she was before. Our main characters collide, or about to collide. I think one of the things that makes Laura's performance here so special is that this character is so hard and so terrifying, but in every scene where Laura is, is scary, there's also this patina of vulnerability, of fragility, that's coming through where you can feel that she's quaking with rage, but, so but there is, there's so much complex stuff happening okay. underneath that rage. It's really great. You're, you're, you're not bad. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny because in the same way I feel about Ashley's performance. <laughs> so there's always this. Just that rage feels so real. She's so good too, like fucking one shot. And from her perspective, it's Jesse's an NPC. Yeah. yeah. He means nothing to her. Get out of here. Stand up now. Don't you fucking dare. Shut the fuck up. All right. Stop. Stop. What is so beautiful here and or tragic is that Ellie doesn't get it. Right. What Ellie's about to say here is like. I know why you killed Joel. He did what he did to well, he did it to save me. Um, there's, there's no, no cure, cure because of me. And Abby's like, what? Not it's about not about that. <laughs> I don't know how much Abby cares about it. It's about her yeah. dad. You 
killed my friends. Like I showed you mercy. And you wasted it! Get off of her! Clara's were so uncomfortable here. Like, I have to go up against Ellie now. And this is very much by design. Who is scary? She's wily, but you're beefy. <laughs> Stay here. Watch the exits. Don't let her leave. <laughs> If I remember correctly, Ashley, we had you like have water in your mouth when you delivered some of those the lines here. It's, your mouth is meant to be filled with blood. Yes. Wow. Okay, because I remember I was as my my usual. I was like, why am I just laying here? I would try everything I could to try to get up and go save her. So I think the water and having that and having sort of showing or, or being able to hear how, how messed up Ellie is in that moment. This is the other scene that lives in my head. The knife to a pregnant girl's throat. It's so terrible, but in her mind, like, Ellie just intentionally killed her pregnant friend, and Mel is so visibly pregnant. And the fact that Abby does not kill them shows that she's kind of in a little bit uh, of a better mental place, I think, than Ellie is. Yeah, she's, well, she's grown also a little got bit. her moral compass, like, yes. right in front of her. Yeah. Well, there's, like, yeah. two versions of love right in front of her. One yeah. is a destructive one of, like, wanting to do justice by the people that I've lost, and the other one is wanting to do right by this kid that I've come to be their protector. Hmm. And she who's chooses. already seen too much violence, who's already experienced too much wrath, right? It's like, he needs peace. That poor baby. Ellie. That poor baby. Okay, yeah. We, we had a lot of conversations here about um, Ellie's thought process. I, the things she's not expressing, but she put the baby's life at risk right now, right? It's like, mm -hmm. who knows what, and when she's in this fog of PTSD, what she could have done. This is the moment for Ellie where she's... It's never going to get better. It's not going to get better, and she's put her family in danger. So mm -hmm. it's probably better to just go. Well, Dina is also trying to sweep it under the rug. And this is what's going to happen in the next scene. Like, let's just, let's just go back to bed. Everything's fine. If I could buy another week, maybe she'll get a little bit better. Or even just the distance to speak. It's just like when somebody's really in the thick of, like, the oh, panic and the fog of grief like that, it's like you do kind of need time yeah. in order for them to kind of continue to progress through the stages but it's like ellie is refusing to move yeah. through these stages and so like i feel like when we were doing this like the patience that i have with it was that it's like maybe she'll move to the next stage soon maybe we're getting there maybe that's what we're getting to i don't know if we ever talked about this but we had a whole different version of um this part of the game where it was maria that showed up yeah, but we felt it would be more intimate if it were seeing seeing how broken Tommy was. Well, it should be like feel more the guilt of like seeing the damage on Tommy and having Tommy been changed over this year since he got back to Jackson of like the guy that wanted to protect Ellie and not go on this quest for revenge is now guilting her into it. I like that you're coming in late and you're seeing that this man has been very broken and we're, we're getting a sliver of how the abuse he experienced and the things that he did in Seattle have irreparably damaged him. And he's standing right in front of Ellie and Ellie is looking at how irreparably damaged this man is. And she's like, yep, let's do that to me too. I'm willing to see the ghost of my future. That's the fate I deserve. Mm. Sorry. No. Nah. We talked about it a lot, and, uh, yeah, that's what we both want, so. <clears throat> well, the other thing okay. we were talking about is um, the other big uh, Ellie Tommy scene is so after show. Joel's death and how they can't look at each other. And then this happens again here. Once he asks her to go, she can't look at him. I think it's a confrontation thing, or when, I, when I'm feeling anger, but I get uncomfortable, like I don't want somebody to see it. It's also the shame, right, of the shame of... Yeah. I'm, I'm letting you down. I'm letting Joel down. I'm letting myself down. Yeah. Described her as built like an ox. Traveling with a kid with scars across his face. He said they're living... I also think that there's something important in the scene for Dina, right? Because Dina has been such an amenable partner through so much of this 
game and their journey. And even when Ellie's off the deep end, Dina is a nurturing force. And here she's finally drawing the line. We're done with that. So. She's finally like, we're done with that. I'm speaking for Ellie now. There's a line here and you're, you've, you've crossed it. And like mm-hmm. the rage I felt too when he keeps going, I was like, it's insidious. It. You know, it's like he came and brought the virus back into the house and now she's sick again. Think of all the guilt he's carrying. He failed to save Joel. He failed to save Jesse. He failed to get Abby. He f- he's fucked up. His marriage has fallen apart. All he has left now is this revenge. That's it. Well, it also, yeah. it, it, it goes back again to that ego thing where it's like, you asked me to do this and I did it. Right. I went to Seattle. Now I'm coming back for you to pay up and you're going to be a little bitch about it. Well, yeah. it's, uh, and, and again, he doesn't... He's too blind to see the suffering that she's going yeah. through. All he could see is like how damage, how much, how damaged he is. But what he's say like, oh, you live out here and like, and you got your family and everything's cushy and everything's fine, and I'm the one suffering. But he doesn't see that she's, he's not the only one suffering. Yeah. What a joke. And I love, I love that Jeffrey, when Dina walks over and Ellie's sitting there at the table, and Jeffrey is not. Even acknowledging Dina. In a way, Tommy might feel like, I'm more family to you than Dina yeah, is. Yeah, I've yeah, known yeah. you longer. Like, That's exactly what Think of what everything felt, yeah. we've been through. And it's the only time there's really personal conflict between Ellie and Tommy. I don't fucking care. That's one of my favorite Dina moments. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> because it just, it felt so real. I was so mad. Yeah. <laughs> just like <laughs> flying out the screen door and being like, listen, motherfucker, get off of our property. I love it. So this was one of the first things we shot for this game. Yep. There's so many characters here. We had to shoot this in multiple batches and then stitch it all together. I did several days just dancing. Yes! Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah remember we, we brought a dance choreographer that spent some time with you, Shannon. Yeah. demo and so we had to this was tricky because we're introducing to the world a lot of new characters with a lot of interesting dynamics and trying to do that through exposition but as thin an exposition as possible because dear god nobody likes exposition it was hard what happened this scene has jumped around all over the as we're playing with the structure. It used to be in the very beginning, and then we felt we just had too many cutscenes in the beginning. And we need to get to the action a little bit faster, and then we moved it to the end. We changed the writing for the beginning. She's uh, it's putting on quite the show. Um, but there's something kind of nice, and I guess there's there's a, a, a tragedy to it of um, coming here at the end as a, as a memory. Of just seeing just Jesse's alive and Ellie and Dina are okay and no one's and there's Joel. Hey, what took you so long? Oh, yeah, right? <laughs> and this like really innocent first kiss. Hey, don't forget we're heading out early, so get some rest. Yes, sir. You're such a dick. Come on. I'm this was the first thing. scene we shot. This was the first scene we shot after. You hired me. Yeah. How bad do I smell? I I look at this and I'm just overwhelmed with all the details of the shirt, of sweat stains, of little hairs on the neck, um, little dimples on the smile. And just, Mm -hmm. this is hundreds of people of work for months Mm. to get this little moment. Um, Sweat uh, and, and trying to capture it. The hair that I put behind her ear is crazy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that has to switch from being physics hair to being hand animated hair it's as crazy. soon as you make contact with it. Whoa. Not. And even just the kissing, like, I mean, it's just, it, it looks so realistic. Yeah, it's, and, and it it's actually a combination of several performances all stitched together right here. Mm-hmm. And, and then the lighting has to change from shot to shot. It's interesting highlighting the bracelet that's back on Dina's hand. It's a nice, it's a nice, yeah, it's a, it's a nice reflective it. moment of like how innocent things were for all these characters. Yeah. I love just the little surprise on Ellie's face, the little like moment of shock. 
before melting into it. <laughs> and then we're about to get into Seth. And I get <laughs> Shannon, the, the, your rage is so real here. <laughs> hey, it's a family event. What the fuck are you looking at? This whole interaction was based on one time I was at, at Blockbuster and I'm standing, I'm just talking to my friend, I'm, I'm throwing curse words around and the dad in front of me had his two kids and he's like, do you mind there's little kids around? And that always stuck with me. I felt such shame having like used curse words in front of these kids. What the fuck did you just say? Ellie, Ellie, don't. Get the hell out of here. Get your hands off me. Hey, enough. Come on, you. let's go for a walk. What about them? You worry about yourself. I feel so bad for Joel here. Ugh, me too. What is wrong with you? She doesn't want to be under his shadow anymore. No. And, but he can't help himself. He's just trying to. He's so, trying someone to. Is, dad. Someone is hurting her, and he's going to stand up for her. Oh, Papa Bear. Yeah, you know you were an asshole. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Saddest scene. Yeah, with the first game, right, we're, we're talking about how um, how do you take this obsession of love, of a parent's love for a child, to the end of the line? And then this has the reverse of it, of like, how do you take hate to the end of the line? Which is also like another um, expression of love. And the engineering of it was that here she has this family that loves her, and it's not good enough because she's letting down Joel in her mind. I love the different um, energies that you both bring to this scene where Dina is giving it her everything in this fight <laughs> and Ellie just has to shut down. This scene, my God. I, I, finish it. I it was so hard to leave you because you were so upset and so broken and so sad. And I was like, I, 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 I should my, my mistake. I'm sorry. I would argue this is maybe Ellie's darkest moment, even though I know where we're going, because this is the... This is the choice where she forsakes. Yeah, this, is, this is where she makes the choice. Yeah. And I think she knows there's a very good chance she's going to die on this journey. I guess the thing that we don't talk about is, like, I think she's suicidal. Yeah, I, I think I there's, right, there's the guilt of what the should have happened at loud. the hospital. That's why she yeah. leaves with, yeah. in the middle of the night. She's not saying goodbye because it's clearly suicide. Yeah. When the pain gets too loud, she's not there anymore. She's incredibly vulnerable, but she's completely disassociated, and there is this absolute rejection of everything that is right I'm just supposed to, to sit here and wait for at you. that point like God, you know you're so not talking to the person daddy. that you're in the relationship with yeah, you're talking to just... the you're talking to the grief and so mm. it's like the convincing comes into like are you even in there anymore mm -hmm. like can you can i just find you for one second and she's just fully gone both characters have very clear goals and then there's an obstacle and then they keep ratcheting out like dina just ups the ante over and over and over until, right, the last bit is ultimatum. Even the grabbing of the face. And then like she pulls it's... her hands down. Ugh. And that's it, she knows. Um, philosophically with this game, what we wanted to do was allow our characters to make immoral choices that the audience would not be on board with. Up until now, like, we shed some of the audience of, like, you know, the Nora torture. Some people have issues with that or certain other kind of violent moments. But here we lose almost everybody. And it's, it is by design in that way of, like, you're now, like, playing this thing that you are not on board with at all. You have to keep going. And in a way, that does align you with Ellie. These shots are so gorgeous. Um, there's a nice misdirect coming up here. We, we, we purposely gave uh, Lev Chucks. So you're thinking for a, a second that, oh, okay, this is where I pick up Ellie's journey. And again, now you've been a while away from Abby and Lev. And now Lev has fully shed his seraphite exterior. Has hair. I love to see their growth, their relationship in this moment. Okay, Constance. In letting go of hate, Abby has taken on the Owen's optimism, she Owen's hope. Um, this thing that was just this flame that was almost completely extinguished within her. Somehow in all that tragedy and all that horror, she was able to find it again. Her face seems brighter, it seems lighter than it has been the entire game. Even in the flashbacks. Is this frequency currently in use? 
This is. This is so small, but I love. The hope again. It's just like she has a bit of hope here, and then it, it's turned. It's cranked up to ten when she hears the fireflies on the other side of this radio. Can anyone hear me? And isn't the firefly on the other side of this radio another vox machina hero? Is it really? Yeah. Who is it? Liam O'Brien. Is it? Yeah. He was in. He was my fellow nurse, wasn't he? In the. In he the was. Yeah, we were fellow with the two nurses nurse in uh, Last of Us One. Is this frequency currently in use? This is Abby from Santa Barbara. Is anyone out there? There's a nice reaction here that Lev has to Abby's again, singular obsession of now finding the fireflies, and he's ready to give up. Can anyone hear me? Hello? Uh, and she keeps going in desperation. I love artistically how um, the character models for Lev and Yara were kind of a blend of both of the actors' faces because Hello. now I'm like looking at baby Lev, but I feel like you can see some spirit of mm. of Yara still. Is this frequency currently in use? Hello, this is Abby from Santa Barbara. Can anyone hear me? If anyone can hear me, please reply. Please answer. Don't give up. Like that, you know, this was perfectly shot, like we're pulling away from her, that this yeah. is how the scene's gonna end. Um. Um, 24, 25 constants. Uh, we got a tip about I know, a base, I get, no I get weirdly emotional in this scene. I'm a, I'm a firefly. Maybe just seeing how happy she is. Where were you stationed? I was part of the Salt Lake outpost. Like that little head shake. I'm <laughs> okay, I'm kind of so awkward. <laughs> I mean, I guess I'm a firefly. I kind of disavowed them, but Dr. Jerry that is who I truly am. He was my dad. Well, how about that? We pulled everyone back like to the station. Like Liam's acting right here, like in the reply. How about how that? Like, holy shit. 200 strong now, with a few more every month. Oh, no, right. You're about to get two more. How do we find you? It's, oh, uh, oh, God, yeah, that's there. There it is. <laughs> the large domed building in Avalon. We'll find you. Okay. Look at okay. Like, the way Lev see, looks see. at her. He's happy for her. Looking forward to it. Good luck, Abby from Santa Barbara. What's well, also like... Over and out. There's a possibility of community here again. Yeah. Well, I'm sure everything's going to turn out fine for these two. <laughs> but it needs to, Neil. <laughs> Here they get ambushed by a new group, the Rattlers. The Rattlers are the worst people we've encountered in the game for um, both practical reasons, uh, which were we want you to get to see Ellie at her most vicious, most violent. We want her kills to feel brutal and justified. And we want to feel like Abby and Lev, were they not saved, would have died. There's also, um, with this group, wanting to make them really awful, uh, to play a little bit with tropes and structure and misdirect the player, that in a lot of these stories, um, you have these two characters that you're rooting for against each other, and then there's a, a really evil force, and you see them you team up, and they're going to work together to defeat the bad guys. And that's not how, how this plays out at all. That always felt a little too cliche, and I don't know if it really spoke to the themes of what we're trying to say here. But we wanted the player to think that's what's going to happen. It's a nice economy here of storytelling. Like, you know, we don't show Abby arriving at Santa Barbara with this boat that has become a character of its own in the story. And we're just here with Ellie picking up the tail end of their journey. Um, there's also like a really interesting note here from um, Abby. And it's also the first time we're seeing just how emaciated Ellie has become. And she's sunburned and um, clearly not taking care of herself 
in the pursuit of Abby. I mean, it, it mirrors the, it can't all be for nothing because she's killed so many people at this point. If she stops, that all is just for nothing. I, re I really like that, the parallel of the first game of like, yeah, her wanting to see things all the way through with her stubbornness, even though there's a part of her that says, this is not the right thing to do. Yes. Uh, nice mirror here of the injury that Joel had mm -hmm. in the hospital in the first game. Uh, yeah, we're, we're constructing this. Uh, we wanted to s injure Ellie badly. So again, she's choosing the pursuit of this thing over her own health that she will likely die um, if she sees this all the way through. I would argue she is dead already. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Doing this upside down hair was such a pain. Because um, essentially you, you can't just move the hair upside down. You have to remodel the whole thing. And we wanted her to have lost so much blood. It's again, the whole thing is starting to feel like a fever dream. And it's, it's she thinks she's seeing like Abby and Lev and then realizes, oh no, it's we got a live one. very different people. Travis and Logic. <laughs> <laughs> this was um, another moment to show how far Ellie has come and how, much, how easier it is for her to kill someone in cold blood now versus the earlier parts of the story. And one more instance where she could use her superpower of being immune to get herself out of these jams. And what, actually what she's employing here is very similar to what Nora did to her, which is like try to insult them so they could get reckless. And in that recklessness, she'll find the opening. Something funny? Looks like you show your pants. It's a good trip. I remember in this scene when I take the gun off of Bobby, the strap, um, and one of the takes went across his neck and I gave him a really bad rope burn. Oh no. Because I just like yanked it really quickly and he had that for about a week. Oh no. It looked really, I was like, oh no. It looked like he was strangled or something. But he looked badass. Uh, he was yeah. so excited. It was like, it was like, oh my God, Ellie killed me. <laughs> he was yeah. such a fan oh, yeah, of the game. Right. He was excited. Um, I, I love how efficient that action is right there. I'm just grabbing the gun, spraying across his legs. And watch this little smirk that you give when he points out your bite. Because he doesn't know you're immune. No one's immune. She had a brawny kid with cuts by his mouth. Travis Willingham. Look at the, your face there. It's like, the, it's like she's getting another hit of her drug. Of like... I'm actually back on the trail. She's so close, you can feel it. Watch this smile. Looks at the bite. Right. Talk. There. She's in a holding cell at our camp. Where is that? And that way till you hit the railroad track. That'll lead you to a resort. It's like had this exchange happened earlier, if she killed someone in cold blood earlier, there'd be a very different reaction. It's like she's becoming more and more like Joel at this point, more and more capable and more and more cold about the violence where she could just execute it and move on and not think twice about it. I think at this point she's completely disassociated from the Ellie like we've ever known. She's staring him in the eye as he's dying. And just a hint that the injury is getting worse and worse. But again, she's not going to stop. She can't. Not yet. Tracks to resort. Tall round building. Tracks to resort. Tall round building. Damn it. Shit. Uh, 
I remember this. Yeah, so the idea, right? She gets hit right at her injury. I like how badass this scene is. The desperation. Ugh. Remember the thumb to the eye. Yeah, this is Matthew Mercer. Yeah. Oh, yeah. What I like about this sequence, too, is, like, you can look at everything that Ellie does as so, so ugly and so, so brutal and so, so unnecessary, but had she not come after Abby, who knows if these people would have ever been free, who knows if this uprising would have ever happened, right? So, again, there's this these butterfly wings happening because of all of the choices she's made, that none of them are just black and white. You've got this constant gray you have to reconcile with. Oh, they're staring at her like she's some kind of wild animal. Again, like there's this whole crazy thing going on here of like slaves and slavers and Ellie it cares of none of that. It's just, she's so single-minded about Abby and pretty soon she, like in gameplay, she's gonna just start repeating Abby, Abby. I wonder how much, how much of Ellie is hoping to die in that fight. It's you. how surprising the speed is right it's like you keep moving towards this idea of this fight and the whole way you're like ellie you're too fucked up don't do this don't face abby we know what she's like and now you come to this absolutely wrecked frail i i also love um it's pretty much wordless and you could tell so much with the performance what's going on in their heads and you could see Ellie's confusion and anger and sadness for what she's witnessing. Yeah, it's hard. It's like finally the prize is right there and now it just doesn't feel as satisfying. I always read that like there are boats to sway moment is like if I'm nice to her, if I'm just like treat her like not my enemy, then maybe like this will all go by quietly. To me, this is a really nice mirror beat of, of Joel with Ellie, Joel carrying mm -hmm. Ellie, right? And so you mm -hmm. have that invocation and Ellie just has to watch it, has to watch this embodiment of somebody who represents every good part of Joel. Mm. Ugh, it's, it makes me so sad. This all just, I, the scene, it's just because Ellie doesn't know what to do with all of that anger and that hurt from losing Joel. And now this is the moment. Yeah, because at this point, that's all Ellie has left. It's just this fucked up quest. Imagine having that image stuck in your head and not knowing how to get rid of it. Yeah. And killing somebody else is not going to do it, but I, 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 you have to get to that point. You have to realize it yourself. Mm -hmm. yeah. This was a hard, this was, this was, we actually had a really fun day. Yeah. As hard as this scene was, and it's so funny doing this with one of your best friends, <laughs> of just like fighting each other, pulling her hair, be like, get you out of here, let's fight. <laughs> Kick me. <laughs> no. Just... I'm not going to fight you. I think that threat is fake, right? It's, uh, I don't think. Yes. I don't think. She's bluffing. I, I absolutely think she's bluffing. Really? Yeah. <laughs> yes, but I agree, but what would have happened if Abby was like... No. No. Like, I feel like she still would have pushed that... I think she would have pushed that knife in. I, well, that's, I, I mean, this that's is a, great that there's all these different interpretations. That's so I, cool. I don't. I don't think she would. <laughs> there were all these other versions of how Ellie lost her fingers. Remember, Hallie, of, like, there used to be... 
when someone was waiting for her at the farm and then tortured her in retribution for what happened oh, in Seattle. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. So, yeah, so, it was like the it was like the parent or somebody yeah. of of somebody who died of like an NPC essentially who came and so you're seeing that cyclical nature of violence of like you killed my person, you killed my person, you killed my person. So somebody you didn't even realize you'd really killed tracks Ellie down. Wow. I love how you pin her with your knee. Yeah. So originally the conception was that Abby dies here. And it would have been such a different game, I think, if yeah. Yeah. if right now there was just a body underwater and Ellie was having this moment. Yeah, you didn't know that? I did not know Abby died here originally. Well, well yeah, originally, like, I think both Yara and Lev died. And this was just Abby by herself when you meet up with her. <sighs> and then Ellie kills Abby. Prof. Yeah. I think leaving Ellie with 3% of the humanity that she got from who she was, that good kid, that scrappy kid that Joel helped shape. I think if she killed Abby, you'd never see that kid again. And this gives a hope that she's still in there a little bit and could be maybe revived in the same way that Abby was revived in the right circumstance. Mm, I agree. Seeing the reactions, there's people that wanting to know, what was it exactly that made Ellie stop? Is it Lev? Is it this memory of Joel? Is it everything she's experienced? Is it just like Abby's state that it's not this person that defeated her in the theater? To me, it's all those things. The way our brains work is so messy. And that's the, the story is was always meant to be very messy in that way, that there aren't these clear-cut answers. To me, that, that moment is, two more seconds, this girl is dead. So I already know what this feels like. I can see what I'm going to feel like five seconds from now. Yes. And it's no different. Yes. So why? Originally, the house was fully empty. And there was a concern, I think, that we had that it's going to feel like something bad happened mm. to Dina, and we don't want to make it feel like it's... Right. That's the, th- the thought in her head. It's more Dina has made the choice to move back. She had to move back, too. She couldn't stay there alone with a baby. It was too dangerous. But I do think there's something poetic in, like, she didn't take Ellie's things with her. She, yeah. There wasn't a, I'm waiting for I'm you, I'm going to build behind. her home. It's, it's I'm letting this, Let I'm letting go. this die, yeah, here and I'm going to let everything rot for you. Well, that's really bleak. Yeah, we wanted to create a metaphor for the unintended consequences of pursuing justice at any cost. And um, here we get to feel it of the song that means so much to Ellie, she just can't play it anymore. Also interesting thinking about Joel's headspace right now, like just been humiliated by Ellie in front of everyone. Mm. Who knows what's going through his head, but for me, sometimes when I get just filled with anxiety, it's it's guitar. It's just sitting down and just jamming and just... Yeah, not even playing a song, just playing through something. Uh, and we've had this scene at different spots of the game until until we finally landed. It's, it's this final moment. Yeah, I think originally we were going to put it before the midpoint showdown of the game. Right. Oh, it plays so much better at the end. Yeah, no, it does. now you can't imagine it anywhere else once, yeah. it's, once it's here. What are you drinking? Traded his soul for coffee. Hmm. Where'd you get that? Uh, those people that came through last week. Oh. I would do the same. This is um, the most Ashley has ever pushed back on a scene. <laughs> Wait, uh, really? Which, this was because um, originally it was written that they hug at the end of the scene. And you're like, I don't know if they would. Hmm. I'm not sure like they, we could that. get all the way there. You were sport about it, and we did uh, two versions, one with a hug, one without a hug. And they were both very, very good. But ultimately, you were right. They're starting to forgive each other, but they're not fully there. Ultimately, makes it more tragic. Yeah, I think that's why she goes on this journey, because it's just like it was never solved. Mm. Our relationship was never fixed. Dina. Is she your girlfriend? No. (laughs) 
No, she, that was just one kiss. It doesn't mean anything. She just, I don't know why she did that. But you do like her. They just have like a father-daughter moment. Just this yeah. exchange about this crush that she has on this other girl and, and Joel telling her like she would be lucky to have you. Again, it just he has unconditional love for the for for Ellie. And that's what <laughs> drives her mad. It'd be so much easier if he was if just he a was complete just... piece of shit. Oh, yeah. Then you could just forget about him. Yeah. But you can't. I mean, that's what's hard. I mean, she she knows that he cares. And she knows that he does love her. I was supposed to die in that hospital. I also love that you bring it back to matter. we're talking around the thing that we need to talk about. You took that from and me. you doing all of these gestures to try to make it better is not what I want. I'm going to bring it back to what the issue is, and that's I should have died in that hospital. I, I also love watching um, when do you both decide to make eye contact? Mm. <laughs> oh, right. Interesting. I just, and it's like right here for the watch at the end of this statement for emphasis. All eye contact. Because <laughs> I am dead serious. I don't care the cost. I would do it all over again. Even if it means I'd lose you. There is something to be said for your writing in this, which is I would do it all over again, and I would do it all over again. Walk the knife's edge of meaning. Because there's one that is repentant, and there is one that is resolute. I just... I don't think I can ever forgive you for that. Like this, this false moment, I can never forgive you for that. And he's, and he's ready to accept it. And then he's all of a sudden, but I'd like to try. And then I think the water works for everyone. Yeah. Just start right here. Oh. We did a lot of work of just writing these scenes and not being heavy handed to talk about theme, but there is something about just the placement of the scene here. And it's a scene about getting over some horrible transgression that one feels. Because there's other things that are worthwhile in this world than just kind of living in this resentment next to the moment where Ellie decides to let Abby go. And whether she fully forgives her or not almost doesn't even matter. It's just she knows there's other things in life that are more worth putting your focus on. It's, it's interesting read, like, uh, seeing since the game has come out, it's been out for a few years now, um, how many different interpretations there are for the sleeving of the guitar here. Whether it's she's fully forgiven Joel or whether she's fully forgiven Abby or whether she's willing to move on or whether she just doesn't want to be in, under Joel's shadows anymore. And when people always like, uh, I don't know if you get this often, people often come to me and they want the answer. They're like, which one is it? Mm -hmm. And I'm like... It's all those things. It's all those things in some way. Like, people's minds are so complicated. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's what we've been talking about with grief and how that can sort of manifest in somebody. I'll, I'll caveat by saying this is my own interpretation. It doesn't mean that it's right. It's just mine. Um, but sometimes you have so many triggers of for trauma that you just need to let anything that might trigger you, you just have to let it go and start over. I mean, how I felt in that moment of... It's easier just to not get close to people. We you know when we were writing this, we, we had so many conversations about leaving it on, on a hopeful note. And even though it's very dark, I do find it to be a, a hopeful note. It's left with that question of like, once you've committed all these atrocities yourself, can you come back from that? And we saw that Joel was able to, and then maybe Ellie could as well. <laughs> 